Goebbels, Mastermind of the Third Reich By David Irving Writing this biography, I have lived in the evil shadow of Dr. Joseph Goebbels for over seven years. Four years into the ordeal, I had the immense good fortune to become the first and so far only person to open the complete microfiche record, made by the Nazis in 1944-45, of Goebbels' entire private diaries and papers from 1923 to 1945, the Red Army had placed these in the Soviet secret state archives in Moscow. There they languished until the 90 or so original Agfa boxes containing the 1,600 glass plates, on which Goebbels had had the diaries filmed for safety, were discovered by the Goebbels diaries expert Dr. Elk Frulich in March 1992. On behalf of all historians of the period I place on record here our gratitude for the work she has done on the diaries. I was able to use the diaries in June and July of the same year, probably the first person to have untied the original knots on those boxes since 1945. With the support of Dr. V. P. Tarasov, Chief of the Russian Federation's Archives, and Dr. V. N. Bondarev, Chief of the former Soviet Secret State Archives, I was able to retrieve or copy some 500 pages of the most important missing passages of the diary, including Goebbels' first diary begun in 1923, the 1933 Reichstag fire, the 1934 Rome Putsch, the 1938 Kristallnacht, the months before the outbreak of war in 1939 and many other historically significant episodes. The conditions in these archives in Moscow's Vyborg Street were, it must be said, challenging, Soviet archives were designed for keeping things secret, and the very notion of a public research room was alien to Soviet archivists. This one had no microfilm or microfiche reader. After struggling to read the 1,600 fragile glass microfiches, some 75,000 pages, with a thumbnail-sized 1-2x magnifier on my first visit, I was able, through the generosity of the London Sunday Times, to donate a sophisticated film and fiche reader to the Russians on my second visit, the bulky machine arrived back in London, without explanation, one day after I did in July 1992. What followed was a less enlightened episode. I provided extracts from these diaries to Times Newspapers Ltd in Britain. The Sunday Times published them along with Der Spiegel in Germany and other major newspapers around the world. I also donated complete sets to the German Federal Archives, Bundesarchiv, in Koblenz and to the archives of Goebbels' native city Menken Glottbach. Nevertheless, while the international press celebrated the ex-acknowledgement's retrieval of the long-lost diaries many rival historians registered something approaching a cry of pain. Their injured professional amour propre proved infectious. While spending half a million pounds promoting its serialization of the diaries scoop, the Sunday Times mentioned the name of the person who acquired them, myself, in the smallest type size known to man, Der Spiegel printed the series for five weeks without mentioning him at all. A Berlin University historian, whose team has been laboring for years on the other volumes of the diaries, reported at length on the new find to a symposium in the United States, again without reference to either Dr. Frulich, the discoverer to whom all real credit is due or to myself asterisk the directors of Piper Verlag, Munich, who a few weeks later published an abridged popular edition of the other Goebbels diaries deplored in a German television news bulletin that Mr. Irving of all people should have exclusively obtained these sensational missing diaries and failed to mention either then or in their publication that without reward I had at the last minute made 100 pages available with which they had filled aching gaps in their publication. Even more lamentable have been the actions of the German government's federal archives, the Bundesarchiv, to which I also donated many Goebbels documents, including a set of all the diaries I retrieved in Moscow. On the instructions of the Minister of the Interior, on July 1, 1993 the archive banished me forever from its halls, without notice, two hours before the conclusion of my seven years of research on this subject. It had earlier provided a hundred photos at my expense but on the minister's instructions it now refused to supply caption information for them. When I requested the Transit Film Corporation, which inherited the copyrights of Third Reich movie productions, to provide still photographs of the leading actors and actresses who play a part in the Goebbels story, the firm cautiously inquired of Professor Friedrich Kallenberg, head of the Bundesarchiv, 
whether special considerations might apply against helping me. A copy of this letter fortuitously came into my hands, but not the pictures I had requested. The background can only be surmised. Professor Kallenberg had hurried to Moscow in July 1992 too late to prevent the Russians from granting me access to the coveted microfiches of the Goebbels diaries. There was no reason why the Russians should have denied me access, several of my books, including those on Arctic naval operations and on Nazi nuclear research, have been published by Soviet printing houses. The Bundesarchiv has justified its asterisk Dr. Jürgen Michael Schultz, of the Berlin Free University, Zur Edition der Goebbels Tage Butcher, a paper presented to the German Studies Association Conference, 1992. See its newsletter, 17, number 2, winter 1992. 34 FF Dr. Ralph George Ruth, ed. Joseph Goebbels Tage Butcher, 5 Vols, Munich, Zurich, 1992, Acknowledgement Spanishment, which is without parallel in any other archives, on the ground that my research might harm the interests of the Federal Republic of Germany. The ban has prevented me from verifying my colleagues' questionable transcriptions of certain keywords in the handwritten diaries. I had a list of 20 such words which I wished to double-check against the original negatives, pleading superior orders, the Bundesarchiv's deputy director, Dr. Siegfried Butner, refused to allow even this brief concluding labor. As one consequence, evidently unforeseen by the German government, the Bundesarchiv has had to return to England its serving collection, half a ton of records which I had deposited in its vaults for researchers over the last 30 years. These include originals of Adolf Eichmann's papers, copies of two missing years of Heinrich Himmler's diary, the diaries of Erwin Rommel, Alfred Jodl, Wilhelm Canaris, and Walter Huell, and a host of other papers not available elsewhere. I hasten to add that with this one exception every international archive has accorded to me the kindness and unrestricted access to which I have become accustomed in 30 years of historical research. I would particularly mention the efforts of Dr. David G. Marwell, Director of the American-Controlled Berlin Document Center, BDC, in supplying to me 1,446 pages of biographical documents relating to Goebbels' staff. However, these now, like the collections formerly archived in Moscow and in the DDR, also come under the arbitrary aegis of the Bundesarchiv. Marwell's predecessor, the late Richard Bauer, provided me with the B.D.C.S. file on Goebbels, my film D81. Asterisk in the German Socialist Party's Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Bonn, Deputy Archivist Dr. Ulrich Kart Arias generously granted to me privileged access to the original handwritten diary of Victor Lutz, Chief of Staff of the SA, 1934-43, on which he was currently working. Karl Hofkes of Essen kindly let me use the Julius Stryker diary and papers in his private archives. The UVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York also allowed me to exploit their record group 215, which houses a magnificent collection of original files of propaganda ministry documents, including Goebbels' own bound volumes of press clippings. I must also mention my Italian publishers, Arnaldo Mondadori Editor, and their senior editor Dr. Andrea Kane, who made available to me for transcription Goebbels' entire handwritten 1938 diary it was a two-year task, but without that head start in reading Goebbels' formidable script I should have been unable to make the sense of the Moscow cash that I did. This is also the proper place to thank my friend and rival Dr. Ralph George Ruth, author of an earlier Goebbels biography, for unselfishly transferring to me a copy of Horst Wessel's asterisk I have referred where relevant to my microfilm collection in the source notes to this work. Most can be ordered from Microform Academic Publishers Limited, Main Street, East Artsley, Wakefield, West Yorkshire WF32 AT, England, telephone plus 44 19 24 825 700, fax 829 212. Acknowledgements Diary and Substantial Parts of the 1944 Goebbels Diary, to which I added from Moscow and other sources. The attitude of the other German official archives was very different from that of the Bundesarchiv in Koblenz. Dr. Holder, President of the German Federal Statistics Agency, Statistisches Bundesamt, in Wiesbaden, provided essential data on Jewish population movements with reference to Berlin. 
two staff members, Lamers and Cunert, of the Menken Glottbach archives provided several of the early school photos and snapshots of girlfriends reproduced in this work. Andre Meals of the Deutsches Institut für Filmkunde, German Institute of Cinematography, provided many of the original movie stills and other fine photographs of movie stars. I owe thanks to Tadeusz Duda and the Jagiellonski Library of University of Krakow, Poland, for the photographs reproduced from Horst Wessel's diary in their custody. Dr. Werner Johe of the Forskungstelle für die Geschichte des Nationalsozialismus, Research Office for the History of National Socialism, in Hamburg volunteered data from the diary of Gauleiter Albert Krebs. Karl Heinz Roth of the Hamburg Stiftung für Sozialgeschichte des 20. Jahrhunderts, Foundation for the Social History of the 20th Century, assisted me in dating certain episodes in 1934. The State Archives of Lower Saxony, Niedersächsisches Staatsarchiv, in Wolfenbüttel let me read Leopold Gutterer's papers and I am glad to have been able to interview Dr. Gutterer, now over 90, on several occasions for this book. I was fortunate to obtain access to the papers of Eugen Hadamowski as well as those of Joseph and Magda Goebbels and of the Propaganda Ministry itself at the Zentral Staatsarchiv in Potsdam while it was still in the communist zone of Germany, most of the files e.g. vol. 765, Goebbels' letters to his colleagues at the front had remained untouched since last being used by Dr. Helmut Heiber in 1958. In those last dramatic days before November 1989, Archivist Dr. Kessler gave me unlimited access despite cramped circumstances, those files too have now passed under the less liberal control of the Bundesarchiv. Although any biographer of Goebbels owes a debt to Dr. Helmut Heiber, who first trod the paths to the papers in Potsdam, he will forgive me for not using his otherwise excellent published volumes of Goebbels' speeches, often important phrases faithfully reported by local British and other diplomats in the audiences were omitted from the published texts on which Hyber relies, these diplomatic records, as well as other important documents, I have extracted from the holdings of the public. Record office in London, capably helped by Susanna Scott Gall as a research assistant. Shortly before its completion Manfred Muller, an expert of the early years of the Goebbels family, generously commented on my manuscript and let me read his own biography of Hans Goebbels, the brother of the Reichsminister. The Institute für Zeitgeschichte, IFZ, in Munich gave me the run of its library and archives and made available to me its files of press clippings on acknowledgments Nazi personalities. But here too a possessiveness, an unseemly territorialism came into play as the IFZ contrived to protect its virtual monopoly in unpublished fragments of the Goebbels diaries. Before coming across the Moscow cache, I had asked the IFC, while researching there in 1992, for access to its Goebbels diaries holdings for the two years 1939 and 1944, on May 13 the director of the IFC refused in writing, stating that it was the Institute's strict and invariable practice not to make available to outsiders collections that it was still processing. This was why since I could not conceive of completing the biography properly without those volumes I traveled to Moscow, where I had learned that the original Nazi microfiches were housed, here I accessed, to the Munich Institute's chagrin, not only the volumes for 1939 and 1944 but the entire diaries from 1923 to 1945 though not before the Institute, in an attempt to secure my eviction, had urgently faxed to Moscow on July 3, 1992 the allegation, which it many weeks later honorably withdrew asterisk that I was stealing from the Soviet archives. Foul play indeed methods of which Dr. Goebbels himself would probably have been proud. That was not all. A few days later, hearing that the Sunday Times intended to publish the diaries which I had found in Moscow, the same institute, with a haste that would have been commendable under other circumstances, furnished to journalists on the Daily Mail, a tabloid English newspaper, the diary material which it had denied to me two months earlier, as of course they were entitled to. There was one pleasing denouement. The tabloid newspaper which had paid out £20,000 in anticipation of its scoop found that neither it nor its hired historians could read the minister's notoriously indecipherable handwriting. It abandoned its serialization in impotent fury two days later. Of course this biography is not based on Dr. Goebbels' writings alone. 
In no particular sequence, I must make mention of André Suchsitz of the Polish Institute and Sikorsky Museum in London who provided to me important assistance on the provenance of Goebbels' revealing secret speech about the final solution of September 1942, the George Arendt's Library at the University of Syracuse, NY, who allowed me to research in the Dorothy Thompson papers, and to Jeffrey Wexler, reference archivist of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, who gave access to Louis P. Lochner's papers, copies of some of which are also housed in the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library at Hyde Park, NY. I also owe thanks to the latter library for the use of other collections including William B. Donovan's papers and the presidential safe files, I used more of Donovan's papers at the U.S. Army Military History Institute at Carlisle, P.A. Dr. G. R. Lettas of the Swiss Federal Archives in Bern, Dr. Sven Wellander of the League of Nations Archives at the United Nations in Geneva and Didier Grange of the Geneva City Archives provided valuable information and photographs on Goebbels' diplomatic visit to Geneva in 1933. Asterisk Suttuchit Zeitung, July 22, 1992 In Germany I was greatly helped by the officials of the Nuremberg State Archive, which houses reports on the post-war interrogations of leading propaganda ministry and other officials, some of which I also read at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., where my friends John Taylor and Robert Wolfe provided the same kindly and expert guidance as they have shown for several decades. Dr. Howard B. Gottlieb, director of the Muger Memorial Library at Boston University, drew my attention to their collection of the papers of the former Berlin journalist Bella Fromm. Archivist Margaret Peterson and assistant archivist Marilyn Beacon at the Hoover Library at Stanford University, California, allowed me to see their precious trove of original Goebbels diaries as well as the political warfare papers of Daniel Lerner and Fritz Theodor Epstein. The Seely Mudd Library of Princeton University let me see their precious Adolf Hitler collection, although they were not, alas, permitted to open to me their Alan Dulles papers, which contain several files on Goebbels and the July 1944 bomb plot. Bernard R. Crystal of the Butler Library of Columbia University, NY, found several Goebbels items tucked away in the H.R. Knickerbocker collection. Dr. J. W. Baird, of Miami University, Ohio, volunteered access to his confidential manuscripts on Werner Naumann, whom he had interviewed at length on tape in 1969 and 1970, the manuscripts are currently held at the IFZ, which failed to make them available despite authorization from Baird. The late Marianne Freefrau von Wiesacker, mother of the later President Richard von Wiesacker, provided to me access to her husband's then unpublished diaries and letters, later published by Leonidas Hill. The late Frieda Rosseler, Nafrin von Furks, talked to me at length about her murdered husband Karl Hanka, Goebbels closest colleague and rival in love, and later Gau Leiter of Breslau, and supplied copies of his letters and other materials. Major Charles E. Snyder, USAF, retired, gave me a set of the precious original proofs of the moving Goebbels family photos reproduced in this work, as in my work Hitler's War, London, 1991, some color photographs are from the unique collection of unpublished portraits taken by Walter Frentz, Hitler's headquarters movie cameraman, to whom go my thanks for entrusting the original transparencies to me. Other photographs were supplied by the U.S. National Archives I scanned around 40,000 prints from its magnificent collection of glass plates taken by Heinrich Hoffmann's cameraman and by Leif Roses, Annette Kastendiek, daughter of Goebbels' first great love Anke Stahlherm, and Irene Pranger, who also entrusted to me Goebbels' early correspondence with Anka. Among those whom I was fortunate to interview were Hitler's secretary Christa Schroeder, his adjutants Nikolaus von Below, Gerhard Engel, Karl Jesko von Puttkamer, his press staff officials Helmut Sundermann and Heinz Lorenz, his Minister of Munitions Albert Speer, and Goebbels' senior aide Emanuel Schaefer, all of whom have since died, as well as Trotteljung, Otto Guncha, both of Hitler's staff, Gunter Dialkin, the leading SS journalist attached acknowledgments to the propaganda. Ministry Movie director Lenny Riefenstahl who privately showed me her productions of the era and movie star Lita Barava, now Lita Lundwall. I am grateful to Thomas Harlan for talking to me about his mother the late movie star Hilda Korber, 
and to Ribbentrop's secretary Reinhard Spitze and Admiral Redder's adjutant the late Captain Herbert Friedrichs for anecdotes about Joseph and Magda Goebbels. Gerda von Reitinger, widow of Hitler's personal adjutant Alwin Broder Albrecht, reminisced with me and provided copies of Albrecht's letters to her, and of her correspondence with Magda. Richard Tedder provided to me copies of rare volumes of Goebbels' articles and speeches. Dr. K. Frank Korf gave me supplemental information about his own papers in the Hoover Library. Fritz Tobias supplied important papers from his archives about the Reichstag fire and trial, and notes on his interviews with witnesses who have since died. Israeli researcher Doran Areza gave me several useful leads on material in German archives. Dolrich Schlee pointed out to me to key Goebbels' papers on foreign policy buried in the German Foreign Ministry archives. Dr. Helge Knudsen corresponded with me in 1975 about the authenticity, or otherwise, of Rudolf Semmler's diary, the publication of which he prepared in 1947. I corresponded inter alia with Willy Kramer, Goebbels' deputy in the Reichspropaganda Leitung, Gunter Kaufmann, chief of the Reichspropagandamt, RPA, Reich Propaganda Agency, in Vienna, and Wilhelm Ollenbusch who directed propaganda in occupied Poland. Wolf Rudiger Hess and his mother Ilse Hess gave me exclusive access to the private papers of his late father, Rudolf Hess, in Hindlang including correspondence with Goebbels. The late Dr. Hans Otto Meissner discussed with me Elo Quant and other members of Goebbels' entourage, whom he interviewed for his 1950s biography of Magda Goebbels. Peter Hoffman William Kingsford Professor of History at McGill University in Montreal, reviewed my chapter on Valkyrie, as did Lady Diana Mosley those pages relating to her own meetings with Goebbels in the 30s, Robin Denniston, to whom I owe so much over 20 years, read through the whole manuscript, offered suggestions and advised me to temper criticism with charity more often than I had. David Irving London 1996 about this new edition, References in the source notes to Goebbels' unpublished diaries have been left as such, although many have since been published. Professor Sir Ian Kershaw carelessly claimed in an interview with the New York Times published on March 19, 2001 that he was the first biographer to exploit the diaries from the Moscow archives. I wrote to Sir Ian mildly reproaching him that I did not see him at my elbow in the KGB archives nine years earlier in 1992 when I untied the knots which had sealed all the dusty boxes of microfiches since 1945. Acknowledgements the original film separations used for the first two editions, are alas no longer used by modern printers. Some of the original photos are no longer available and we have used different ones. We have reset the entire book in our standard typeface, Minion, and I have taken the opportunity to polish the text slightly and to eliminate where practicable errors which had crept in here a wrong file number, on which the Lipstadt defense team made some play in court, or there a word misread in German script. For the record, I have not revised my views, particularly about Goebbels as the instigator of the 1938 Kristallnacht and Hitler's ignorance of the plan. On the basis of new material that has accrued, I have added an appendix, pages 696, about Els Yanka, Victor Arlazorov, and Richard Friedlander. Preface The real insidiousness The real insidiousness of the biography is that its formidable documentation will gain it acceptance as history. Review of this book by Publishers Weekly, New York IT seems somehow fitting, writes David Irving to preface a biography of the Nazi propaganda chief with a brief history of the concerted and often successful attempts made around the world in 1996 to suppress it. I began work on this book in 1988. By then I had a 25-year record of success with England's leading publishing houses. Macmillan London Ltd. had become my regular publishers, and this biography was signed up by Adam Sisman, their editorial director. He told me that they intended to keep all my books in print. In 1989 there was a company reshuffle, and a young female, Felicity Kate Rubinstein, aged just 29, became CEO. She was coincidentally the niece of Michael Rubinstein, who was my lawyer for 30 years. She was not popular, and several members of Macmillan's staff left in dismay, including Sisman. The Honorable Roland Phillips replaced him, he was even younger than Felicity, 
in fact he was born in the month when I delivered my first bestseller The Destruction of Dresden to William Kimber Ltd in 1962. The Macmillan Company's internal papers indicated that Rubinstein, their new chief, soon tried to revoke Sisman's agreements with me. I know this, because I obtained sight of the files during subsequent litigation against author Eskita Serini, who had wrongly accused me of stealing microfiches of the Goebbels diaries from Moscow archives. In July 1991 Miss Rubinstein married Phillips, her somewhat younger editorial chief, and the pieces fell into place. On December 12 of that year an important Jewish body in London held a secret meeting to plot ways of forcing Macmillan to violate its contracts with me and stop publishing my works. Until now their efforts had been rebuffed. With Rubinstein's ascendancy they had the leverage they needed. On July 6, 1992, two days after I arrived back at Heathrow Airport from Moscow with the long-lost diaries of Dr. Goebbels, a sensational world scoop. Young Phillips signed a secret memo ordering their entire stock of books written by me to be destroyed, there was to be no publicity, he directed, and I was not to be informed. Unaware of the growing antipathy, I meanwhile set a historical preface preface about reworking the book to use the new diaries. In September 1992 I wrote to Macmillan's formally withdrawing the book, anxiety about the declining print quality of their finished books was the sole underlying cause and I told them so. From 1988 until the final typescript was completed on September 7, 1994 the biography went through eight handwritten and typescript drafts. Meanwhile Rubinstein left Macmillan's in 1993 to set up a literary agency. I confidently planned to issue my own focal point edition in November 1994, but that summer hotter headlines managing director Alan Brooke, who had published several books by me over the years, made an offer for Goebbels. My diary records that he phoned me at 11.45 a.m. on August 17, 1994, and agreed a purchase price. A week later he cancelled the deal without explanation, something unheard of in the publishing industry, I am told. The project has been vetoed from above, he said. Nothing he can do about it, I recorded. He sounded very upset. My agent later said that John L. E. Kerr, a thriller writer, had warned Hodder's chairman, Tim Helly Hutchinson, who became group CEO of Britain's biggest publisher Hachette UK, that if they did not cancel the deal, he would pull out as a Hodder author. In a letter, L. E. Kerr denied it. We went ahead alone. I still suspected nothing, but the book soon ran aground in other countries. In Italy my regular publisher Arnaldo Mondadori heaped praise on the biography and bought the rights, and in France Albin Michel signed it up. Both translated the book, neither eventually published, and neither has ever explained why. In retrospect, it can be seen that global forces were at work. In the United States my books had been published for 30 years by leading Madison Avenue publishers among them were the Viking Press. Simon and Schuster, Avon Books, William Morrow, Macmillan, and Little, Brown. They had often hit the bestseller lists most recently my Rommel biography. But Goebbels would run into obstacles here too. On March 22, 1995 my U.S. literary agent Ed Novak, who controlled the only six advance copies of this book to reach American soil, accepted an offer made by the senior editor of St. Martin's Press, SMP, Tom Dunn. Dunn had published several other books by me, and for a while things went well. On October 13, 1995 SMP routinely asked what was new in the book. I replied, what is new, of course, I am the first and so far only historian to have had full use of the 75,000 page Goebbels diaries that were discovered in the Moscow secret state archives in 1992. I am said to be one of only three historians capable of reading the handwriting. From these diaries we get new insight into the ruthless conduct and planning of Hitler's political conspiracies and military operations, we have fresh evidence about the role of Goebbels, and Albert Speer, in planning and inspiring the final solution. On a personal level we learn much about the tortured psyche of the Nazi propaganda minister, from the warped mind created by his physical preface deformities through his late sexual development, 
to his family problems and romantic escapades with Germany's most beautiful film actresses like Lita Barava. The photographs, most of which have never been published before, also deserve a mention. Shortly after that the fat really hit the fire. There had already been disconcerting scenes in the London newspaper district when I returned from Moscow carrying the Goebbels diaries in July 1992, with street demonstrations, organized newspaper boycotts, and some intimidation. The Sunday Times editor-in-chief Andrew Neal, who had bought rights from me, told me that he had never experienced anything like it. Now, echoing these methods, Jewish organizations in the United States started an extraordinary campaign against St. Martin's Press, SMP, for having bought the rights, and against Doubleday, Inc., who had proudly announced this work as their military history book club selection for May 1996. None, and I can only repeat it, none, of the hostile organizations had actually seen the book. The Anti-Defamation League of the B'nai B'rith, a wealthy New York-based lobby, began the agitation in February 1996. Worried SMP executives phoned me in London to report that they were getting hate mail about my involvement in Holocaust controversies. I had never actually written on the subject. The pressure was increased. Millionaire novelist Ellie Wiesel and other Jewish authors threatened the publisher with withdrawal of their services. A seriously nasty smear campaign was beginning. Some writers, notably the late Christopher Hitchens, hastened to my defense. On March 18, American newspapers published a Jewish telegraph agency dispatch about the horrific 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, it showed pictures of myself and the convicted, and later executed, bomber Timothy McVeigh. Citing the London-based Institute of Jewish Affairs as their source, this disgusting report accused me of supplying McVeigh with the trigger mechanism for his bomb. Shortly after midnight on March 21, 1996, four days ahead of its publication, Reuters news agency began issuing an advance preview of what the influential New York Trade Journal Publishers Weekly intended to say in an anonymous review about this book. British historian David Irving, whom critics have accused of being a Nazi apologist, it said, was about to get blistering pre-publication reviews for the book, which Publishers Weekly was calling repellent and alleging there was an agenda to Mr. Irving's documentation. The publisher's weekly reviewer claimed that in this book Nazi brutality is almost always retaliation for the plots of international Jewry and the criminality of domestic Jews. Baffled by the violence of this sudden and totally unjustified broadside, SMP's Tom Dunn told Reuters that both he and his editors were mystified at such suggestions. The campaign however intensified. The American author Jonathan Kellerman wrote to Dunn, David Irving's identity as a neo-Nazi and Holocaust denier is well known. Your attempt to elevate him to mainstream status preface in the U.S. is the single most repugnant act I've witnessed in over a decade of publishing. You should be ashamed of yourself. Don't send me any more sick books for blurbs. Anything with the St. Martin's label on it will go straight in the trash. A hitherto unknown Atlanta professor, Deborah Lips taught, was soon exposed as a prime mover, she taught Jewish religious history at a minor university in Georgia. The Washington Post quoted her on April 3 as saying, in the Passover Haggadah, it says in every generation there are those who rise up to destroy us. David Irving is not physically destroying us, but is trying to destroy the memory of those who have already perished at the hands of tyrants. Like all the other critics, of course, she had not read the book. There were only six copies in the United States. The first reviews were already appearing in the British press, and they were brilliant. Thanks to the anonymous critics at Publishers Weekly and the Reuters agency however, the rest of the world's press was reverberating to this organized campaign and in London I was crippled by pneumonia and unable to fight back. In New York, the newspapers reported that there were street demonstrations against SMP, bomb threats, letter writing and further orchestrated advance notices in the insider trade journals Kirkus and Library Journal, which shared offices with Publishers Weekly in New York City, somebody published the home addresses of SMP's executives on the Internet. With unconscious irony, Publishers Weekly closed its now formally published review with this accusation, 
the real insidiousness of the biography is that its formidable documentation will gain it acceptance as history. The publishing house SMP told the press that they would not surrender to intimidation. Yes they will, I told my diary. Goebbels now reached New York. The New York Times printed Tina Rosenberg's one admission that it was a Rolls Royce of a book, with costly color photos. According to my editor Tom Dunn it had been appraised, and praised, by seven different editors. After weeks of assurances to the contrary, Norman Oder of Publishers Weekly phoned me late on April 3, 1996 with word that SMP had thrown in the towel. If we had known who David Irving was, stated their CEO Thomas J. McCormick in an extraordinary apologia released to the press, the rest was couched in the same excruciating abject vein. McCormick had dined at my family home in Mayfair, London, more than once, and he had published other books by me and on my recommendation. Now he did the dirty on his own author, releasing the communique to the newswires at 6.21 p.m. in New York, without sending a copy to me in London. I want to emphasize, continued McCormick, that we are not cancelling under coercion publishers can often be at their best in resisting pressure nor was our decision prompted by mere embarrassment. The final decision about whether or not to go forward with Goebbels fell preface on my desk. Among many other things I did, I at last sat down to examine the page proof myself. I despised it intensively. There were several reasons for this, but one was sufficient for me, the subtext of Goebbels was in my judgment this, the Jews brought it on themselves. My feeling was that this is at base an effectively anti-Semitic book, an insidious piece of Goebbels-like propaganda that we should have nothing to do with. I let McCormick's three-page communique pass as being the outpourings of a frightened man. He was married to a Jewess, he reminded the media, and his family was Jewish. It did not save him. He was sacked shortly after. Of course his less encumbered rivals moved to snap up the now high-profile project. On April 9 Steve Wasserman of Random House Inc., encouraged by Robert Harris, author of Fatherland and a mutual friend, asked to see Goebbels. Random House carried the ball for only 15 days. On April 25, Wasserman sent to me an article from the previous day's New York Post, a mole had blown the whistle, and his project was dead. A literary agent, Keith Corman of Reigns and Reigns Incorporated, told trade journals now that my future would be floating face down dead in the water. Two years later, on August 13, 1998, my old editor Don Fair at Basic Books contacted me having just read the book, his attempts too were killed off at higher levels. When other minor imprints offered to publish Goebbels, hoping to capitalize on its notoriety, I rather petulantly told them, I may be floating in the water, but I prefer to choose my own stretch of river. The loss of the U.S. market was of course very painful, the more so since none of the American edition's mindless killers had actually seen the book. I turned my attention to Professor Lipstadt, who had been at the center of the campaign. She was author of a heavily subsidized paperback, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. It was defamatory and untrue and largely dead anyway by 1996 remaindered as unsaleable. Since her publishers had peddled her book in England, within the jurisdiction of our Defamation Act, there was one remedy open to me. I could strike back at her book's dangerous libel, inserted at the last moment at the behest of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, that I am a Holocaust denier. Discovery and cross-examination would reveal who was behind the campaign and what. Acting in person i.e., Without lawyers I had the writ served on Lipstadt in September 1996. The resulting London libel trial in January 2000 lasted over three months. The professor appeared in court flanked by 40 expensive lawyers and hired historians, powered by a $13 million defense fund created by Hollywood entrepreneur Steven Spielberg and other donors of less ability and more questionable integrity. She herself did not venture into the witness box or offer herself for cross-examination. Dazzled perhaps by the wealth displayed in his courtroom, Mr. Justice Gray allowed her defense even though he had a copy of this book in front preface of him. I called his judgment perverse, and others agreed. The late George Carmen, QC, one of Britain's leading libel counsel, 
told his son privately that he felt Gray was wrong. Readers may concur asterisk after the negative outcome of the Lipstadt trial, my entire possessions including my research archives, including 40,000 index cards, were seized in May 2002. The trustees appointed to do so had informed me four weeks earlier that they were always given these high-profile political cases. For five years my surviving archives were held in a Sussex warehouse where Lipstadt's experts were allowed to paw over them. At least one the German historian Tobias Jersuk, was caught stealing from them. It took five years of further litigation to force the authorities to return them to me. By then, many files, including all my research on Goebbels and Himmler, were inexplicably missing, for which the trustees had to pay me substantial damages. Another of Lipstadt's experts, the German professor Peter Long Eric, subsequently published at short intervals highly acclaimed biographies of both Goebbels and Himmler. Honey so I key mal why pence. I offer one redeeming postscript to what is otherwise a dusky story. On May 6, 1996 Time magazine published a letter from Wisconsin, USA, I am a Jew whose parents lost their families in the Holocaust. I grew up in Israel among Holocaust survivors. Since I was a child, I have read every book I could find on Nazi Germany. I have tried to understand why and how the Germans came to carry out their plan for exterminating the Jews. I have read all of Mr. Irving's excellent books. He is no apologist for Adolf Hitler. His words record the extermination of the Jews and provide evidence of Hitler's direct involvement. Mr. Irving is not an anti-Semite, nor is he a supporter of Hitler or Nazi Germany. His books more than any others I have read, help explain what happened in Germany. If we are to prevent future exterminations, we have to eradicate hate. The process must start with free speech and the ability to discuss openly all aspects of history and express all viewpoints. Mr. Irving through his writing has made a large contribution toward preventing future holocausts. Reprinting this letter, which was signed by Joseph Hose, of Madison, Wisconsin, I commented, it is comforting to think of six million Time magazines around the world containing this prominently displayed letter, from a Jew, vindicating everything I have worked for as an historian. David Irving, September 2013 Asterisk for the whole story see www.fpp.co.uk slash St. Martin Espress comma and slash legal slash penguin. Readers who agree with Sir Charles Gray, QC no longer a high court judge, can write him at his chambers, 5 Raymond Buildings, Gray's Inn, London WC 1R5 BP, they may wish to draw his attention to passages of this book which he overlooked in court. The Mark of Cain Prologue, The Mark of Cain Every man has some say in his own fortunes. It is open to each brain's owner to work upon it, to devise by intellectual training the swiftest path between it and the muscles and voice over which it is to be master. From the convolutions in the brain's left frontal lobe springs forth the voice that commands other men to hate, to march, to dance, to die. Moreover, man can condition this controlling instrument. Man is what he eats, that is true. But his brain is more than that it is what he has seen about him too. The operas, the great works of art and poetry, the ill-defined sensations of national pride and humiliation, all these impressions are encoded and stored away by the neurons of the brain. And thus gradually one man comes to differ from the next. Since prehistoric times the human brain has remained impenetrable and marvelous. Surgeons have trepanned into the human cranium in the hope of fathoming its secrets. The Greeks, the Romans, and the medieval Arabs all opened up their fellow human skulls to gaze upon the brain. In 1945 the American army took Benito Mussolini's brain away for examination, they did the same with Dr. Robert Ley's brain, and the Russians with Lenin's. But no instrument has yet explained the brain's capacity for evil. The brain which indirectly occupies us now has deceased one evening in May 1945. Here it is, punctured by a 635 caliber bullet, lying in the ruined garden of a government building in Berlin. Next to its owner are the charred remains of a woman, the metal fastenings tumbling out of her singed, once blonde hair. Around them both, callously grouped for the photographer, stand a Russian lieutenant colonel, two majors, 
and several civilians. It is May 2, 1945, 5 p.m., and the building is the late Adolf Hitler's Reich Chancellery. The lieutenant colonel is Ivan Isiavich Klimenko, head of Smirsch, a Russian acronym for Soviet counterintelligence, in a rifle corps. He has been led here by the Chancellery's cook Wilhelm Lang and its garage manager Karl Schneider. It has begun to pour with rain. Klimenko's men slide the two bodies onto a large red and gilt door torn from the building. They scoop up a fire-blackened Walter pistol found beneath the man's body, and another pistol found nearby, a gold batch, an engraved gold cigarette case, and other personal effects. All will be needed for identification. Point one prologue driving a jeep, Klimenko leads the way back to Smirsch headquarters set up in the old jailhouse at Plotz and C. On the following day he returns to the Chancellery, still hunting for the Führer. Below ground, inside the bunker, he finds the bodies of six children in pretty blue night dresses or pajamas. He ships them out to Plotz and C2, together with the corpse of a burly German army officer, a suicide. The Russians bring all the guests of the Five Star Continental Hotel out to Plotz and C, including a textiles merchant, a chaplain, and a hospital assistant, and invite them to identify the cadavers. Point two, even if the receding hairline, the Latin profile, the overwide mouth, and the unusually large cranium are not clues enough, then the steel splint with its two ring like clamps to clutch the calf muscles, and the charred leather straps still tying it to the right leg leave no room for doubt at all. The foot is clenched like a dead chicken's claw, a club foot. This is all that remains of Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the malevolent genius whose oratory once inspired a nation to fight a total war and to hold out to the very end. The Germans carry all the bodies outside on tarpaulins, and a Red Army truck transports them to a villa some 10 kilometers north-northeast of Berlin where the Soviets are equipped to perform autopsies. Soviet officers bring in Professor Werner Haas one of Hitler's surgeons, and Hans Fritsch, one of Goebbels' senior deputies, to view the bodies. Point three Haas identifies them, Fritsch hesitates, but the club foot and the orthopedic shoe clinch it for him. Check the gold party badge, he suggests. The badge is cleaned of soot and dirt, and reveals the number 8762 Goebbels' membership number in the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi Party. It's Dr. Goebbels, Fritsch confirms. Point four, this is almost the last public appearance of Dr. Joseph Goebbels. A few days later the Russians summon Hans Fritsch out to GPU, secret police, headquarters at Friedrichshagen in southeast Berlin and show him a notebook partly concealed by a metal plate, he recognizes Goebbels' handwriting, and asks to see more. The Soviet officer removes the plate and reveals a diary bound in red leather. We found twenty of these, up to about 1941, in the vaults of the Reichsbank, he says. The Russians arrange one final identification ceremony. In a copse near Friedrichshagen that Hwitson of 1945 they show Goebbels' entire family, now resting in wooden coffins, to his former personal detective, the 40-year-old Feldpolizei officer Wilhelm Eckelt. He identifies his former master without hesitation. Point five among the personal effects was a gold cigarette case inscribed Adolf Hitler, and dated 29.x. That was Paul Joseph Goebbels' birthday. He had first opened his eyes and uttered his first scream at number 186 Odenkirchener Strasse in the smoky lower Rhineland town of Raid on October 29, 1897, 6. It was a thousand-year-old textiles center set in a landscape of traditionally pious Catholics and hard-working country folk. The Mark of Cain The Daily Visit to Church, writes Ralph George Ruth, Goebbels' most recent biographer, confession and family prayers at home and their mother making the sign of the cross on her kneeling children's foreheads with holy water, were as much a part of their life as the daily bread for which their father toiled at Lennart's gas mantle factory 7 their father Fritz Goebbels that is the spelling in Paul Joseph's birth certificate was W.H. Lennart's and Co.S. dependable Catholic. Though certainly not bigoted, bookkeeper aided is not over fanciful to suspect that he chose the child's second name in honor of Dr. Joseph Joseph a revered local Jewish attorney and close family friend. Point nine. He himself had been born here to a tailor's family from Beckrath southwest of Raid. He had the same bulbous nose as his father Conrad Goebbels 10 and as his brother Heinrich, 
a paunchy commercial traveller in textiles with all the ready wit that Fritz so sorely lacked. Fritz's mother Gertrude was a peasant's daughter. From first to last his relations with his youngest son Joseph were strained. Aware that his own career would see little more advancement, he made sacrifices for little Jup, Jupcha, which were to be most inadequately repaid. As his father, finally a director in the obligatory stovepipe hat, came to the end of his life Joseph would see in him only a petty-minded, grubby, beer-swilling pedant, concerned only with his pathetic bourgeois existence and bereft of any imagination eleven among his effects were found blue cardboard account books in which he had detailed every penny he had spent since marriage. Conceding grudgingly that his father would in all likelihood go to heaven, Joseph would write, I just can't understand why mother married the old miser thirteen his sympathies were all with her. I owe her all that I am, he once wrote, and he remained beholden to her all his life. He had his mother's astute features the face perceptibly flattened at each side, the nose slightly hooked, the upper front teeth protruding. She had been born Katharina Maria Odenhausen in the village of Ubachover Worms in Holland, and occasionally she lapsed into Rhenish Plotdeutsch 15 when speaking with Joseph. Her father was a muscular Dutch blacksmith with a long beard, a man Joseph would look back upon as the dearest of his ancestors. He died of apoplexy in the Electioner Monastery at Menken Gladbuck. Her mother had then moved into Germany to serve as housekeeper to a distant relative, a local rector at Rheindahlen, she had spent her youth there with all her brothers and sisters except for Joseph Odenbach, Goebbels' architect godfather, who had stayed at Jubich. It was at Rheindahlen that Katharina had met Fritz Goebbels and married him in 1892. So much for Goebbels' parents. Two sons had arrived before him, Conrad 17 and Hans. Three sisters followed him, two, Maria and Elizabeth, died young, a third, also christened Maria, was born twelve years after Joseph. We shall occasionally glimpse Conrad and Hans, struggling through the depression until Joseph's rise to power from which they too profited, being appointed to head Nazi publishing houses and insurance associations respectively. Maria remained the apple of his eye. Prologue through living frugally, and thanks to a pay rise to 2,100 marks per annum, in 1900 his father was able to purchase outright a modest house at number 140 Dolliner Strasse in Raid, still standing today as number 156. Young Joseph had his room under the sloping roof, his mansard windows view limited to the skies above. This remained home for him, the fulcrum of his life, long after he left it as a young man. He remembered his sickly earliest years only dimly. He recalled playing with friends called Hans, Willie 21 Otto, whom he knew as Och, and the Mawson brothers, and a bout of pneumonia which he only just survived. He was always a little mite of a fellow. Even in full manhood he would weigh little more than 100 pounds. At age six his mother placed him in the primary school, Volksschule, right next to the house. Goebbels was a stubborn and conceited boy. Fifteen or twenty years later he would reveal, in an intimate handwritten note, how his mental turmoil both delighted and tormented him, each Saturday he would take himself off to church, there to contemplate all the good and the bad that the week had brought me, and then I went to the priest and confessed everything that was troubling my soul. 22 His right leg had always hurt. When he was about seven, a medical disaster befell him which would change his life. I see before me, he would reminisce, a Sunday walk we all went over to Jeistenbeck. The next day, on the sofa, I had an attack of my old foot pains. Mother was at the washtub. Screams. I was in agony. The masseur, Mr. Shearing. Prolonged treatment. Crippled for rest of my life. Examined at Bonn University Clinic. Much shrugging of shoulders. My youth from then on, Goebbels mused piteously, somewhat joyless. So this schoolboy with the large, intelligent cranium, underdeveloped body, and club foot lived out his childhood to a chorus of catcalls, jeers, and ridicule. In adulthood his right foot was 18 cm long 3-5 cm shorter than the left, its heel was drawn up and the sole looked inwards, equinoveris. The right leg was correspondingly shorter than the left, and thinner. 
the indications are that Goebbels' defect was not genetic but was acquired as the result of some disease. It defied all attempts at surgical remedy, had the deformation occurred at birth, when the bones are soft, it would have been relatively easy to manipulate them back into the right alignment. Perhaps it was the product of osteomyelitis, a bone marrow inflammation, or of infantile paralysis. He would hint, at age 30, that the deformity developed from an accident at age 13 or 14. When he was 10 they operated on his deformed foot. He later recalled the family visiting him one Sunday in the hospital, his eyes flooded with tears as his mother left, and he passed an unforgettably grim half-hour before the anesthetic. The operation left the pain and deformity worse than before. His Aunt Christine brought him some fairy tales to read. Thus he discovered in reading a world of silent friends that could not taunt or ridicule. The mark of Cain when he returned to his mansard room he began to devour every book and encyclopedia that he could lay his hands on. He would show them, the brain, if properly prepared and used, could outweat the brawniest physique. Prologue The Mark of Cain Prologue 1, Eros Awakes 1, Eros Awakes the other boys at the gymnasium in Raids Augustus Strasse, which Goebbels entered at Easter 1908 regarded him as a sneak and know all point one he ingratiated himself with teachers, particularly with the scripture teacher Father Johannes Mollen, by telling on his truant comrades. My comrades, he would confess, never liked me, except for Richard Flisges too he would find Flisges in the upper fifth, Auber second dot, in 1916. His closest friends were three Herberts Hompish, Binas and Lenarts point three Herbert Lenarts, son of his father's boss, died after a minor operation, leaving Goebbels grief-stricken and shocked. It moved him to compose his first poem, Why Did You Have to Part from Me So Soon? For at first he was lazy and apathetic, numbed by the realization of his physical deformity. Then he overcompensated, and later he was never far from the top of the class. His love of Latin came falteringly at first, then in full flood. With biting irony and sarcasm Christian Voss tutored him in German literature and in sarcasm and irony as well. While his brothers Hans and Conrad had to leave school early, Joseph excelled point five with clenched fists and gleaming eyes young Goebbels listened as history teacher Dr. Gerhard Bartels taught his class about Germany's checkered past point six his father and mother wanted him to become a priest not just because the church would then pay for his higher education, they were a deeply religious family. When Joseph's little sister Elizabeth died in 1915 they all knelt around her deathbed and held hands and prayed for her soul. Point seven. Joseph composed another poem for her, Sleep, Baby, Sleep. When the Great War came in August 1914 his friends all rallied excitedly to the Kaiser's colors, he too went to the local recruiting office, but the officer dismissed him with barely a glance. Back at school he wrote a thoughtful essay. How can a non-combatant help the fatherland in these times? He argued in it that even those who are denied the right to shed their blood for the honor of the nation could be of service, even if not in such a creditable way. His teacher marked it good eight the classroom emptied as the war dragged on. His pals Herbert Hompish and Willie Zillis, now Fusiliers, wrote him exciting letters from the Western Front. Point nine. His brother Conrad was a gunner and Hans was soon in French captivity. As author of the best essay, Goebbels, now in the upper sixth, Ober Prima, had the honor of delivering the valedictory speech when school ended on March 21, 1917. He spoke of Germany's global mission to become the political and spiritual leader of the world 11 very good, the headmaster Dr. Gruber told him. But mark my words, you'll never make a good orator. 12 After passing the school certificate examination at Easter 1917 Goebbels again tried to enlist, but was accepted only for a few weeks' service as a penpusher at the Reichsbank. His painful deformity had thus given him at least one advantage, a head start on his later comrades in the political battle. He would already be at university while Adolf Hitler, Hermann Göring and Rudolf Hess were fighting under the skies of Flanders. His intellectual horizon was expanding. In 1909 his father had purchased second-hand a piano, that symbol of the solid middle class, the family and neighbors clustered round as four furniture men manhandled the piano indoors. Joseph rapidly mastered the instrument. He also developed a talent for play-acting and mime. 
but what was to become of him now? The priesthood? Goebbels inclined briefly toward medicine, but Voss, his teacher, persuaded him that his real talents lay in literature. Whichever the subject, the university at Bonn it would be. Joseph Goebbels reaches puberty at about 13. But given his later reputation it is worth emphasizing that he will be 33 before he first has sexual intercourse with a woman. For the intervening 20 years this brilliant but celibate cripple's life will be a trail of temptations, near seductions, and sexual rebuffs etched into his memory. At 13 he and his pal Herbert Binus have a grubby mudlark of a friend, Herbert Harper Scheidt, whose stepmother Therese always wears crisp, clean skirts, so Joseph Goebbels recalls 14 years later. The sexual arousal that he first detects towards this mature female returns when he is 15. He harbors secret crushes on women like Frau Lennartz, the factory owner's wife. All of his pals have girlfriends Hompish has one enticingly called Maria Jungblith. Goebbels however senses only a dark yearning as Eros awakes in him. My libido is sick, he will write aged 26. In affairs of the heart we humans are all scandalously selfish. For the phallus we sacrifice hecatombs of immortal souls 14 basking in what he sees as one woman's love he will reflect, I am everything to her. Or am I allowed to savor life's treasures more intensely because I am doomed to depart it early on? Now and again I have this premonition. 15 at age 18, in 1915, he begins a three-year infatuation with a local girl, Lean Crage. He calls it love and will long recall their first chaste kiss in Gardenstrasse. But she is capricious and flighty, and his tormented soul drives him to the time-honored refuge of writing a private diary. At Christmas 1916 he sends her a book of his own poetry. Leaving Raid for Bonn University in March 1917 he says farewell to Lean. They find themselves one, Eros awakes locked in Kaiser Park that night, and he kisses her breast for the first time, Characterizing this milestone event seven years later he writes coyly, she becomes a loving woman for the first time. It will become clear that he means this only in the broadest sense. He was to study philology, Latin, and history. Desperately lonely, he lodged in a cold bare room. His aspirations were overshadowed by hunger, cold, fatigue, and ill health. He had made one good friend in the law student Karl Heinz Kirsch, however, and faggied for him as the Leibfuchs, freshman valet, in the tradition of all medieval universities. Pilkalsch, as he was known, remained his foppish, loud voiced, jovial, staunch friend and rival long after their careers had drifted apart. With his modish headgear and yellow gloves, Kalsch became his first role model. He roped Goebbels into the tiny Bonn chapter, Siegfriedia of the Catholic Fraternity Unitas on May 22, 1917. Its half-dozen members spent the weekly meetings solemnly debating religion and quaffing beer in the local hostelry, the Cockerel. Goebbels had chosen the classical name of Ulex for himself. His funds ran out, which scarcely mattered as at the end of July 1917 he was briefly inducted into war service and absolved his obligations by pushing a pen for a few weeks in a home auxiliary service he wrote an excellent copperplate script. He was keen to continue at university, but his father could put up only 50 marks per month, Joseph earned a little more by tutoring. He frittered away that summer with Lean on vacation, spending at least one chaste night with her on her sofa at Rheindalen, and committing to his memory that she stayed pure. He left a number of unpaid bills at Bonn, which his father settled. The winter semester began on October 1, 1917. He submitted a formal application to the diocese in Cologne, where the Albertus Magnus Society provided aid to promising young Catholics. The documents 19 supporting his application show that his father now earned 3,800 to 4,000 marks per annum, and had no liquid assets. His scripture teacher Mullen testified, Herr Goebbels comes from decent Catholic parents and deserves commendation for his religious fervor and his general moral demeanor. Father Mullen would explain years later that he furnished this testimonial with the clearest conscience, he was a very promising scholar. For nine years he had taken scripture lessons from me and had always shown much interest, comprehension, and devotion. 
He regularly attended school church services and the monthly communion. His attitude to me was confident, proper, and reverential. The parish priest at Raid seconded him. Backed by these documents, Goebbels humbly submitted on September 5, 1917 his application to the Diocesan Committee of the Albertus Magnus Society for financial support for the winter term 1917-18. Because of a lame foot I am exempt from military service, he wrote, and I should dearly like to continue my studies next term. Convinced that his was a worthy cause, the society sent him 185 marks as a first interest-free installment of a loan finally totaling 964 marks. His address was now given as no Poststrasse in Bonn, he would return there in October 1917. By the time of his final PhD examination in November 1921 he would have attended five different universities, this was not unusual in Germany. The reasons are obscure. Sometimes he was pursuing a particular girl, sometimes a certain professor, sometimes a special course, frequently the lack of lodging space in one city decided that he should study elsewhere that term instead. His speaking talents were already developed. Hompish told him he was a born orator. Motor mouth, joked Kalsch's brother Herman in one letter. There you go, shooting it off again. Well, there's nobody can touch you on that score. We really ought to open a stall, Herman joked in a letter two weeks later, and do the rounds of the church fates displaying you as the man with the all-round mouth. Twenty Goebbels stayed on in Bonn after term ended on February 1, and moved into Kalsch's lodgings in Wesselstrasse. The April 1918 issue of the Unitas Journal reported that the two friends, by now inseparable, had decided to study next in Berlin. At Christmas Goebbels discovers his pal's sister Agnes Kalsch and his yearning for lean turns to aversion. Agnes visits him one day and they exchange one passionless kiss on his sofa. She foolishly introduces him to her sister Liesel, and an informal triangle develops lasting well into the new year. Agnes visits him in Bonn, and they spend the night together Ulex kisses her breasts. He often spends weekends at the Kalsch family home at Whirl, except once when Liesel comes to Bonn and her sister Agnes is sidelined. On December 5, 1917, after one such weekend, Liesel writes him, My lips don't work at all anymore, so it won't be possible to use them on Saturday. Her sister Agnes adds, Nor my head neither. She is soon disillusioned, and writes this jibe on August 15, 1918, Do you know, Ulex, that I unfortunately adjudged you as being far too elevated, noble and mature? Goebbels overlooks the barbed wit, he congratulates himself, with a certain smugness, she is all over me. M.R.S. Kalsch encourages his relationship with Agnes, although his immaturity is painfully evident. She is still a child, he adds in his own writings. We are both children. Pil Kalsch meanwhile has dropped Berlin and opted for Freiburg in southwestern Germany. Ulex sets off in his comrade's footsteps for the summer term beginning in May 1918. 1. Eros awakes at Freiburg Pill embraces him, his eyes gleaming. Ulex, he announces, I've already found this great girl. Anka Stahlherm. She's a student you've got to meet her. And how deeply and completely I have done just that, writes Goebbels six years later, still besotted with Anka. Female students are in 1918 still rarities at German universities, and Anka is a rarity even among these. She is reading economics. She wears her blonde hair long with a few strands caught up in a knot on top, 23 her ankles are slim, and her legs are rumored to be equally divine. She is 23, two years older than Goebbels. With her Ursuline convent education in Germany and England behind her, she has inherited class, beauty, and wealth as well. Her late father owned a distillery and corn mill in the Rhineland. Kalsch and Goebbels become friendly rivals for Enka's affections. Among her effects will later be found a faded picture postcard showing Goebbels at some student revelry wearing a lampshade on his head. Pill has penned a fond message on the back. And yet let this be made clear in advance sexually, Goebbels will get nowhere with her, nor she with him. Since Anka is a regular at Professor Hermann Thierska's seminars on classical archaeology, Goebbels signs on for them too. 
glowing reports reached the charity in Cologne about his interest in these three-hour lectures. The miracle happens, Anka Stahlherm, this goddess of the mysterious grey-green eyes, she who is coveted by half the males at Freiburg University, saves her smiles for when he walks in, or so it seems to him. She is fascinated by this swift intellect. They go out as a threesome for strolls up Freiburg's castle hill or into the Black Forest. Kalsch suffers torments of jealousy, which enhances Goebel's sense of triumph. He serenades Anka on a rented piano, and one precious night he sleeps under the same Black Forest roof as her. The three students tour the sleepy towns along the shores of Lake Constance, with Goebel's dreamy-eyed in blissful anticipation. Oppressing him despite these carefree moments are his poverty and his own jealousy when she spends days away with Kalsch. His uncle Conan, a wealthy insurance director friend of his father's, twice wires loans to him. The Catholics are less forthcoming. While the Unitas Journal reports the unexpected revival of their Freiburg chapter thanks to Ulex and his pal, after August 1918 Goebel's name vanishes from its pages altogether. The delicious pursuit of the coquettish Anka continues. Goebel serenades her on the piano but ascertains that she is, alas, chastity itself. His first letter to her is dated June 15, 1918, a wordy, Latin garnished, solemn epistle addressing her formally as Sergiertz Fräulein Stahlherm, embellished with four lines of carefully crafted verse and signing off with quite a lot of greetings, yours faithfully. J. Goebel's Ulex 27 persistence and intellect are rewarded. Up on Castle Hill one afternoon it is June 28, 1918 he kisses her for the first time 28 not on the lips, but on one cheek. There is a problem, she is of far higher pedigree. There is an unholy row when she does not invite him to meet her visiting brother Willie. And he agonizes over her dalliances with Kalsch, which does she prefer? One evening she pleads with him on bended knee to declare his love for her, and he realizes that women too can suffer. As she leaves Freiburg at the end of July 1918 after one last night of stifled passion, he visits their old haunts. He sits in the forest hut high above the university city, listening to the rain beating on its roof, and imagines himself all alone on earth. He begins to compose a five-act play, Judas Iscariot 30 As the Freiburg term ends he dreams of moving to Munich, but the lack of lodgings there thwarts him and he returns home. During the summer vacation he exchanges scores of letters with Anka, sometimes twice a day. His letters to her reveal a young man still physically frail and lonely, they suggest that he has elected to enter the church. Romancing Anka occupies every other waking hour. His catchword is wansenig crazy, that is what he is he confesses, about her. He scrawls that word in the corner of letters, or leaves it unfinished just as YAA. He is untroubled by the wail of rage that comes from Agnes Kalsch, I thought far too highly of you, too noble and too mature, she writes him on August 15, 1918, farewell, it was not meant to be 31 much ink is expended trying to arrange various trysts with Anka, which Goebbels sometimes prudishly cancels because her worried mother, unimpressed by this parvenu, and her sisters disapprove. Once she gives him a red rose. It graces his desk at raid beneath a carved black forest heart she has given him earlier. His soldier brother Conrad, home on leave, jokes to him that he will probably be able to greet him as a cardinal later on, he inquires about the carved heart on the wall. A gift from the Archbishop of Freiburg, he asks ironically. From his lady housekeeper replies Joseph with a salacious wink. Joseph beavers away on Judas 35 Anka incautiously shows it around and in no time the clergy of Raid are asking him angry questions about it. On August 27 he is summoned to his former scripture teacher Father Mullen, who draws his attention to the pernicious nature of such writings. I was so furious I would have torn Judas into a thousand shreds if I had had it with me, writes Goebbels. The priest requires him to undertake to destroy even his own copy of the script. Has all his toil been for nothing? What shall I do? He appeals to Anka. I am in despair. 37, the play survives among his papers. It marks his first break with the church. 
he declines the summons by Unitas to attend their general assembly in Munster to report on the summer semester at Freiburg. Instead, he carouses with his pals in Dusseldorf. Kalsch has been thrown out of their Catholic fraternity. Goebbels supports the ouster, explaining to Anka, my best friend turned out to be a scoundrel. When Anka ironically calls him a Puritan he responds that Unitas has principles. By this time he has learned from her that Kalsch has sexually propositioned her. 1. Eros awakes to seal their friendship, she loyally shows him the letter concerned. Of her solely maternal interest in him there seems no doubt. Do you know what I should like now, she writes to the pint-sized student Goebbels. Just to stroke my fingers through your hair and clasp you so tight that you look quite desperate. 40 Her widowed mother's disapproval grows. He records in dismay that she regards him as a homo molestissimus and clearly frowns on any notion of them both attending the same university next term. He stiffly asks Anka to inform him where she will be studying, so that I can cross that university off my own list. 41 On September 3, 1918 Conrad Goebbels returns to the Western Front. He accuses his younger brother Joseph of not taking any interest in the war and finally extracts from him a promise to read at least the daily war communiques. Conrad declares that he is proud to be fighting for his fatherland. As you will realize, Joseph dryly informs Anka, he is mother's darling. While I claim that privilege, remarkably, more of my father. But he adds, I believe my mother is the best at understanding me. 42 He advises Anka to read his version of The Last Supper, where Judas with whom he thus identifies talks about his mother, how he sulks and does not eat, and she just shakes her head and murmurs, Judas, Judas, and how bitterly he weeps thereafter. He hopes that Anka's mother will relent and agree to them studying together at Munich. His father prefers Bonn or Munster, both nearer to the parental home. The decision is in your mother's hands, he writes to Anka. A friend tells him that she has boasted to his fiancé about her last evening with Goebbels at Freiburg. Goebbels scolds her for having so rudely dragged in the dust the memory of these, the most sacred and beautiful hours of my life. In the same letter he repents and asks, May I today for the first time press a tender kiss upon your rosebud lips, 46 in her reply, she mocks his stern morals. She has decided to study that winter at Würzburg. He therefore chooses Würzburg too, and finds lodgings on the fourth floor of No. 8 Blumenstrasse a wonderful room right beside the river, he tells his friend Fritz Prang. Ecstatic that she is so close, he sends her a note as soon as he settles in, perhaps justifying his lack of physical ardor. If love is only in the mind, he explains, it might be called platonic, if only physical, it is frivolous ugly, unbeautiful. It is the noble union of these two factors that creates the ideal love 48 at Würzburg his studying begins in earnest. He plows through crime and punishment, he regularly attends the seminars on ancient and modern history and on German literature. The armistice of November 1918 makes little mark on him. His father writes pleading with him to come home if things get too dangerous, what with the revolution, in Würzburg. Goebbels notices the returning troops, the popular sense of dismay, the establishment of enemy zones of occupation, he sees Anka weeping, he hears of communist mobs rampaging in Bavaria. Don't you also feel, he asks Prang in a letter on November 13, that the time will come again when people will yearn for intellectual and spiritual values rather than brute mob appeal. More letters go to Anka. He writes her the kind of letter that romantic females long to receive. In her replies she frets about his frailty, and swears undying love. I hope you've gone to bed long ago, she writes in one, and are dreaming that I am pressing the tend rest kiss upon your forehead to dispel your gloomy thoughts for all eternity. 51 For the first time in his life he misses the carol service on Christmas Eve, he spends the hours in Anka's room, and watches entranced as she kneels at her bedside to say her prayers. He sleeps in her chaste embrace but that is all. By the time they both leave Würzburg for their respective homes on January 22, 1919, the Belgians have occupied Raid. An allied iron curtain has descended across the Rhineland. Sick and hungry, Goebbels writes her at 4.30 a.m. on a deserted platform, waiting for the slow train to Cologne. 
At Cologne he has to wait all night the whole station milling with Englishmen, blacks and Frenchmen 54 Anka writes to him in raid that she misses Freiburg, her sisters, shown Goebbels photographs, prefer his head to the full figure, she candidly writes. He looks desperately ill, he is suffering from chronic headaches, for which the university's professor of medicine has found no cure. A 10 p.m. curfew is in force. The Belgian censors will not pass letters written in German script, gradually his handwriting deteriorates. Without a frontier permit, travel to Recklinghausen, Anka's hometown, is impossible. Her mother wants their relationship ended anyway, upon her return home, Anka is dragged off to church to confess her sins. She tells Goebbels she has prayed for him. He sets up her three latest photos in his room, including one on a sunlit castle hill. The post-revolutionary government in Germany ordered elections to be held on January 26, 1919. On the election eve he heard his old teacher Dr. Bartels speak for the Democratic Party. I was strengthened, wrote Goebbels, in my opposition to the Democrats. All his former schoolmates would vote for the Catholic Center or the more right-wing German Nationalist Party, already, Goebbels inclined toward the latter there are still Germans in the German fatherland thank God. He envied those living outside the occupied territories like Enka in Recklinghausen. God grant, he wrote her, his letters displaying political fervor for the first time, that our fatherland will once more become the way we knew it as children. 58 In the election Joseph and his brother Conrad both voted for the German nationalists. Grim times, he predicted a few days later, lie ahead for us Germans 68 talk with organized workers at raid convinced him that they might have a real case against their capitalist oppressors. That May of 1919 Anka returns to Freiburg. Kalsch is down there too. 1. Eros awakes Goebbels hurries to join them. A French Negro soldier lets him through the checkpoint at Ludwigshafen. Anka seems cooler, and confesses one morning that she has slept with Kalsch. Goebbels forgives her and kisses away the tears of contrition welling in her eyes. For an instant of happiness she is willing to accept an eternity of perdition, he will write in July 1924, a truly divine female, but not one for him to marry, he decides. They would destroy each other. Yet every time he sees her in the years that follow, his knees knock and his face runs crimson just like the first time. One afternoon in 1919 there is a knock at his door in Freiburg and Richard Flisges walks in, rain dripping from his demob trench coat. An ex-lieutenant, he is back from the wars, decorated and embittered, his arm in a sling. He has failed the university entrance examination and will now turn into a pacifist and agitator against the established order. Goebbels listens eagerly to this rootless, ill-educated, disillusioned soldier. He has always had a respect for the lower orders. Writing to Willy Zillis in 1915 he has discounted the poet Horace's theme of Odi profanum vulgus et arcio, I hate the vulgar mob and keep them at a distance, preferring instead the romantic poet Wilhelm Rabe's motif, Hab acht auf die Gassen. Pay heed to the street. Flisches introduces him to the socialism of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and Walter Rathenau and implants further trace elements of the anti-bourgeois class struggle in Goebbels. Thus, while Goebbels attends the seminars on Goethe and on the era of Sturm und Drang, he begins to think more about the social and political issues scarring defeated Germany. In the evenings he argues about God, he is beginning to have serious doubts about his religious beliefs. He and Anka leave Freiburg early in August 1919. He borrows 100 marks from a friend, and pawns his watch to a waiter to pay for supper. He has to spend the autumn break at Munster as his identity papers will not get him back into the occupied Rhineland. Anka phones him every day in the local café, but he can barely afford the obligatory cup of coffee. He begins to write his own life story as a novel, Michael in which Anka is identifiable as the heroine Hertha Hulk. He gets home to raid, crossing the frontier illegally in an overflowing train at Dusseldorf. On September 19 he posts to the Albertus Magnus Society a fresh application for funds. Later, heading south to Munich with Anka, he pauses briefly at Frankfurt where he visits Goethe's house. But why tarry in this Jewish city, he asks himself, 
when Munich beckons from afar. He borrows 1,200 marks from yet another school friend and finds lodgings in Munich on the second floor of Papa Vigiers at No. 2 Romanstrasse, out in Neuhausen. On October 29, his 22nd birthday, Anka writes in his diary, National Holiday. He sends two more postcards to the Catholic charity, the stamp on one is overprinted with the legend People's Republic of Bavaria, because the communists are now in power. The charity makes him a final loan of 250 marks. At Munich he studies under the Swiss art historian, Professor Heinrich Wolflin, he studies music under Professor Hermann Ludwig Baron von der Pforten and Catholic theology under Professor Joseph Schnitzer. But his real intellectual nourishment is from what he takes in at the galleries and museums the paintings of Arnold Bocklin, of Karl Spitzweg, and of Anselm Feuerbach. He reads voraciously, devouring Sophocles' drama Antigone, August Strindberg's The Red Room, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, and assorted works by Henrik Ibsen and Leo Tolstoy. He auctions his suits, sees Anka upon her own gold watch, and hawks his own watch for a pittance to he recalls in 1925 an insolent Jew. Such stereotyped references are rare in his early letters. On the contrary, he sends Anka a gentle rebuke. As you know, I can't stand this exaggerated anti-Semitism, he writes, in a reference to their teacher Gerhard Bartels. I can't claim that many of my best friends are Jews, but my view is you don't get rid of them by huffing and puffing, let alone by pogroms and if you could do so that would be both highly ignoble and unworthy. 66 There is still little trace of his later murderous anti-Semitism too, prodigal son too. Prodigal son while at Freiburg University in 1919 Joseph Goebbels turned his back on the Catholic Church. Perhaps the suffocating Catholicism of the diocesan city of Würzburg had contributed to his restlessness. Certainly he was deeply troubled by the nature of God and what he saw as the falsification of the true faith by idolatrous priests. In his novel Michael he allowed his hero to brood upon this dilemma. The result was much portentous, empty rhetoric but there was one proposition of substance, it hardly matters what we believe in, so long as we believe in something the essence of the later Joseph Goebbels. In July 1919 the Unitas Journal reported that Herr Goebbels had seceded from the fraternity. He continued to waver, and wrote to his father on October 31st about this torment, but if I should lose my faith. He spoke of the diligence with which he was persevering in his studies and be it noted stressed that he had not compromised his morals. But he added, why don't you tell me that you curse me as the prodigal son who has left his parents and gone into the wilderness, when on November 7, his father sent him an angry reply, followed two days later by a more reasoned epistle setting aside his son's doubts. Many a young man was tormented by doubt, he wrote. He challenged his wayward son to answer this question, do you intend writing books that are not compatible with the Catholic religion? Then he reminded him of how they had prayed together at the deathbed of Elizabeth, what was the one consolation in our grief then? It was this, that the dear little soul had been properly provided with the last rites of our Holy Church, and that we could pray for her together. Scripture teacher Father Johannes Mollen would recall that after leaving university Goebbels continued to speak at Catholic conclaves, I myself always stayed in touch with him. Years later, his parish priest would tersely justify his original recommendation to the Albertus Magnus Society, none of us could see into the future under the influence of Flisges and his own study of Dostoevsky Goebbels became politically aware. He was now 22 and leaning ideologically to the left. When the student Anton Count von Arkovalli was sentenced for the assassination of the extreme left-wing Prime Minister of Bavaria Kurt Eisner, alias Isidore Kosmanowski, Goebbels became curious about socialism. Being as yet more of a literary than a political inclination he explored his ideas in a drama, scribbled in an exercise book, entitled The Working Class's Struggle to Again He Pawned His Watch and Set Off, Alone, For Home. In a few days during the Easter break he sketched another socio-political drama, The Seed, later Blood said, point three he tried to get employment as a teacher in East Prussia or in Holland, he had a smattering of maternal Dutch, point four as the communist revolution swept across the Ruhr, Goebbels decided to make his home run for that PhD degree, he chose Heidelberg for the attempt. 
That Christmas he found himself alone in Munich, prevented by the Allied occupation authorities from joining his family at raid for the festivities. He stayed in the Bavarian capital, as Richard Wagner's ring cycle was to be performed at the National Theatre, he found himself strolling through the cobbled, snow-swept streets on Christmas Eve, entirely deserted save for a police constable wrapped to the ears against the cold. From somewhere came the sound of children singing, and then of a piano Franz Schubert, the melodies born through the air, he would later write, as though on angels' hands. I know not how long I stood there, he recorded. Only that I sat that evening in a quiet, dark corner of the Church of Our Lady and celebrated Christmas alone, as though in a dream. On December 29th I went to the Tyrol, going up into the eternal mountains satiated with the sounds of Wagner 5 he and Anka have drifted apart since that Christmas of 1919. As recently as December 19th they have mooched along the shores of Lake Starnberg and Anka has sketched in his pocket diary a room with two, single, beds. She has given him a gold bracelet. He has given her Heinrich Heine's book of ballads with a fulsome dedication. But she begins to make possessive scenes, he takes refuge in Tolstoy's War and Peace, he alternately fights with her or forges fantastic plans of marriage, then sees them shipwrecked on her bourgeois attitudes. He runs into her in Freiburg and finds that she too is making for Heidelberg. He persuades her to study elsewhere what an idiot I am, he recalls later, perhaps rationalizing his own failure to hold on to her. They have entered that cruel phase in an overlong affair when each partner derives more pleasure from making the other suffer. When he next sees her it will be Whitson. He reads from the seed to her, but she, the wealthy miller's daughter, is alienated by its left-wing political message. The rift widens. She begins to see Theo Geitman, a close friend of his point six chagrined, he returns the bracelet. He offers her formal engagement, if you don't feel strong enough to say yes, he writes, then we must each go our separate ways, she turns him down point seven after one unsatisfactory night, with him on the chaise long and her in bed, he pencils a four-page letter of farewell, a romantic torrent of pleas to return to his embrace. I rest my fortune in your lenient hand, he concludes. Two, prodigal son cast the first stone if you must. May it then dash me to pieces, and may you never come to regret it. Satisfied by this literary effort, he leaves the letter unsent, the four sheets show no folds, point eight spending the autumn break at home he reads Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, and suffers a nervous collapse. He pens a testament, dated October 1, 1920, in which he allocates his books, his alarm clock, his inkwell, and other pathetic chattels to his friends, they are to sell off clothing to repay his debts, to his father, director Conan's wife, a bond jeweler, and the Albertus Magnus charity. He wills his poetry and novellas to Flisges and his mother, in that order. Miss Anka Stalherm is to be urged to burn my letters. May she be happy and not brood upon my death. The final sentences hint unmistakably at suicide, I depart gladly from a life which has become just hell for me. Nine he folds this into a small envelope, but takes no further action. That autumn of 1920, learning that she is in Munich, he borrows money from his brothers and sends his trusty friend Flisges to find out more. Flisges writes that Anka has been seen escorted by a gentleman in a flashy waistcoat with many gold knobs and pins ten distraught, Goebbels hurries from Heidelberg to Munich, to Anka's address in Ameline Strasse, while he waits outside, Flisges stomps upstairs. But she has left for Freiburg the day before. With her fiancé eleven she has fallen for George Mum, a young, stodgy law student five years older, and with better financial prospects, than the crippled esthete Goebbels. In a daze, Goebbels pens a vile letter to her which gives him brief satisfaction. He writes again in remorse. Her reply is the last for several years. She is very unhappy, she confesses as she knows that he is the first and last man who has ever loved her with such intensity. I will always be your true Anka, is her final empty salutation. To the interloper mum whom she shortly marries he writes what he calls a rather categorical letter. In the new year he will ask her to return all his poems and love letters. Anka, thou murderess, 
he reproaches her memory, and eight years later her betrayal will still fester in his mind. Anka walked out on me, he will write. And my entire relationship with women has suffered ever since 14 he had hoped to study for his degree under the distinguished Friedrich Gundolf, professor of literary history at Heidelberg. Gundolf, Gundolfinger, had written the definitive biography of Goethe. When Goebbels arrived at the university for the summer term of 1920 however Gundolf directed him to Professor Max Baron von Waldberg, a fellow Jew who had authored many a work on the history of literature. Waldberg assigned as his doctoral topic the obscure playwright Wilhelm von Schutz, 1776-1847. In his competent dissertation Goebbels made perhaps over-frequent use of the first person, as in as far as I can see, and carefully praised the opinions of Gundolf and Waldberg. Later he would have the university's records doctored to imply that his dissertation was more concerned with the political undercurrents of the early Romantic period, and when in 1943 the university ceremonially renewed his degree they tactfully omitted Waldberg's name from the festivities. He did not ignore the other sex entirely during these last months of his formal studies. He would later refer cryptically to perhaps a score of females. As for Enka, Mum had now threatened legal sanctions if he did not stop pestering her, so Goebbels took his revenge by rewriting Michael to make the heroine suffer as much despair as he. Back at Heidelberg after Christmas 1920 Professor Waldberg told him to study another term before submitting his dissertation. Goebbels returned to Raid in March 1921 to draft and redraft the masterpiece while Flisges kept him company. An unwary comrade loaned him his fiancé. Maria Kamerbeek, to type the dissertation. He dedicated the completed 215 page opus to his parents. Waldberg was impressed and offered a few suggestions for improvement, but it's already typed, wailed Goebbels in his notes, before submitting it unchanged. He attended the oral examination in the prescribed top hat on November 18, 1921. The four professors included Waldberg himself. At that evening's seminar party Waldberg addressed him with a knowing wink as Herr Doctor. Thus he had made it. He now had the coveted title which opened doors to class, wealth, and authority. He shared his triumph with his rowdy friend Richard Flisges, they caroused all night long, then traveled tipsily north to Bonn still wearing their top hats. Their friends, also sporting top hats, were waiting on the platform. Then on to raid. The humble house in Dolliner Strasse was bedecked in flowers as the prodigal son returned, haggard but well-spoken, educated, and, as always, Latin in his looks. If there had been a fatted calf to hand, old Fritz Goebbels, eyes awash at this visual proof that he was pulling his family through into a better future, would surely have slaughtered it. 3. A wandering scholar, I. 3. A wandering scholar, I. J. Osef Goebbels cherished that doctor's title. He asked to be called Herr Doctor and used it even when just initialing Dr. G. But for the next four years he remained perforce a nihilist doing nothing. To the quiet despair of his parents he squandered the pittance that he did earn from his meager writings or tutoring. Germany meanwhile slithered into economic chaos. The marching resumed, the Poles into Silesia, new parties in Germany, Mussolini on Rome. And on January 11th. 1923 the French marched into the Ruhr. President Friedrich Ebert called for a campaign of passive resistance, and the French put the 29-year-old Albert Leo Schlageter before a firing squad for sabotage. Point one later that year a young malcontent called Adolf Hitler, aged 34, staged a coup d'état in Munich, was double-crossed by the Bavarian politicians, and ended up in prison at Landsberg. Berlin undertook to pay reparations to the Allies at the rate of 2-5 billion marks a year. Economic ruin faced Germany. Goebbels neither noticed, nor protested, nor cared. His head was in the clouds. He even laid plans with Flisges to emigrate to India. But that would cost money too, so he stretched out on his bed at home instead and soaked up Oswald Spengler's writings on the decline of the West. The truth about his middle twenties was therefore undefaying and in later years he would skirt around it in ever-widening circles. Later he allowed legends to circulate about his heroic undercover activity and early commitment to the Nazi party. 
clad in what looked like infantry battle dress, he was heard beginning one speech in Frankfurt in the winter of 1924-5 with the words, those of us who have our injuries from the war too he later claimed to have attended his first party meeting while at Munich University. Reworking his drama Michael III he would elaborate, he had heard an unnamed speaker of extraordinary magnetism speak hope shines on grey faces. A miracle. He had applied there and then to join the party, he claimed. In 1927 the Goebbels legend would maintain that he had actually advised Hitler in 1919 when the party program was drafted. All of this was quite untrue. He would also suggest that in 1923 Hitler had commanded him to infiltrate into the occupied Ruhr, where under an assumed name he had led a resistance cell not far from the martyr Schlageter himself, until the French had deported him. If we had been too refined, he would brag in 1943, none of us would have survived the year 1923. Goebbels too was behind the letter which would circulate in later years and which he had allegedly sent to Hitler in Landsberg jail, like a meteor you soared aloft before our astonished gaze. Your address to the court in Munich was the greatest speech in Germany since Bismarck. These legends endured even in the obituaries printed by his enemies. Point four. I am not a little astonished, wrote his fellow Nazi Karl Kaufmann in June 1927, that Dr. Goebbels portrays things so differently. The rumor I have heard in Berlin, that Dr. Goebbels was already advising Adolf Hitler in Munich on the program of the NSDAP Nazi Party in 1919, is also totally untrue. Dr. Goebbels had neither joined the passive resistance in 1923 nor taken any active part in it, said Kaufmann, Goebbels was not even an early party member. Point five true, he would somehow wangle a low number, 8,762, for himself, but he did not in fact join until early 1925. Fortunately Goebbels utilized idle hours in July 1924 to jot down a memoir of his early life. Hitler is mentioned only once, in a passing reference to 1923, Bavaria. Hitler. Goebbels was rootless, restless, and now friendless too, Richard Flisges had left to work in the mines. Challenged by the Albertus Magnus Society to give due account of his progress, Goebbels replied grandly on January 10, 1922 that he was looking out for a position in the press or theatre. After carrying half a dozen of his pieces, the Westdeutsche Landszeitung published no more, although he heard that they had attracted much attention. He worked briefly as the newspaper's art critic but was made redundant just before his birthday in 1922. Six a few days later he delivered a public lecture on Oswald Spengler and contemporary literature, he praised Spengler's critical remarks about the Jews, which in his view had gone to the root of the matter and must inevitably bring about a spiritual clarification of the Jewish problem. 7 His mother's suitcase would hold clippings of just a dozen newspaper contributions by Drive Phil. Joseph Goebbels.8 Among the literary products of these otherwise idle years were another drama entitled Heinrich Kampfert 9 and manuscripts with titles like Gypsy Blood, Those Who Adore the Sun, 10 and A Wandering Scholar, I.11 One of his poems was called At Night 12 I Awoke One Night. You lay by my side. The pale moon played on your left hand, and it was white as snow. But your right lay on your heart, and rose and fell as your breast did rise and fall. The hand, the breast in question belonged to a pretty girl in raid. Herbert Hompish whispers to him that she is Els Yanka, a schoolteacher, an orphan. 3. A wandering scholar, I she is well built and motherly, he's so slight that, seeing him from the rear once, she thinks him only twelve years old. He will later describe her variously as a rare mixture of passion and prudence 14 and as a lovely, Sweet-tempered chatterbox 15 Interestingly he will write, I often think of her as my mother 16 What strikes her most, she relates years later, are his expressive eyes. She and Fritz Prang's girlfriend Alma Kupp both teach at the raid school attended by Goebbels' young sister Maria. Else teaches needlework and physical instruction. They make up a foursome, go sailing, or on excursions together to places like the local raid castle. He will later recall an evening with her in the summer of 1922, he kisses her, she tries to slap him, he makes as if to leave, she detains him, and they walk out all night long while they talk about their lives. 
I tell her about Anka, he will write, adding with disappointment, she remains demure. Rebuffed again. From Baltram, a Frisian island resort, she wires him not to come, he borrows money and disobeys. Up in her room he swears his love for her. I kiss her to my heart's content. She resists no longer. Inspired by seeing Else nude for the first time, just as God created her, he will rewrite his long-suffering Michael to include a scene where the eponymous hero struggles to conjure up the muses on a Frisian island. But to his annoyance Else will not admit to their relationship in public. The crippled Dr. Goebbels has much to learn about the mysterious fluids and capillaries that, brought together, make up the female brain. His girls are bowled over by the literary style and the intensity with which he woos them. He sets Else and Alma to copying out his articles and verses. But his writings are universally rejected by the big Jewish publishers like Moss and Yulstein in Berlin. He remarks to Else that you cannot get ahead unless you are one of the boys. Else makes no response. My creativity is zero, he writes. Why? Am I a failure? Else visits her family's friends in the banking world and finds a clerical job for him at the Dresdner Bank in Cologne. He does not rejoice indeed his mood seems to darken. In a somber letter to Else at Christmas he lays bare his tortured soul at such length that we must ask where true emotion ends and conscious posturing begins. His letters ramble on, half sermons, half diatribes, acres of blank verse and poetry scattered at the feet of his admiring if tiny audience. Else firmly considers herself engaged to him, and even discusses with Alma whether his deformed foot might be congenital and affect their children. Goebbels has a quarrel with her about his deformity, whereupon she mentions a minor drawback of her own she is half Jewish. This has not dawned on him until now. The magic goes out of his life, to be replaced by a nagging skepticism about her. Starting at the bank on January 2, 1923, he sees at first hand the unpalatable side of capitalism, and reacts with repugnance to the sacred speculation by the rich and influential. The country's banks, he finds, are nearly all Jewish. He begins to ponder upon the relationship between Das Judentum, roughly, Judaism or the Jewish community, and the money problem. The more he looks around the more he perceives the Jews' young Otto Klemperer, whom he hears conducting a Gustav Mahler symphony turns out to be a Jew, so does Mahler himself. He studies Houston Stuart Chamberlain and he finds himself troubled by the Jewishness of Else. He cannot ignore the contrasts. He himself has to set out from raid each morning at 5.30 and gets home at 7 or 8 each night, while his pay packet shrinks in value through the galloping inflation that has set in. Cologne is ad nauseum, he writes. Paycheck worthless. On March 27th he sends the Albertus Magnus Society a 10,000 mark banknote, it is worth less than one gold mark. From his grim lodgings in No Siebenschberg Sali in a southern suburb he writes endless letters to his little rosebud else. He yearns for her. Why have we two, so much in love, been born into so wretched a time? And yet, I am firmly convinced that the time will come for me to use my real strength lying in a deck chair on Baltram Island one July afternoon in 1923 trying to avoid Elsa's tedious sister Gertrude, he received the shattering news that Richard Flisges had been crushed to death down the mines at Schlier Sea. He would dramatize his grief, wallowing for months in self-pity, and he rewrote the ending of Michael to send his hero down the mines to his death despite his landlady's premonition of doom. He has Michael die on January 30th, that date is a kind of premonition too. Upon his return from Baltram the bank fired him. Keeping the truth from his parents, he continued to commute to Cologne, but barely troubled to scan the newspapers for vacancies, although he assured else that he did. During his six weeks away on Baltram the mark's value had dwindled to almost nothing. The U.S. dollar bought 3 million marks on August 1 and 142 million eight weeks later. Elsa's savings shrank. From his lodgings in Cologne he wrote to his father pleading illness a nervous disease which must be congenital, he said and his father begged him to come home, going so far as to send the fare. Fritz Prang found him a new job as a caller on the floor of Cologne's stock exchange. 
he wrote an essay about flisjes which the local newspaper published at Christmas. Trapped in his lodgings, Goebel's brain fevered on. He brought forth a new drama, Prometheus, and in September another play, The Wanderer, in which a traveler guides an often despairing poet across the heights and sloughs surrounding the German people. He witnessed from afar the collapse of passive resistance, he lived sometimes in an alcoholic haze, because one gilder would buy fifty beers. The words Judentum, Qual, Anguish, and Verzwiflung, Despair, whirled kaleidoscopically around his jottings. Else had given him a notebook and on October 17, 1923 he resumed his famous diary. I can't stand the anguish any three, a wandering scholar, I longer, he wrote. I've got to set down all the bitterness that burdens my heart. For Goebbels, writing the diary became something of a fetish, an advance programming of his brain for great things to come. He was aware of a messianic sense of mission. In July he asked in its pages, who am I, why am I here, what is my task and what my purport? Am I a wastrel, or an emissary who is waiting for God's word? And he added, again and again one shining light escapes the depths of my despair, my belief in my own purity, and my conviction that some day my hour will come. Where are you now, my dear deceased, he appealed on the first anniversary of Flisch's death. Why don't you give me some portent of where we must go and what we must do to obtain deliverance? Leave me not in despair. Twenty-four friendless and jobless, he sank to a low point of mental decline that bordered sometimes on suicide. As inflation roared out of control his father became increasingly monosyllabic. Why must so many give me up as beyond hope, Goebbels had asked Elsyanka in a letter in June 1923 and consider me lazy and unreasonable and unmodern. Overshadowing their whole relationship is Elsa's Jewishness, from which there is no escape, in November 1923 she writes to him, our whole row recently about the racial problem kept coming back to me. I just couldn't stop thinking about it and saw it really as an obstacle to our future relationship. In fact I think you are far too obsessed about the whole thing 26 so he stayed at home whiling away the hours in the summer house which his parents had built, his powerful thoughts riding on ahead of his frail frame. He dreamed of launching his own journal in Elberfeld, but where to raise the capital, 28 he fancied himself winning the literary prize offered by the Zeitung with Michael and travelling the continent as a much acclaimed scholar. But nobody pays me anything for what I write, he moaned in August 1924. He yearned helplessly for Enka and her glittering green eyes, and spent days sorting out the letters they had exchanged. Just one day together, he wrote in his notes, and we would understand each other again. Thirty-two a deep, unremitting despair had seized him. He bemoaned the god that had created him a crippled weakling. Despair, despair, he lamented. I can't bear to live and see all this injustice. I must join the fight for justice and freedom. Despair. Help me, O Lord. I am at the end of my strength. 33 The more the products of his festering intellect were rejected by unseen editors, the more he saw the Jews behind his torment. He wrote at length on January 23, 1924 to Moss's Berliner Tageblatt, applying for a job as sub-editor and boldly asking for 250 marks per month. The curriculum vitae which he appended to this application was more than economical with the truth. He claimed to have studied modern theatre and press history from November 1921 to 1922 at Bonn and Berlin. In fact he had never visited Germany's capital, more recently, he said, he had become familiar with broad areas of modern banking at the Dresdner Bank. In consequence of minor nervous problems caused by overstrain at work and an accident he had been set on in the street a year before I was obliged to give up my employment in Cologne. 34 Theodore Wolff, Moss's editor, who turned him down, was Jewish. The diaries for the next years show him in a painful light introspective to the point of obsession, scribbling plays, articles, and critiques for a public no larger than himself and, sometimes, the woman in his life. With dwindling hope but dull obstinacy he kept submitting the typescript of Michael Vorman to new publishers. Why even get up in the morning? Nothing awaits me no joy, no suffering, no duty 
no job 37 he had already tried his hand at public speaking his notes refer to a November 1922 talk in raid, well received in the local press. Once in June 1924 he and Fritz Prang visited a local communist meeting. Invited to speak, Goebbels was interrupted immediately, capitalist swine. He rounded on his heckler. Here is my purse, he challenged. You show me yours. The one who has the most is the capitalist swine. The miners and textile workers roared with laughter and allowed him to speak on. In the wake of the failed Munich Putsch the Nazi party had been banned, with Hitler imprisoned, its former members had splintered into factions like the Volkisch Sozialer Bloc, a coalition with the former Deutsche Volkisch Freiheitspartei, German Volkisch Freedom Party, founded by landowner Albert von Grief. The charismatic leader of the Nazis in northern Germany was Gregor Strasser, a wealthy pharmacist from Landshut in Bavaria. These right-wing groups had fared well in the election of May 4, 1924, attracting 6-5% of the votes. On June 29 Goebbels looked in on one petty fogging meeting of Grief's party at Elberfeld. He was not impressed. So these are the leaders of the Folkish movement in the occupied zone, he scoffed in his diary. You Jews, and you French and Belgian gentlemen, don't have much cause for worry. He had evidently heard more positive word about the Nazis in Bavaria because he added, if only Hitler were free. The local Folkish chieftain was the politician Friedrich Wieger Schaus. He was worthy, obliging, and good-natured. This notion of a Folkish Greater Germany isn't bad, wrote Goebbels, but we lack any capable, hard-working, and high-minded leaders 41 Germany, he concluded in a typical Goebbels phrase, was crying out for a leader, like the thirst of parched summer earth for rain. One man. Bismarck sta up. My brain and heart reel with despair for my fatherland 42 What were his politics at this time? His reading had vested him with some surprising inspirations. The Memoirs of August Babel, 1840-1913, the founder of the Social Democratic Party, had taught him not to lose heart. The real workers, Goebbels concluded, were in fact nationalist to the core. The Jews, intellectually head and shoulders above Babel, had run rings around him. Goebbels for a time even described himself as a German communist, but this was more for the Russian origins of communism than for what it said as a creed. He read the diaries kept by Henri Alexander de Cat as private secretary three, a wandering scholar, I to Frederick the Great and three times afterward quoted the monarch's dictum, life becomes a curse, and dying a duty. When he plowed through Richard Wagner's autobiography he identified painfully with the maestro's anguished struggle to survive in Paris, and with his physical suffering. He saw Wagner as a wage slave enchained by the filthy Jew Schlesinger. Looking around, he scowled at his smug, shallow-minded, pinstriped contemporaries, their lives dominated by the pay packet, football, and sex, and he understood why the communists hated the bourgeoisie. In July 1924 he began holding little political meetings at his house, in his parents' absence, at which he described the great socialist experiment in Russia the glow from the east he called it in Latin in his diary, Ex Orienti Lux. Only the Jewish nature of the Bolshevik leadership bothered him. Men of Russia, he wrote. Chase the Jews to the devil and put out your hand of friendship to Germany, 46 he was not however an international socialist. The great Germanic works inspired him. He immersed himself in Johann Sebastian Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, and discovered Wagner's Meister Singer. His anti Semitism was reinforced by reading the book Prosesse, Trials, by Maximilian Hardin. He recorded afterward that Hardin was not a German at all but a Polish Jew, Isidore Witkowski. What a hypocritical Schweinhund this damn Jew is, he wrote, and then, broadening his aim, rogues, blackguards, traitors, they suck the blood out of our arteries. Vampires. Hardin, he decided was a dangerous man precisely because he gave his writing all he had pungency, a caustic wit, and satire. Typical of how the Jews fight, he assessed. Our worst enemies in Germany are the Jews 50 everywhere he detected their baneful influence. If he, Goebbels, were in power he would pack them all into cattle trucks and ship them out of Germany, 
so he wrote on July 2, 1924. However, reading the prison letters of Rosa Luxemburg 51 he was surprised at the idealism and warmth of this militant leftist's letters. He sensed that perhaps he was doing her an injustice. You can't change your nature, he realized guiltily. And my nature is now rather biased toward the anti-Semitic the right-wing parties announced a two-day rally to be held at Weimar in mid-August 1924 to agree upon strategy for the next elections, due on December 7. Weimar. What visions of Goethe and Schiller the name evoked. In the privacy of his diary Goebbels sometimes seriously compared himself with one or the other, particularly Schiller. So when his former school friend Fritz Prang suggested they go to Weimar together he was delighted. It would be his first foray into the heart of Germany. The Weimar meeting was a milestone in his career. He gained immediate inspiration from the well-attended rally at the National Theater and the shouts of Heil. He saw for the first time the swastika this sinister four-elbowed symbol and inked it into his diary. All these young people who are fighting alongside me, he wrote. It does my heart good. He saw them sporting the same swastika emblem on their helmets Hitler's elite guard, the Highland League, Bund Oberland, as they paraded to hear an address by the war hero Erich Ludendorff, patron of the Folkish movement. Sizing up the others, he saw Albert von Grief, a tall gangling ex-major in a black frock coat, as a man of culture, and Gregor Strasser as a warm human being. He also encountered here the Nuremberg Nazi Julius Streicher, who had founded his own party for the struggle against international Jewry, this fanatic with the pinched lips was too intense for his liking, but he reflected that every movement needed the occasional man who went berserk as well. With Hitler still in prison, the Weimar rally was Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Ludendorff was no Führer, he was not the Messiah that Goebbels was seeking. He spent that Sunday on a quiet pilgrimage through the homes of Goethe and Schiller. Sitting in the former's favorite chair he dashed off a few lines to Else before strolling over to Schiller's large yellow ochre house. That afternoon, still an outsider, he watched the flags and swastikas parading some 30,000 marching men in his estimate. The tumultuous roars of Heil when Hitler's name was mentioned made a lasting impression. For a while he sat with Fritz Prang in a bar, Chemnitius. Fritz wanted to relax but Goebbels was so keyed up that he talked only about politics, ignoring the come-hither glances directed at him, he claimed in his diary, by girls seated all around him. He had found a new passion. I have begun to think folkish, he wrote. It is a Weltanschauung, a philosophy of life. Pure chance had decreed that he emerge from his hibernation here on the far right, and not on the left. On August 21, 1924, nervous lest the Belgian authorities suddenly show up, he and Prang founded the local, Menken Glottbach, branch of Grief's movement, the prefix National Socialist was still forbidden. Several friends joined at once. He made a 90-minute speech and saw how the eyes of one youngster in front began to glow. These first meetings were held in Batsamon's historic beer hall or at Commons in Augusta Strasse. At least once in 1924 the Belgian occupation authorities did take him in for questioning. Shown the interrogation record years later he would pride himself on his foresight, it's all just as I think today. Nearly 15 years ago, as a little agitator 56 shortly after, he moved from Raid to Elberfeld. He later put it about that the occupation authorities had expelled him from their zone. He began, despite misgivings, to work for Uyghur Schaus, who had been subsidizing a political weekly called Folkisk Freiheit, Folkish Freedom, since March 1924. Around this time Else returned to his life, arousing God and the devil in his Catholic loins. Next to money, he ruminated, Eros is what makes the world go round 58 more usefully, a typewriter also arrived, a machine whose intricacies seemed more easily mastered than those of women. The first contributions signed three, a wandering scholar, I by Dr. G appeared in issue no dated September 13, 1924.1 was an article examining the concepts of national and socialist, it concluded, we are nothing. Germany is everything. It was followed a week later by the Führer Problem 61 on October 4 his name appeared in the imprint for the first time, 
as Dr. Paul J. Goebbels a clue therein that he disliked the taint of Joseph. Hitler was still incarcerated in Landsberg prison. Meeting Gregor Strasser, the Nazi leader's Berlin viceroy, at Elberfeld on September 13 Goebbels asked him whether Hitler would soon be released. We are all missing him, he confessed to his diary. In Hitler, whom he had yet to meet, he saw the unifying concept of the movement the fixed pole around which all national socialist thinking revolves. 62 He was flexing his muscles as a public speaker. He recognized in himself the elements of a ripe old demagogue and set about refining his delivery. Over the next year he would deliver no less than 189 speeches, learning to cast off all cant and phony philosophizing, becoming preacher, apostle, and agitator alike. In his hands, he would write, he found that the soul of the German working man was as soft as wax, and he could knead it and mold it as he desired. He soon fell out with Uyghur Schaus. His proprietor wanted his little weekly to emphasize German nationalism. Goebbels preferred to put the socialism first. Soon three quarters of the weekly was being written by Goebbels. By threatening to quit he bluffed Uyghur Schaus into appointing him managing editor as from October 2, 1924. It was another rung up the ladder. Since yesterday, he wrote the next day, I am quite a different person. At home too and what measure of relief lies in these words they look at me with quite different eyes. He had his own mouthpiece. Upward to the stars, onward to freedom for Germany, God be at our side. These were the thrilling phrases that he inscribed in his diary. Under Dr. Paul J. Goebbels the weekly became readable and hard-hitting. He was not happy with his writing style, but practice made perfect and his thoughts flowed fast and free. He installed a sub-office in his parental home. As his 27th birthday came and went his parents were astounded by the change. He still lounged around unshaven, but he had a sense of purpose. He increased his literary intake still more, he digested ten newspapers each day, and dealt with correspondence until 2 or 3 a.m. He began a new article, The Basic Problems of Jury 66 His parents stopped nagging. His fame as orator and writer was noised across the Rhineland. True, he was not being paid, but this fame was gratification enough. 4. The Little Agitator I N The May 1924 parliamentary elections 1,918,329 people had voted for the right-wing party's United Front giving them 32 of the 472 seats in the Reichstag, but of these only 10, under Gregor Strasser, owed allegiance to Hitler. In the election of December 7 the right wing, now named the National Socialist Freedom Movement, attracted only 907,242 votes, 14 MPs, with only 5 representing Hitler. Writing after this reverse Goebbels encouraged his readers on December 20, there is no use denying it, we lost this battle, and the enemy triumphed all along the line. He had intuitively perceived the correct propaganda tactic ruthless depiction of the somberness of the hour. The idea, he continued, is worth any sacrifice, even the sacrifice of lives and property. And then, in a pale pre-echo of his famous proclamations in the last days of his life, he hinted at the darkness that precedes each dawn. Every disaster at Jena is followed by a victory at Leipzig. The first rays of the new dawn appeared that same afternoon. Hitler arrived back at his Munich apartment, a free man again. Goebbels acclaimed him in his weekly's political diary, published on New Year's Day 1925, We greet thee, leader and hero, and there is an enormous joy and anticipation in us knowing that thou art again in our midst. Hitler's release from Landsberg threw his party into flux. Goebbels reassessed the conflict between the national and socialist elements of the party's program. He found it impossible to swallow the internationalist aspects of Marxism, but he hoped to steer the nationalist movement toward socialism, rather than see its socialist aspects drenched in mindless nationalism. In the Ruhr and Rhineland, he found many activists who thought like him particularly the former members of the paramilitary Free Corps. Among these was Karl Kaufmann. Kaufmann, three years his junior, had organized NSDAP Ortsgruppen, local groups, in several rear cities until forced by the Prussian police to flee to Bavaria. 
Now he was back in Elberfeld, raising a political force aligned against the bourgeois, comfortably off Uyghur Shouse. Goebbels too was evidently disillusioned with the folkish movement. In the final issue of his weekly, an anonymous advertisement appeared on January 17, 1925, announcing under Box R, Situation Wanted. Editor, Young, 4, the little agitator folkish, accustomed to work independently, good leader writer, organizer, workaholic, unemployed because of political developments, seeks position possibly in financial firm. Three days later Uyghur Shouse invited him to resign, and he cast his lot with Kaufman instead. His personal life now was overshadowed by a humiliating lack of funds. Point one, he was often unable to pay his rent or buy food, but when Kaufman needed it desperately Goebbels proudly loaned him his last 40 marks. Point two, they became firm friends, Kaufman was one of the very few men he addressed as do three but it was hard for him to make true friends and he found his Alsatian dog more likable than many a human being, indeed, he began to hate the human race, as he often confessed in his diary. Point four. while his brother Conrad had now acquired a housemaid and a car, Joseph loathed the trappings of the bourgeoisie. Point five. His romantic escapades left him filled with self-hatred too. Else now rarely wrote to him, having found him juvenile and adolescent. He had started a parallel relationship with another girl, Elizabeth Jensik, but nothing came of it. From year to year, he reflected, I shall be more and more lonely until I end up all alone without love and without a family. Six that was his dread. Comforting afterglows of his expired Catholic faith still flickered. That March he dutifully hurried home to celebrate his Saints Day in the family fold. Point seven his brother Hans was no longer welcome there as he had married outside the faith. This brought home to Joseph once more the impossibility of marrying the voluminous, chubby, healthy, cheerful half Jewess else, although he did sometimes envisage it, I should like her as my wife if only she were not half-blooded eight thus he toyed with Elizabeth's affections. The poor child has gone to pieces over me, he wrote in bemusement. She trembles with anguish and joy when she sees me nine he knew that tremor well. On April 20 a farewell letter came from Elizabeth she could not stand it any longer. He replied with bleeding heart. And now, he noted, this beautiful yet oh so ephemeral flowering dream is over. A great loneliness besets me 10 dr Goebbels party membership file is missing, but according to Karl Kaufmann he formally joined soon after Hitler had reconstituted the party in Munich on February 27, 1925. In March Hitler activated a GAU, region, covering the North Rhineland. He appointed the middle-aged Baltic German journalist Axel Ripke as Gau Leiter. At Kaufmann's instance, Ripke appointed Goebbels his manager, Geschaftsführer, among Ripke's other officials were such personalities as the later notorious Eric Cook, one of Leo Schlageter's comrades, and the later commander of the Sturmabteilung, S.A., the Brown Shirts, Victor Lutz. The Elberfeld police soon took note that Goebbels appears as speaker at every function and directed the evenings organized by the Elberfeld Ortsgruppe of the NSDAP, whose Führer was identified as K. Kaufmann. Ripska ran into immediate difficulties. On March 17 the French occupation authorities in Dusseldorf banned the organization and a week later arrested officials of its Elberfeld local. We request wrote Goebbels to the Reich Minister for the Occupied Territories on April 3, that you take appropriate steps to secure the immediate release of our men from custody. 14 He had founded a local group at Krefeld, and often made speeches to them. One evening three Belgian detectives appeared, blocked the doors, and asked him if a Dr. Goebbels was in the hall. Goebbels replied calmly, he's busy right now, I'm speaking on his behalf. The officials left empty-handed. His radical views attracted the mistrust of other local officials. Arthur at Rich, who had founded the Hattingen local three years before, likened him to Maximilien de Robespierre, Ripke agreed, and cited Honor Count de Mirabeau's estimation of Robespierre, the man is dangerous he believes what he says. 16 Neither Goebbels nor Kaufmann felt that their Gau Leiter, Ripke, was a match for the French. He was too old, too conservative, and too diplomatic. Suppressing the actual epithet, Goebbels wrote, You can't stage a revolution with S like these 18 but Ripke had Hitler's ear, 
and often traveled to Berlin to deal with Gregor Strasser, Hitler's deputy in all of northern Germany. Goebbels conceived the idea of a fanatical Freedom League, Freiheitsbund, of 30 members pledged to donate a fixed amount each month a sort of intellectual storm troop as he put it. Rip was dismissive, but the first whip round at Haddengen yielded 268 marks. For hours Goebbels plotted with Kaufmann ways of getting rid of their tedious, bourgeois gau lighter. He had a long talk with Rip on May 18 which ended, if Goebbels is to be believed, with the gau lighter on his knees pleading for a second chance. The gau lighter accused him of promoting a new class struggle. Too true, commented Goebbels, with capitalism. You've got to call a spade a spade. 21 After another five-hour session with Rip, he summed up their differences. Socialism means the liberation of the proletariat, not just breaking the Versailles Peace Treaty. God preserve my passion. 22 He was beginning to hate Rip, and this feeling was mutual. The one wanted bourgeois reform, the other socialist revolution. In Munich, Hitler had revived the party newspaper Volkisker Biobotter and Alfred Rosenberg, its editor, invited Goebbels to submit occasional pieces from May. He wrote by day and made speeches by night. He did not flinch from the ugly scenes that often resulted. After he spoke at a flag dedication ceremony at Remscheid on June 5 there was a battle with communists in the railroad tunnel, and the police arrested 150 of his opponents. I was in the thick of it, he chortled. The two factions went berserk and waded into each other. What a way to one nation! 25 While else was away on vacation in the summer of 1925 he made use of her best four, the little agitator friend Alma. In mid-August he received a promising postcard from Alma which he described as the first sign after that night. This teasing, enchanting Alma, he mused. I rather like this creature. Such romantic interludes were a cheap opium against the pangs of poverty, his landlord gave him notice to quit his lodgings at No. 122 Gesundheitsstrasse, Health Street, in Elberfeld. His parents had sent him 150 marks. Damn and blast, he let fly in his diary, and an unkind fate, hearing him, responded with a final tax demand for 150 marks. Once he spoke at Recklinghausen, Anka's hometown, and he half hoped to see her sitting there among his enraptured audience. Those audiences were getting larger. The Folkisker Biobotter, VB, reported regularly on his speeches. Together with Victor Lutz, the region's SA commander, he spoke to 3,000 packing the big concert hall in Essen. A truckload of young right-wingers known as the Falcons drove him home. Two days later on August 25 the French occupation troops finally pulled out of the Rhineland. The first volume of Hitler's main camp had just been published, and Goebbels along with 20,000 others was dipping into it. There was much that he disagreed with. He learned that on July 12 his Gau Leiter Ripke had blackened his name to Hitler as a Bolshevist. Goebbels fought back, accusing Ripke of embezzling party funds, this was one offense the party would not tolerate. On July 12, Hitler called all the party's Gau lighters of northern Germany to Weimar, and it was in a beer hall here that day that he and Goebbels first briefly met. Ripke is finished, Goebbels wrote after an internal committee of inquiry had been set up, with Strasser presiding. Ripke resigned, leaving Kaufmann, Lutz, and Goebbels in charge. One day in midsummer Strasser came to see him. Strasser had earlier been Gau lighter of Lower Bavaria and in the failed 1923 putsch his stormtroopers had held the Isar bridges. With his rough-hewn features, he was the stereotype Bavarian, but he was shrewd, ambitious, and one of the cleverest in the Nazi hierarchy. Probably he recognized in Goebbels a useful lieutenant whose politics were similar to his own. He certainly won Goebbels over. He has a wonderful sense of humor, recorded the latter after this meeting related a lot of sorry things about Munich and about the swine at party headquarters there. Hitler is surrounded by the wrong people, I think Hermann Esser Hitler's propaganda chief is his undoing 33 Strasser revealed that he was planning to consolidate the party's organization in northwestern Germany, and he would want Goebbels to edit a new journal as a weapon against Munich. This was fighting talk, and Goebbels liked it. 
Gregor Strasser would become his first real employer, then his sworn rival, and ultimately his mortal enemy. When Strasser's conclave took place, in the grimy rear town of Hagen on September 10, Gregor himself could not attend as his mother was ill. But those who did were the toughest men the party had in northern Germany, including many former Free Corps officers. Dr. Robert Lay, 35, a former aviator and now an industrial chemist, had directed the South Rhineland Gau, around Cologne, since mid July. Professor Theodor Wallen, 56, was Gau leiter of Pomerania, Henrik Losa, a businessman, 28, who headed the northernmost Gau, Schleswig Holstein, Franz von Pfeffer, 37, who had been condemned to death by the French but had escaped, Gau leiter of Westphalia since March, Ludolf Haas, Gau leiter of South Hanover, and his deputy. Hermann Fabke, who had spent some months in Landsberg with Hitler. Fabke's report is in party files. He felt that the sharp intellect of Goebbels, whom he called the Gau Führer of the North Rhineland, called for thorough analysis, as he does not seem all that trustworthy at first sight. Goebbels however was delighted at the outcome, telling his diary, we pulled everything off. By that he meant that the regions of northern and western Germany would henceforth operate as a bloc under Strasser's centralized command, with his office at Elberfeld and a centralized management, Moy. Only Ley had quibbled. Seventeen days later, on September 27, 200 men from the Ruhr's local groups met at Dusseldorf to decide who should replace Ribke. Goebbels hoped the choice would fall on him. But Kaufmann was unanimously elected as Gau Leiter, with Goebbels merely manager as before. It was some consolation that the audience bore him out of the hall on their shoulders. He desperately wanted to be loved. For the next thirteen months he was Kaufmann's roving agitator. Sometimes he felt ill-used, and cast a jealous, almost womanly eye over all his rivals for the Gau Leiter's affection. But editing Gregor Strasser's influential new fortnightly journal National Socialist Letters more than compensated. It enabled his voice to be heard far from Elberfeld. The journal's masthead proclaimed it as the work of leading members of the movement 39 he would edit the first 39 issues. Its four, or eight pages, sometimes carried contributions by Heinrich Himmler, Franz von Pfeffer, and Strasser's bombastic younger brother Otto. But above all Goebbels used it as his platform to argue his own socialist and anti-Semitic brand of politics. In the second issue he published a letter to my friend on the left, arguing, you and I, we fight one another although we are not really enemies at all. 40 This was a trenchant theme in all his writings, as was his somewhat ritualized affection for Russia. In the fourth issue he proclaimed, we can see the commencement of our own national and socialist survival in an alliance with a truly national and socialist Russia. 41 When Gustav Stresemann signed the Locarno Pact of Non-Aggression with France and Belgium, guaranteed by Britain and Italy, Goebbels was there for four, the little agitator appalled. An ugly vision seized him of Germany's sons dying in the service of Western capitalism, possibly, even probably, in some holy war against Moscow. 42 We shall be the mercenaries against Russia, he repeated gloomily a week later, on the battlefields of capitalism. We're done for 43 The letters were an undeniable success. Goebbels advertised them in other party publications, calling upon all national socialists of West and North Germany to pay a 150 mark quarterly subscription. Thus, he found, we've got our hands on a unique instrument of power. According to the journal's accountant Paul Schmitz he received 150 marks a month as editor. The letters gave the party a sense of direction. In his sixth issue Goebbels held forth on the N.S.D.A.P.S. need to radicalize socialism. He set this out at greater length in a standard speech, Lenin, or Hitler, which he first delivered, according to Prussian police records, in Hanover on September 17, 1925. 45 He delivered it scores of times afterwards, inspiring violent clashes in the Red Cities like Altena and Chemnitz, and fervent acclaim in Berlin, Dresden, Plauen, Tvikau, and elsewhere. It was heavy on the theory and history, but still seized the imagination of his listeners, said Albert Krebs, a party official in Hamburg. We Germans, declared Goebbels, 
are the unluckiest people God's sun shines upon. Sixty millions of us, surrounded by enemies, bleeding from a thousand wounds, the hardest working nation on earth, and we see our only political exercise as being to tear ourselves limb from limb. Because their leaders had failed to win over the working classes they had been thrown into the arms of the left, and here the systematic underminer of any true workers' movement, the Marxist Jew, had easily led them astray. We allowed ourselves to be humiliated at conference after conference, continued Goebbels, in a way we wouldn't have dared humiliate even a nigger nation, and nobody came and thundered the word no. The Ruhr was occupied, the German people hid its bourgeois cowardice behind passive resistance. The Ruhr was lost and Mr. Gustav Stresemann espied a silver lining on the horizon. Stresemann's fat hand signed everything our grinning enemies laid before him. Then, he shrieked, came Locarno, and Gustav Stresemann trotted off to London and signed that too. Locarno, he argued, meant not peace but war. He foresaw a gigantic armed struggle against the Soviet Union using German blood. And presiding over it all as the Jew, both in the ranks of world capitalism and concealed in Soviet Bolshevism, egging on the Russians and Germans against each other. In one last orgy of hostilities, he introduced Lenin to his by now seething audiences in surprisingly warm terms, as a man who had learned all about social deprivation the hard way. Capitalism, he declared, is the immoral distribution of capital. Nazism made a distinction between creative state capital and a grasping international loan capital. Germany will become free, he promised, at that moment when the 30 millions on the left and the 30 millions on the right make common cause. Only one movement is capable of doing this, National Socialism, embodied in one Führer Adolf Hitler. 5. God disposes otherwise for a while Karl Kaufmann was, after else, the best friend Goebbels had. But Gregor Strasser was the man he most admired five years his senior. Strasser was willing to adopt the radical program that Goebbels espoused. Point one he could use Strasser as a battering ram against Munich. They were not of course fighting Hitler himself, but the toadying parasites surrounding him in Munich and in particular the party's propaganda chief Hermann Esser. Munich hinted that Goebbels might like to go down there. The hints fell on deaf ears. Together with Strasser he intended to build his power base between the Rhine and the Ruhr too it is legitimate to ask whether his proletarian stance was mere posturing. His private writings do show a marked sympathy with the working class. His contempt for the bourgeois scum in the party, toasting their toes on his radicalism as he engagingly put it, was genuine. I find it appalling, he would write that we and the communists are bashing each other's heads in three he now drew audiences of two and three thousand with ease. Often there were as many thugs outside, armed with firearms too. At Dusseldorf on October 8, 1925 communists for miles around invaded his meeting, but within minutes he had silenced them and he went on to hold them in his grip for two hours. Point four he drafted in his own hand a cute pamphlet entitled The Little ABC of National Socialism, as a catechism for the party. He completed it on October 26 and his friend director Arnold, a wealthy Haddengen industrialist, put up the capital for a first print of 10,000.5 His personal affairs were in chaos. He was living a gypsy existence, changing trains and lodgings with almost equal frequency.6 He was driving himself to the limit. His diary entries often end with a motif that remains unchanged for years of dropping off exhausted to bed for only a few hours sleep. He crisscrossed his tough industrial domain, in painfully slow local trains, setting eyes also on Lübeck, Hamburg, redolent of ocean in America, the rear cities smoldering in their infernal polluted semi-darkness, and Hamburg again, German sweat and German enterprise, exploited by the Jews, point seven he wished he had hearth, home and family to greet him at Elberfeld but he found permanent relations with women difficult to achieve. Point eight, he placed these remote creatures on a sort of pedestal. He was not averse to exploiting five, God disposes otherwise them himself, but was profoundly indignant when he saw Hamburg's red light district around the Reaper ban, with the half-naked hookers standing in their doorways. A local party official later recalled that one keen young SA man asked, Doctor, what'll we do with streets like this after the revolution? and Goebbels snarled in reply, 
we shall sweep them away like the garbage that they are. 9. He saw Germany's blonde girls embracing slit eyed Chinamen in the street, the police just stood by grinning. He seldom took his women to his meetings, and no longer sent his writings to them either. After Else wrote him a despairing letter shortly before Christmas, he lamented, Why can't women be like us? Can they be educated? Or are they by their very nature inferior? 11. There is a curse cast over you and women, he told himself piteously five days later. Woe betide those who love you, 12. His diaries are still punctuated with wailing references to Anka. But these ululations are surely no more than an affectation. Anka had joined the undead. Sometimes he journeyed through her town, Weimar, but he made no attempt to visit. Once he took pen and paper and wrote to all his women friends. He hated himself as soon as he mailed the letter to her. She did not reply. His diaries did not resist human nature's tendency to gild the lily, a riot at one meeting left one injured man, who died in hospital, but Goebbels' diary speaks of two dead. Two audiences estimated at 1500 by the VB became 3000 in the diary. While the newspapers referred to one shot being fired at an Essen meeting, the diary turned it into shooting 15 but he was writing for effect. The early diaries were composed in a lively vernacular often difficult to convey in translation. Most prevalent in their pages was his sense of loneliness, his happiness when a cheering audience chaired him out onto the street. But one constant in his life was so ever-present that he only rarely referred to it the pain from his crippled foot, which no doctor seemed able to dispel. On October 12 the letter came from Gregor Strasser reporting that Hitler mistrusted Goebbels and had even cursed his name. Goebbels wondered if he should quit. He planned to tackle Hitler about the party's program when he came to Dortmund on October 24. In preparation, he finished reading Mein Kampf. Who is this man? he exclaimed, strangely impressed, half plebeian, half God. Is he Jesus Christ himself or just Saint John? But it was not easy arranging an appointment with a messiah, Karl Severing, the Prussian minister of the interior 16 forbade Hitler to speak anywhere in Prussia so the violent Dortmund meeting went ahead without him. Hitler attempted to reach Ham next day, but Severing issued an arrest warrant and he turned back. Strasser spoke instead. When Hitler came to Brunswick, which was outside Prussia, for a regional convention in November, Goebbels saw him again this was their second meeting. It was November 4, 1925. With Bernhard Rust, he secured a 6 30 p.m. appointment with Hitler. He's just having a meal recorded Goebbels. At once he jumps to his feet and shakes my hand like an old friend. And those big blue eyes of his. Like stars. He's pleased to see me. I am in transports of delight. After ten minutes he withdraws. Then he has his speech ready in outline. Meanwhile I am driven over to the meeting, and speak for two hours. Huge applause, and then shouts of Heil and applause he is there. He shakes my hand. He is still completely exhausted after his own great speech. Then he speaks here for half an hour too. With wit, irony, humor, and sarcasm, with seriousness, with fervor, with passion. This man's got everything to be a king. The born popular leader. The coming dictator. Afterwards he waited outside Hitler's door hoping to speak to him but he was fobbed off with a third handshake. This fell some way short of the heart-to-heart -heart talk he had planned. At his own meetings the communist violence was getting out of hand. They often ended with riots, with shattered beer mugs and splintered furniture. At Chemnitz on November 18 he put his views on Lenin and Hitler to 2,000 communists, who listened in silence. Then a thousand beer glasses were smashed, 150 people were injured and one man, or two, killed. Two days later he met Hitler again, in Saxony. Hitler invited him to speak first, how small I feel, then presented him with his photograph inscribed with greetings to the Rhineland. The framed portrait would remain on Goebbels' desk until the very hour he died. On Thursday November 26, 1925 he arrived in Berlin for the first time. His impressions were overwhelming, the vast sea of houses and buildings, the polyglot population, 
the bustle, the police with their helmets and truncheons. Berlin was a sinful babel of brick, stone, and concrete. Goebbels addressed that night an audience of thousands he did not note how many or where. Everybody was there, including both Strasser brothers, he found Otto as decent as Gregor, Gottfried Fetter, the party's chief theoretician, and Dr. Wilhelm Frick, the lawyer who had connived at Hitler's 1923 putsch from within Munich police headquarters. The Nazi party here in Berlin was weak, probably less than 1,000 names. Dr. Ernst Schoolange, a civil servant, was the local Gauleiter. He had lost an arm and half his face in the war. They say he's a pacifist, commented Goebbels laconically. Visiting the Reichstag building he was repelled by the spectacle of these parliamentarians, Jews and their jackals, in their natural habitat. He dismissed the politicians in his diary with an obscenity and claimed to have felt such nausea that he had to flee. Afterwards he paid a social visit to Helene Bechstein of the millionaire Piano 5, God Disposes Otherwise Manufacturing Family. The Bechsteins were among Hitler's earliest backers. A few days later the Prussian political police section IA opened their first dossier on Goebbels. The Albertus Magnus Society revalued the ancient debt he owed them and on December 7, 1925 mailed a claim for repayment to his old lodgings in Cologne. It was returned marked gone away. It was not that he was lying low. On November 15 he had stage managed the homecoming of the remains of Ludwig Nick Mann, a nationalist shot by Belgian occupation troops at Sturkrade in June 1923, he spoke at the funeral in Nickman's native town, Boer. Three weeks later he staged an even bigger ceremony in Leo Schlageter's honor. Not for nothing had he read Richard Wagner's The Art of Directing.1500, Goebbels wrote 2000, brown-shirt S.A. men paraded out to the deserted, snow-flecked heathland spot where the French had put Schlageter to death. Then to the throb of muffled drums, the entire force marched down Dusseldorf's most expensive boulevard, the Konig Sally. The public acclaim was in sharp contrast to the frosty silence Goebbels met from his parents. At raid he found that his father had bought a radio set the modern mind-narrowing device, scoffed his son, oblivious of the role that radio would play in his later life. Everything piped in. The Philistines' ideal. 26 But Goebbels had a new father figure on his horizon. That Christmas Hitler sent him a leather-bound main camp inscribed with a tribute to the exemplary manner of his fight. At a Hanover conference of the Northwestern Bloc on November 22 Gregor Strasser agreed that Goebbels should draft a new program. Goebbels spent most of December on it, since it had to be ready for their next Gauleiters conference in Hanover. The redrafting was harder than he had anticipated. In its final form it comprised 24 basic demands, all of them militantly anti-bourgeois, the party would respect private property, but nationalize all heavy industry and the great estates. Meanwhile Goebbels set about literary projects of his own, including a portrait gallery of political personalities, and a collection of his own political letters, the second revolution dot to his discomfiture, when he arrived for the Hanover meeting on January 24. 1926 he found that Hitler had sent Gottfried Fetter to attend and observe. The debate on Goebbels' Elberfeld guidelines lasted all next day. There was criticism of his lenient approach to Russia and the communists. He went outside, smoked a cigarette, spoke for an hour, then saw the program adopted. According to Kaufmann, Goebbels was not sparing in his criticism of Hitler and Munich. According to Otto Strasser, he even climbed on a chair and proposed that the petit bourgeois Hitler be expelled from the party. According to Rosenberg, he shrieked, Hitler has betrayed socialism, 32 afterwards Strasser pumped his hand and Fetter left to report to Hitler. Concerned about this ugly trend, Hitler sent for Strasser, Strasser phoned Goebbels afterward, saying that Wolf Hitler's sobriquet was coming round to their point of view but was going to call a conclave of all Germany's Gauleiters at Bamberg, on his own home ground. Totally misreading the situation, Goebbels was delighted. In Bamberg, he decided, we shall act the coy beauty, and seduce Hitler into our camp 33 at Bamberg on the appointed day, Sunday February 14, he met Gregor Strasser early and they agreed their plan of action before walking over to the meeting. 
Hitler drove grandly past, before halting his chauffeur and offering Goebbels his hand. The young man took it, but the laugh was on him. Hitler had packed the audience with loyal local officials, he spoke for four hours about high politics and diplomacy, and Goebbels thought it prudent, on balance, to keep his mouth shut. He heard Hitler oppose all thought of dispossessing the princes and landed aristocracy, they were of course prominent among his backers. For us, ruled Hitler, there are no princes, only Germans. He forbade all further discussion of the party program, it had been sanctified by the blood of the party's first martyrs. I am quite stunned wrote Goebbels the next day. What kind of Hitler is this? A reactionary? Astonishingly clumsy and unsure of himself. The Russian question he misses the point entirely. Italy and England are our natural allies. Awful. Our mission is to smash Bolshevism. Bolshevism is a Jewish sham. We are to disinherit the Russians. All 180 millions of them. He recorded that Fetter, Ley, Stryker and Esser all nodded approval. Strasser lost his nerve and spoke only haltingly good old honest Strasser, A.C.H. Gott, we are no match at all for these swine down here, 34 Goebbels returned to Elberfeld full of doubts, both about himself and about Adolf Hitler. Strasser in fact panicked, he circularized all the Gauleiters asking them to return to him for destruction every single copy of the Goebbels guidelines. Goebbels now had the reputation of a slippery intriguer, an opportunist. People called him the chap with the tiny, cold, monkey's paws 35 behind his back at Bamberg Stryker called him dangerous 36 learning of this from Fabka, Goebbels fired off a furious handwritten letter to Stryker, I am informed that you said that nobody knew where I come from or what I am really up to in the movement. What right, he challenged, had Stryker of all people to cast aspersions on him, 37 he even wrote to Hitler complaining about Stryker's calumny. But Bamberg had brought a parting of the ways for Goebbels. He was shifting his loyalty from Strasser to Hitler, though unconsciously and imperceptibly at first. In the next issue of Letters he emulated Hitler's condemnation of the demand by other nationalist organizations for a boycott of Italy for her oppression of the German community in the South Tyrol. Returning from a trip to East Prussia to Essen, grimy capital of the Ruhr, he found it decked out in swastika flags for the party rally on March 6. 4,000 members filled the concert hall. The delegates agreed to the proposal that there should be one large Ruhrgau, amalgamating the smaller five, God disposes otherwise Rhineland and Westphalian Goss, with Pfeffer, Kaufmann and Goebbels jointly in command. Goebbels bulks larger in his own diary version of this meeting than in the official minutes, which mention him only once when he read out a bland telegram from Hitler. The bad, said Hitler, must not be allowed to enslave the good 41 This was a precept that both men were to overlook in the years ahead. A few days later Hitler flattered Kaufmann, Goebbels and Lutz with invitations to speak in Munich. He pressed lavish treatment on the three, the motor car, that shibboleth of Nazi Germany, played an important part in this softening up process for they found Hitler's magnificent Mercedes waiting to drive them to their hotel. According to Otto Strasser the wealth and power that this vehicle represented clinched it for Goebbels. Hitler loaned it to them with a chauffeur to drive them down to Lake Starnberg for an afternoon. His men had put up posters advertising Goebbels' speech, on National Socialism or Communism, at the famous Burger Brau Beer Hall. Hitler embraced him before the audience, amid cheers and tumult, and Goebbels noticed tears in his eyes. Over dinner he took in the unfamiliar faces around him Hitler's decent, calm, friendly, clever, reserved private secretary Rudolf Hess, his meticulous treasurer Franz Xaver Swartz, his diminutive general manager Philip Buller. Hitler showed them over the new party headquarters at No Schellingstrasse, and again talked of Italy and Britain as future allies and warned of the danger from Russia. On April 9 Hitler signed an Ausweis, certificate, for the three to run the Ruhrgau until further notice. Goebbels took flowers round to Hitler the next morning and they talked again about foreign policy. His case is compelling. But I think he has still not quite sized up the problem of Russia. Nonetheless, the two men were finding each other. I strongly urge you, 
Goebbels wrote to Gregor Strasser on April 19, to arrange to talk things over with Hitler as soon as possible. That day he and Hitler drove up to Stuttgart to speak at two meetings and again Hitler flung his arms around him. Adolf Hitler, the young man wrote mushily in his diary back at Elberfeld, I love you, because you are great and simple at the same time what we call a genius. 44 he returned to Munich for the party's annual general meeting at the Burgerbrau on May 21. The minutes show that 657 party members were present. Goebbels recorded that he was greeted with a storm of joy and enthusiasm. The minutes were less lyrical. They show that Hitler mentioned him only once in his two-hour statement, I am glad to say that this year has seen several first-class speakers come to the fore, with our friend Goebbels from Elberfeld out in front applause 45 Goebbels put it more vividly. He publicly lauded me to the skies, he recorded. The regional headquarters had moved into a suite of five rooms at No. 8 Our Schulstrasse in Elberfeld. Goebbels was not happy with his own position in the GAU however. On June 6 the local party officials, Bazaar Kleders, held a meeting to resolve which of the three should be actual GAU leiter. The choice fell on Kaufmann. Lutz hinted to Goebbels that Kaufmann had rigged the vote with the help of Cook and Joseph Turboven. Disappointed, Goebbels decided to leave the Ruhr. He travelled to Berlin two days later, ostensibly to speak at Spandau and Nuckeln, in fact to talk things over with Gau Leiter School Ange. Several of Schlange's men asked Goebbels to take over. He declined, unable to decide between Munich and Berlin. For the time being he is still preoccupied with the opposite sex. They are a welcome distraction from work, a habit rather like the cigarette smoking which he now finds impossible to give up. On June 10, 1926 he receives a letter from Elsjanka, the first of several Dear John letters from her. He asks his diary callously, has the right moment now come, 48 dumping this half Jewess will make way for other less compromising females and for his own possible transfer to Munich away from the political intrigues in Elberfeld. His roving eye appraises every handsome woman regardless of social or marital standing, and indeed why not? He is young and eligible. Opposite me, he writes one July day in a Birch Teskeden hotel, sits a beautiful, beautiful woman. He spends three days stalking this gorgeous brunette she stays demure, and I am a silly ass. I am chasing her like a schoolboy 49 that same day, as he is visiting the Obersalzburg for the first time, his carriage blocks the narrow mountain lane, immobilized by a broken axle. A blonde country wench is unable to get past until he stands in front of the horses. Oh what a beauty you are, he remarks in his diary. She laughs out loud and waves to me long after. We write her a little note the coachman's lad takes it back to her asking her to make a signal on the morrow 50 that is the last he hears of her. He accepts defeat, aware of his cruel handicap. My foot bothers me a lot, he writes. I can't stop thinking about it. Every woman, he writes helplessly, goes straight to my blood. I chase around like a starving wolf. But I am bashful as a child 51 he had all but found his way to Hitler. Hitler had come north for the first time, spending the third week of June 1926 in the Ruhr and Rhineland, where he addressed private audiences at Elberfeld, Bochum and Ruhr industrialists at Essen. At Essen he also spoke to 2000, and met director Arnold their local financial backer. Goebbels studied the Nazi leader closely, seeing him alternately as a likable human being, as a towering intellect, and as a wayward, willful character. He studied his talents for gesture, mimicry, and oratory. 5. God disposes otherwise a born agitator, he concluded. One could conquer the world with that man 52 before leaving the Ruhr on the 19th Hitler finally ruled that Kaufmann should be the sole Gau leiter. Goebbels could ill conceal his chagrin. It encouraged him therefore that at the party's first annual rally for three years, held at Weimar on July 3 4, 1926, the contingent from Berlin liked him, the capital had sent four companies of SA stormtroopers, it provided an added impetus that one of the Berliners, Josephine von Baer, an affectionate girl who had plied him with chocolates in Berlin in February, was there too. His own prepared talk on propaganda had Hitler in stitches. 
Hitler himself talked on politics, ideologies, and organization. The photographs show Goebbels limping at his side through Weimar's cobbled streets, wearing a jacket buttoned just beneath his tie knot. He claimed that 15,000 men were in the march past, the party's history would speak of 10,000. The pictures suggest a smaller turnout. He willingly accepted Hitler's invitation to the Obersalzburg a few days after Weimar. Emil Maurice, Hitler's chauffeur, drove them out to the idyllic Lake Conesse, Hess and his girlfriend Ilse came too. Up at his still modest mountain villa Hitler dilated on Germany's social and racial questions, Goebbels fell in love with him all over again and decided that here was the creator of the Third Reich, cat-like crafty, clever, skillful, compassionate, but like a lion too, roaring and larger than life. 56 Infected by this prolonged exposure to his idol, Goebbels saw in the sky a white cloud shaped like a swastika, it could only be a portent of his destiny. Now, wrote Goebbels, hypnotized, leaving him on July 25th, the last doubts in me have vanished. Germany will live. Heil Hitler. 57 His brain a whirl with these impressions, he is still nursing Hitler's farewell bouquet of red roses as he boards the overnight train back to the Rhineland. A beautiful woman shares his compartment. She talks engagingly with him, and they arrange to meet in Dusseldorf on the morrow. He limps around the city for two hours searching for her, but without luck. God has disposed otherwise, he writes afterwards, finding the divinity a useful alibi for his own shortcomings. 5. God disposes otherwise 6. The Opium Den 6. The Opium Den s howled he accept the job as the new Gau lighter of Berlin? It was no sinecure. With around 10,000 supporters the Communist Party was aggressively in the ascendant. The N.S.D.A.P.S. Berlin Gau had been founded in February 1925 and had attracted only 137 votes in the municipal elections that October. The present Gau Leiter had lost his stomach for the fight. He was however one of the joint backers of the Strasser Brothers Camp Verlag Publishing House, which had begun issuing a proletarian newspaper, the Berliner Arbeiter Zeitung, in March 1926. This sold some 3,000 copies each week. Point one, unable to contain the snarling militancy of the Berlin SA under Kurt Deluge, Dr. Schoolange retired on June 20. Deputizing for him, Eric Schmeidig called a meeting of the district officers in Gregor Strasser's presence and secured a unanimous vote that they should invite Dr. Goebbels to come from the rear to take over. The Berlin political police, who had agents planted in the Nazi party, recorded prematurely on July 29 that he had been offered the Gau but had turned it down. Point two Goebbels wrote to Otto Strasser on August 3 that he was still undecided, should I, or should I not? Probably not. The rumors of his probable defection from Strasser's to Hitler's camp led to rumbles of discontent. Gregor Strasser, who had set the wheels in motion to lure him to Berlin, later remarked ruefully in his Franconian dialect, a sobliter obernar bin i g wesson. What a bloody fool I've been. Friend Gregor Strasser is pretty jealous of me, observed Goebbels. Lying to his own diary, he denied a few days later that he was selling out to Hitler. He blamed Karl Kaufmann's men for starting the legend, and the Strasser brothers for giving it wider currency. I'll teach the lot of them, he added darkly. Point three he had already acquired a taste for the rough and tumble of radical politics. He led a raiding party on a theater staging an award-winning but anti-German play by Karl Zuck Mayer. Goebbels' Nazis hurled stink bombs into the audience and he was disappointed that only five women swooned. Point four in Berlin, the battles would be uglier. Here the ramshackle and impoverished local party was in crisis. On August 26 there was a rowdy gathering of its officials, around 120 people according to the police. Schmeidig, standing in as Gau Leiter, was hooted down by the SA. The chief of the Berlin SS the Schutzes Tafel, an elite emerging within the stormtroopers shouted that he had just spoken by phone with Hitler in person and been given full powers, which he promptly used to dismiss Schmeidig. Point five. The next day Munich formally asked Goebbels to take over in Berlin, but only as a stopgap. He was still in two minds. Playing for time he sent what he called a semi-refusal to Hitler. Point six. He spends a weekend at Bayreuth in September 1926. 
Here he falls briefly in love with Winifred Wagner's young and vivacious daughters, romps around in the hay with the youngest of them, the sweetest little brat for an hour and then purples with embarrassment before the others. Point seven. I often wish I had such a darling German female around, he laments then remembers young Josephine von Baer in Berlin. The prospect of seeing her excites him, and he returns there in mid-September. In Berlin he spends an evening alone with Dr. School Ange and Schmeidick. Both men plead with him to take over. Point nine in two minds still. He visits the party's primitive headquarters at No. 189 Potsdamer Strasse. It is housed in a gloomy downstairs room at the rear a windowless vault lit only by a naked bulb, he will later report, in which Schmeidick sits hunched over his cash ledger struggling to make ends meet. A cloud of stale air and tobacco smoke hits him as he goes in. Newspapers are stacked around the walls. Out-of-work party members are loitering around there are 270,000 unemployed in Berlin alone chain-smoking and tittle-tattling. They called it the opium den. He is glad to get out to Potsdam with Josephine that evening. They reverently tread the same sod as Frederick the Great and stroll around Sans Souci Park Goebbels wants to hold her hand, but lacks the courage to try. The affair with Else is over. They meet one Sunday in Cologne and trade insults and she writes him another farewell letter. Goebbels sends his sister Maria over to fetch her on Monday morning for one final scene. With tear-streaked face, Else accompanies him in the drizzle to the train. For some reason Goebbels dramatizes their final parting in his diary, the train draws away. Else turns around and weeps. I close the window. Rain is falling on the coach roof. I have gone out of her life. My heart is broken 12 amplifying Goebbels' own unpublished diaries, the Nazi party's archives acquired a file of vivid monthly resumes on the Berlin Ga written by a young activist called Reinhold Mucho, who had joined aged 20 in December 1925. These reports show the methods to which the party resorted, including a barrage of defamatory propaganda, ceaseless rowdy demonstrations, mindless provocations, and violence for its own sake. The party already had three martyrs in Berlin Willy Dreher killed in 1924, Werner Dole in 1925, and now on September 26, 1926 the 44-year-old Harry Anderson, murdered by a six, the Opium Den communist gang in Kreuzberg. It was a tragedy for the Berlin Gau, recorded Mucho in October 1926, that it had never had a real leader. Dr. Schoolange had made no headway against the internal bickering. Schmeidick proved even less capable. The opposition Kurt Deluge and the SA had put forward their own candidate as Gau Leiter, Oskar Hauenstein. Every top-level meeting ended with a row. Goebbels began feeling his way into Berlin. October 9 found him speaking at the party's Mark Brandenburg Freedom Rally, a torchlight parade just outside the city in Potsdam. The police file shows that he called for the destruction of the present state. The Berliners roared approval. You yourself will have noticed, wrote Schmeidick encouragingly, how very keenly every member of the party in Berlin wants you as their leader. 16 His mind already made up, Goebbels told him that the stumbling block was financial, if the terms were right he would accept the job. Schmeidick bowed to his demands. While Goebbels even now delayed announcing his decision, the infighting in Berlin increased. Schmeidick had to reassure officials that Goebbels' salary would be paid by Munich, not Berlin. There were ugly scenes, with Hauenstein thumping Otto Strasser, and Strasser challenging somebody else to a duel. Finally Goebbels took the milestone decision to accept Berlin's offer. Back in Elberfeld on October 17 he broke the news to Lutz and Kaufmann, and noted in his diary, off to Berlin at last on November 1. Berlin is the focal point, he reasoned, for us 219 the formal appointment was dated October 26, and was announced in the full Kisker B.O. Botter two days later. On November 1 the NS letters published his farewell to the Ruhr. And now, he wrote, it's full steam ahead into the great asphalt jungle Berlin he who held Berlin held Germany. Hitler gave him authority to rule the Gau with an iron fist. November 5, recorded Goebbels. Hitler. Munich. Signs my terms 20 The Reich capital was like no other city in Europe overpopulated, 
throbbing with life 24 hours a day. It was an international hodgepodge of races, the collision point of Western and Eastern cultures. This sprawling heap of bricks and stone was divided into 20 boroughs of varying size and wealth, from Zeelenderf, with 470,000 inhabitants, to the proletarian slum Kreuzberg with 370,000. Politically the city was a red stronghold and Goebbels would find only a few hundred paid-up Nazis there, in the whole Reich there were still only 49,000. In the March 1925 presidential election 308,591 Berliners had voted for the Communist, KPD, candidate Ernst Teddy Thalmann. In the municipal election that October, 52% had voted for the Marxist parties, the KPD increasing its vote to 347,382. Its front organizations like the Red League of Combat Veterans, Front Kampferbund, and the Central Office of Red Aid, Zentralstelle der Roten Hilfe, were funded by the Soviet Embassy and Trade Mission. Thus Goebbels had a highly visible opponent. Besides, he would be doing battle for the first time with the Jews. Berlin, Mucho observed, is red and Jewish in equal measure 21 in 1816 there had been only 3,400 Jews but this figure had swollen to 36,500 by 1,871, and to 100,000 at the turn of the century. By the time of Goebbels' arrival, one-third of Germany's half-million Jews were concentrated in the city. They made up 4-3% of its population, but they provided over half Berlin's lawyers, 15% of the real estate agents, and nearly 11% of the doctors, they dominated the wealthy ranks of Berlin's dentists, pharmacists, judges, public prosecutors, and academics, and maintained a near stranglehold on the world of the arts. While Moss's Berliner Tageblatt would become one of Goebbels' principal enemies the newspaper had been founded in 1871 specifically for the protection of Jewish interests in Germany he would arbitrarily lump all the bourgeois newspapers into the general category of Juden Press. When he said that the real power in Berlin was in Jewish hands there was a grain of truth in it. Dr. Heinrich Brüning, Chancellor of the Reich from 1930 to 1932, could find only one bank not so controlled. After ordering a government inquiry, he directed that its findings be kept secret for fear of provoking anti-Semitic riots. A series of scandals surrounding Jewish swindlers like Kudisker, Sklerak and the Barmet brothers paraded through the courts. Many of the public prosecutors in Berlin were Jewish. Goebbels would portray the Berlin police as largely Jewish-controlled, in fact of the top officials only the powerful deputy chief, vice police president, who directed Section IA, the 300-man political police force, forerunner of the Gestapo, was a Jew. He was not just any Jew. Forty-six years old, the son of a millionaire grain merchant, Dr. Bernhard Weiss had served like his three brothers with distinction in the war, won the Iron Cross, and become the first Jew ever to be accepted for the Prussian higher civil service. His army personnel file speaks of his highly developed sense of honor but also of his overdeveloped ambition, conceit, and immodesty, and of a powerful oversensitivity tending to cloud his clarity of judgment. 26 appointed deputy police chief on March 17. 1927 in the Red Brick Police Headquarters on Alexander Platz, the diminutive, 5 foot 4, Bernhard Weiss would become Goebbels' sworn enemy not just because of the rigor with which he deployed his 14,000 truncheon wielding uniformed police in the struggle for the streets of Berlin, but because he was a Jew and even his best friends said he looked like a caricature of one. Dr. Goebbels would shun no libel to blacken his name. Instinctively carrying on an ancient tradition of name-calling, he seized on Dr. Weiss' nickname of Isidore and commissioned a scurrilous Nazi marching song about him. He would highlight every malfeasance of the criminal demimonde and identify it as Jewish. In these closing years of the Weimar Republic, he was unfortunately not always wrong. In 1930 Jews would be convicted in 42 of 210 known narcotics smuggling cases, in 1932-69 of the 272 known international narcotics dealers were Jewish. 6. The opium den Jews were arrested in over 60% of the cases concerning the running of illegal gambling dens, 193 of the 411 pickpockets arrested in 1932 were Jews. 
In 1932 no fewer than 31,000 cases of fraud, mainly insurance swindles, would be committed by Jews. Statistical comparisons are of course usually odious, but it was against this background that Goebbels now started his campaign. He would concentrate initially on the western boroughs of Charlottenburg, Wilmersdorf, Skinneberg, and Tiergarten, where over half Berlin's Jews had settled. They had originally populated the disheveled streets around the railroad termini of central and northwestern Berlin where they had arrived from the east and from Galicia, but as they had prospered they had descended on the leafier western boroughs. Over 13% of Wilmersdorf's 196,000 inhabitants were Jews. The sheer scale of the battle fought between Dr. Goebbels and Isidore Weiss can be judged from the court records. The police targeted the Nazi Gau Leiter with no fewer than 40 court actions, Weiss himself was involved in 23 cases, Hitler came only eighth, with 16. Goebbels and Weiss would clash head-on in four groups of trials, involving ten specific charges against Goebbels and a score more against his editors and journalists. In addition Weiss started nine other court actions, including three against Gregor Strasser, for calling him Isidore. Nearly all of these immensely complex cases were appealed all the way up the German legal system, but Weiss secured 60 convictions, including 19 against Dr. Goebbels. To non-Germans unfamiliar with the stiffness of Prussia, the pomposity of a civil servant like Weiss resorting to such legal sanctions seems breathtakingly pointless and even self-defeating. His first action, in May 1927, was against a Berlin news vendor who had displayed on his newsstand a full Kisker Biobotter featuring a competent and by no means hostile sketch of Dr. Weiss, the unfortunate news vendor went to jail for a month. The mere application of the name Isidore, whereas the police vice president's first name is in reality Bernhardt, was a deliberate and purposeful insult, argued Weiss's superior, Karl Zorgibel, on June 1, demanding the prosecution of the full Kisker Biobotter's editor too. In a telling lapsus lingui police chief Zorgibel's indictment of Goebbels dated March 2, 1928 actually accused him of libeling the police president Dr. Weiss thus accidentally conceding what all Berlin already knew, that it was his deputy who called the shots, and not he. Tirelessly and at taxpayers' expense Weiss fought the battles against Goebbels and his newspaper, the court docket sues with the cold fury aroused in him by irreverent cartoons. Weiss asking a policeman who demands the arrest of a communist thug, ban them. Why? Did he attack a Jew, by caricatures, a bespectacled, big-nosed donkey splay legged on thin ice, 34 and even by a crossword puzzle? It was November 7, 1926 before Goebbels actually arrived in Berlin. Dr. Otto Strasser met him at the station. Goebbels' own legend, written up as Battle for Berlin, would have him hurrying straight from the Anhalt station to a packed public meeting. The truth was more prosaic. The Berlin Gau was penniless and in disarray. He made his first public speech at a memorial ceremony organized on the 9th, the anniversary of Hitler's failed Munich Putsch, by the party's women's order, Frauen Orden, in the Veterans Building, Krieger Virinchos, in Chaussee Strasse. When Otto Strasser expressed irritation that Goebbels had arrived late, and had squandered money on a taxi, the new Gau Leiter replied, on the contrary. I would have arrived in two taxis if I could have. The people must see that our firm is up and running. In his speech he expressed admiration for the men who had gunned down the Jewish politician Dr. Walter Rathenau four years earlier. For this remark he was later summoned to police headquarters, but the resulting prosecution was subsequently abandoned. 37 On the same day he issued the famous circular number 1 to all Gau officials, which began, As of today I am taking over the Berlin-Brandenburg Gau as Gau Leiter. Addressing the unappetizing conditions at the opium den in Potsdamer Strasse, he decreed that Gau headquarters was neither a flop house nor a waiting room, and future party members would need an appointment to speak with him. His circular displayed both realism and clever psychology. While appointing the troublesome and ambitious SA commander Kurt Deluge who was 29 as his deputy, he simultaneously downgraded the former Greater Berlin Gau to the rank of Ortsgruppe or local, and downgraded the present locals to sections. This made for a tighter ship and fewer illusions. Defining the role of the militant SA he wrote, 
S.A. and S.S. are the instruments whereby we shall attain power, and he ruled that neither was to appear in public without his prior consent. He ended the circular with the promise, Adolf Hitler will visit the Gau as soon as we have become a united force and one to be reckoned with. 39 The Strasser brothers were aghast at Goebbels' arrival in their capital. But over the coming months he forced a level of activity that Berlin had not seen before, he founded a Nazi speaker's school, he developed a constant, intrusive, drum-beating propaganda campaign, and he provoked clashes with the communists that hit Berlin's newspaper headlines time and again. On Sunday, November 14 he led a deliberately provocative propaganda march through the working-class suburb of Nukeln which aroused both fury and consternation among the local communists. The newspapers reported that in the ensuing disorders use was made of missiles, knuckle dusters, clubs, and even pistols 40 cutting out the dead wood, he threw out half of the Gauss members. To secure its finances he founded an elitist Freedom League of three or four hundred Berliners pledged to contribute 10% of their income in return for promises of later rewards. His first imperative was to finance new premises for the Gau in the city center, his second to fund a marching band of 46 the opium den or 50 musicians with a full-time instructor, his third to purchase motor transport. At the end of December Goebbels moved into new offices at No Lutzau Strasse, four office rooms with all mod cons and two telephone lines. His tactical object was to capture the communists' pawns, the unemployed hordes of Berlin. Typical of his SA foot soldiers was the young law student Horst Wessel, whose handwritten diary we now have. Aged just 19, he had joined the party that autumn. How I came to the National Socialists, he asked. Out of disillusion really. My nationalist radicalism, or rather my radical nationalism had not found a home. But the Nazis, as they were already called, were radical radical in every respect. Wessel had been a member of the Bismarck and then Viking League since 1922, organizations which had just played soldiers. Goebbels Gau was, he soon found, different. The new Gau lighter put the accent on socialism. The right-wing parties spurned us for our socialist slant, wrote Wessel, and they weren't all that wrong, because national socialists had more in common with the communist RFB wrote Front Kampferbund than with the right-wing Stahlhelm 42 during December Goebbels reorganized Berlin's SA into three regiments, Standarden. He tightened discipline, banning smoking and drinking on duty. On November 20 he met district leaders, Kreis Leiter, and laid down guidelines for the future. Later that month he spoke in the Veterans Building on Germany, Colony or State. Scores of new members joined that same evening. Two weeks later 1800 people crowded in to hear him speak on the road to power. A breathless unanimity replaced the brawling and bickering of previous GAU meetings. Horst Wessel was one of those dedicated to the party. No sacrifice in time or money, he would write, no danger of arrest or violence could scare me off. The Sturmabteilungen, the SA, were the stewards, the movement's fist against the police and the Marxists. The structure itself was copied from the communists' sections instead of locals, the cell system, our press advertising and propaganda clearly betrayed their communist inspiration. The vitality of this new movement was vast, best demonstrated by the defections to us from the Marxist camp. Goebbels created an atmosphere of constant activity. To Dr. Goebbels sick alone, wrote Wessel, goes the credit for having impinged the movement so rapidly on the Berlin public's consciousness. The man had extraordinary talents for oratory and organization. There was nothing he couldn't turn his hand to. The members were devoted to him. The SA would have let itself be torn to pieces for him. Goebbels was like Hitler himself. He took care of the injured he really was a first-class leader, a leader with class 44 at first the Juden press ignored Goebbels. Denied the oxygen of publicity, he forced violent confrontations with the communists. After an initial blooding in Spandau on January 25th, when 200 of them infiltrated a meeting intending to disrupt his speech. Goebbels' troops fought three battles, at Cottbus, in Berlin's sleazy Ferris rooms, and at suburban Lichterfeld. Goebbels had sent five truckloads of SA men to Cottbus to boost the puny local contingent during a two-day Nazi freedom rally. 
It was an icy January night, and at dawn the men drove into Cottbus, where the local SA provided billets. We wanted to show them, wrote Mucho, that the Berlin SA turned up everywhere we were needed. The march through Cottbus began, our Dr. Goebbels was with Deluge at Kaiser Wilhelm Platz, taking the salute 45 as Goebbels delivered an impromptu speech there were already taunts of long live the Communist Internationale. A pitched battle broke out. The police and soldiers waded in with truncheons and rifle butts. The SA had two seriously injured, the police four. But the blood had been shed for naught, the entire Berlin Juden press, lamented Mucho, breathed not a word about our Cottbus demonstration. The Strassers Arbeiter Zeitung, masthead slogan, the workers' only newspaper in Berlin not beholden to loan capital, published Goebbels' appeal for funds for our wounded SA comrades. 700 marks flowed in. Goebbels owed a lot to the Strasser brothers. Otto had also arranged for Hans Steiger, an editor on a bourgeois Berlin newspaper, to provide cheap lodgings in the rooming house run by Frau Steiger at No. 5, M. Karlsbad. No doubt he wanted to keep an eye on Goebbels. M. R. S. Steiger provided a full-length mirror to enable him to practice public speaking postures, but her husband erred badly, trespassing on Goebbels' feelings by circulating a ballad that touched upon the Gauleiter's private life and using a limping, lopsided rhythm designed, Goebbels felt sure, to mock his disability. The Gauleiter, it turned out, could stand any amount of satire so long as it was not leveled at him. The second great battle happened in the rundown Ferris Rooms, a traditional communist meeting place behind No. 124 Müllerstrasse in Berlin's working-class suburb of Wedding, on February 11. There were 200 communists among Goebbels' thousand-strong audience. As he spoke on the collapse of the bourgeois class state disturbances broke out and Deluge sent in the SA to evict the first troublemakers. The communists retreated, and the Nazis held the high ground, the gallery. In the few minutes before the police could intervene, the SA had roughed up 83 communists. When Goebbels resumed speaking, the platform was littered with bleeding men on stretchers. One man, Albert Tonak, aged 21, was hospitalized with concussion. In the VB report Goebbels described how he had learned that a surgeon called Levy was planning to delve into Tonak's skull, 100 of his SA men, unemployed proletarians in brown shirts, had stormed the hospital and rescued him. Goebbels added an appeal for funds to establish a party clinic of seven or eight rooms to treat their own emergency cases. Tonak became the little doctor's chauffeur, and later died on Hitler's eastern battlefields. Goebbels had found the right formula. After this battle the press howled with rage and more funds flowed in. He got the big car he coveted. He claimed six the opium den that anonymous benefactors had donated the four-seater Benz motor car to the GAU, but Isidore Weiss determined that the vehicle, license tag 26637LA, had previously belonged to a merchant bank, Grundmann & Co., that the Tuot House and Mark's purchase price had come from the Freedom League, and that it was registered in Goebbels' own name. By late February treasurer Franz Wilk could report that the GAU now had 8 to 10,000 marks in cash and assets. Lecturing the Freedom League, his cash cows, on my political awakening on the 15th the Gauleiter again claimed to have been plotting clandestinely with Hitler in Munich as early as 1919, and to have fought in the resistance against the French and Belgians occupying the Ruhr. Just four days after the Ferris Rooms fight, Goebbels and his SA hooligans filled all 1500 seats at a hall in Spandau. The left, still reeling, stayed away. Their newspapers uttered dire warnings to the workers to keep their eyes on this unexpected fascist menace. The police watched with mounting fury as control of the streets passed into the hands of the political mobs. A perverted sense of pride seized the Berlin SA. Their young chronicler Reinhold Mucho doubted that their brother brown shirts of Stuttgart, Weimar, or Hamburg could have survived such battles. Now, he observed, the Berlin Jews saw the writing on the wall. More printing ink would flow against the party during February 1927 than in all the preceding three months. A high watermark in this carnage came in March, just three days after Isidore's appointment. Goebbels had ordered a nighttime function of the Berlin SA to be staged at Treben, 
a little town 20 miles away. About 700 SA men proudly wearing their uniform of jackboots, flat caps, breeches and brown shirts made their way there, a bonfire blazed on the hillside, the flags and standards foregathered, and Goebbels played organ music to them before speaking. These sons of the Brandenburg countryside, reported Mucho in purple prose, hung on every word of this man, their appointed leader in life and death. 54 The trouble began as the 700 Nazis piled into the train back to Berlin. Sitting near the front, they found 23 bandsmen of the Red Front's 7th district, Brandenburg, and a communist member of the provincial parliament, Paul Hoffmann. By the time the train pulled into East Lichterfeld station every window had been shattered. As the Nazis jumped out a shot rang out and one SA leader was hit in the stomach. Another SA man was grazed on the head by a bullet. The police stormed the platform and arrested several Nazis. They found the communist bandsmen cowering on the floor surrounded by shattered glass, splintered wood and rocks, 18 of them were injured, 12 seriously. Hoffman was barely recognizable, his face smeared with blood. A thousand more Nazis had meanwhile arrived outside the station to join the SA for a march through Berlin's bourgeois western suburbs. The gunfire caused uproar. Goebbels, Deluge and Gau manager Dagobert Dürer arrived in their limousine, to storms of applause. Where the road curved, wrote one SA man, there stood our doctor in his car. Standing with arm raised he saluted us and looked into our faces. Goebbels would claim at the resulting court hearings to have called for discipline and calm as his injured comrades were carried out of the station. The owner of a neighboring soap store testified however that after an injured 35-year-old communist had been carried into a taxi two Nazis had torn its door open, one, a thin young man, pulled a pistol out of his pants pocket, and shouted, I'm going to shoot the dog dead. The other, a little man with a right club foot that turned inwards, had dissuaded him. The National Socialists, reported the police, charged into the Communists with a fusillade of revolver shots and wielding steel flagpoles like lances, leaving nine slightly and five seriously injured on the battlefield. 57, Goebbels' version in the full Kisker Biobotter differed. The first shot fired by the Red Assassins, he claimed, hit one of the two police constables in the forearm. He appealed to our SA for help, shouting, Guys, help us, we can't handle it on our own. 58 They marched past Steglitz City Hall and on through West Berlin. Wherever Jews were spotted they were set upon and bludgeoned to the ground. At Wittenberg Platz, where 8,000 people had gathered, Goebbels made a speech. The Reds have spilled our blood, he shrieked. We're not going to allow ourselves to be treated as second-class citizens anymore. He ended with a transparent hint, now don't all go chasing off massacring those Jews down Kerr first and damn, 60 Deutschland awake, came the response the battle cry of the SA. Those were his methods. Horst Wessel, soon to become commander of No. 5 Sturm based on the communist-infested Alexander Platz area, was in the thick of it all. Gunfight on East Lichterfeld Station, three injured but victory. Victory everywhere the SA goes into action. We accomplished what no other movement had in Germany, he wrote with heavy irony in 1929, namely to unite the entire people, because they were all united against us incredibly united. 61 Goebbels now had two more men in the hospital. Eight had been arrested, several would draw prison sentences. Isidore Weiss ordered the Nazis Charlottenburg and Moabit section headquarters as ransacked for weapons, and for several days the Red Front exacted revenge on any Nazis caught alone in the streets. They had captured the party ID of one Nazi, and splashed its photograph on placards all over Berlin two days later, wanted dead or alive. Goebbels however judged only by results, 400 more Berliners joined the party, bringing its membership to 3,000. The Strasser brothers despaired, preferring reason and logic to brute force. The Juden press seized upon the differences between them and articles appeared in the communist Welt M. Abend, the Berliner Tage Blatt, and the equally Jewish Vossist Zeitung gloating over a feud in the House of Hitler 63 still perfecting his techniques, Goebbels stood in front of the folding six, the opium den triptych mirror in M. R. S. Steiger's drawing room practicing each pose and gesture. 
his oratory drew audiences of thousands. He rode their mood, leading them on a tide of invective to a hysterical, cheering, table-rattling finale. He had instinctively developed the art of ceremonial too, to bring audiences to fever pitch the flags, the bands, the deliberately delayed arrival. He spoke at locations from Weinheim in the south to Hamburg in the north. Writing in the letters on April 1st he prescribed how to deal with hecklers. You don't seem to realize that you're at a national socialist meeting, the speaker was to shout at the unfortunate interrupter. I'll not be able to guarantee that you won't be made into a useful member of the human race by a suitable head massage. When I speak in Essen or in Dusseldorf or in Elberfeld Goebbels had written once it's like a holiday for me. We don't have to search for the enemy, he's in our midst lurking in the audience ready to pounce. When I come into the hall a thousand voices shout down with him, there's a hooting and a screeching. Then the struggle begins too, three hours, sometimes longer. And the miracle happens. What was a wild, howling mob turns into human beings of flesh and blood who think and feel just as we do, only more tormented, more trampled on, with an immense hunger for light and succor and gradually the people are recreated before my very eyes. I see just fists and eyes, and there is a holy fire in those eyes. The Ruhrgau held its annual rally on Sunday April 25th. Here too the party's ranks were swelling. Essen is dominated by the swastika and our flag. Rudolf Hess boasted to his fiancée Ilse. Goebbels mailed a picture postcard of the huge assembly to Anke Stahlherm. While he and Hitler addressed the 14,000 invited party members however Goebbels was seething with rage, people had drawn his attention to a scurrilous article published anonymously in the Strasser's newspapers on April 23, entitled Results of Race Mixing. Its anonymous author was Eric Cook. It is well known this venomous piece began that miscegenation results in mental disequilibria. Physical equilibrium is disturbed either by disease or by the stunted growth of individual limbs or by other physical defects. Goebbels took this as a wounding reference to his physical disability. The writer adduced various unflattering examples from history, like the murderous Richard III, who was also a dwarf who limped, and Talleyrand, who possessed a club foot. The word character could not be applied to him 68 Goebbels complained to Hitler that same afternoon. Hitler agreed that coupled with the Camp Verlag's other recent eruptions against Goebbels this article was clearly actionable, he warned against litigating, but promised to tackle the Strassers himself. Eric Cook wrote to Goebbels admitting, or claiming, authorship, but could not resist rubbing salt in the wounds by stating that his article was no more than an exposition of the racial theories our party stands for. 69 The article brought the Goebbels-Strasser feud to boiling point. The Strassers had by now learned that he was raising finance to launch a rival Nazi tabloid in Berlin called Angriff, Attack. Although the Strassers had earlier provided his Gau with every facility in their Arbeiter Zeitung and the NS letters, of which he was still editor, Goebbels had determined to smash their monopoly. The Arbeiter Zeitung was still the official organ of the Berlin Gau and by September 1926 it was already printing a national weekly, the National Socialist for northern Germany, which had also printed the libelous article. Expanding in 1927, the Strassers had persuaded the tall, flabby 26-year-old Hans Hinkel, editor of a local southern newspaper, to invest heavily in their concern, the brothers George, Otto and Franz Strasser still controlled 51%. The firm was thus comparable with the party's Franz et Verlag in the south. But the Strasser publications were less heathen and anti-Semitic than the Hitler Rosenberg newspapers like Volkisker Biobotter. Goebbels undoubtedly nursed an unhealthy complex about the wealthy Strasser family, although his diaries show that he privately respected Gregor more than his later public remarks would allow. Gregor was a member of the Reichstag, which provided him with free first-class travel and immunity from arrest. But Goebbels could call upon the talents of his gifted caricaturist Hans Schweitzer. Mjolnir, and through him he spread the corrosive rumor that Otto had Jewish blood. Gregor reposted that both he and Otto had at least served in the Great War and in the Free Corps after that, unlike Dr. Goebbels or Mr. Schweitzer, and there the matter, for the time being, rested. May 1927 brought first triumph, then disaster. 
On May Day Hitler himself spoke in Berlin for the first time before a private audience because the Prussian Minister of the Interior Albert Grotesinski had banned him from speaking in public. The 5,000 listeners packing into the Clue, a well-known dance hall in Mauerstrasse, still made an impressive audience. Unaware that the police were now just waiting for a pretext to clamp down on him, Goebbels arranged a further mass meeting at the Veterans Building for May 4, where he delivered a poisonous 90-minute tirade against the press, infuriated by its spiteful coverage of Hitler's speech at the Clue. Singling out one journalist, he told his 2,000 listeners to note down the home address of Dr. Otto Krieg of local Anzeiger, who was present, a typically Nazi trick and suggested they find out where others lived and administer a National Socialist head massage to them too. The olive-complexioned Goebbels had just recommended his audience to display their forceful gratitude to a journalist on Germania, who boasted the suspiciously Germanic name of Karl Otto Gretz but was really, he said, a swine of a Jew, Judensaw, 74 Winfried Stuck, an elderly but politically active parson, 6, the opium den exclaimed sarcastically, a fine image of Germanic youth you look, 75 I take it, shouted Goebbels, breaking the pain silence that followed and pointing to the doors, that you're keen to get flung out on your ear, 76 when Stuck taunted Goebbels again, burly young men bundled him downstairs, dragging him the last few yards by his feet. This time Goebbels had gone too far. By the time his guest, leader of Sweden's Nazis, had also spoken, hundreds of police were cordoning the building. A police major closed the meeting down. He ordered the audience to file out singly and be searched for weapons. The police hall was a veritable arsenal of blackjacks, knuckle dusters, knives, and revolvers. 77 18 Nazis were arrested for resisting the search. The press smelled blood and tasted revenge. Their lurid reports had SA thugs battering the parson with beer mugs and kicking him, doctors, they said, marveled that his skull was not fractured. Twenty-four hours later Dr. Bernhard Weiss served a restraining order on Dr. Goebbels, banning him from speaking in Berlin, and dissolving his cow. They also charged him with incitement to violence. After just six months in Berlin the unstoppable Gau lighter seemed to have run into an immovable object, the police vice president of Berlin. 7. Fighting the ugly dragon the ban would stay in force for 11 months. It was the work of the social democratic politician Albert Grotesinski, the minister of the interior in Prussia. The illegitimate son of a servant girl, Grotesinski was a year older than Dr. Weiss and a former metal worker and trade union leader. Point one he had previously been Berlin's police chief himself. The communist red flag accused him of hating the revolutionary working class, the conservative right wing feared that he would use his power to consolidate the social democratic position, the Nazis would fight him tooth and claw. Goebbels would claim that Grotesinski's natural father was not the butcher's boy named in the files but one Ernst Kohn a Jewish merchant in whose service his mother had been employed. No matter that Cohn was only 17 at the time in question, the legend persisted resulting in one of the many libel actions that Goebbels would soon face. The banning document signed by police chief Karl Zorgiebel on May 5, 1927 alleged a catalogue of misdemeanors assaults, criminal damage and firearms offences perpetrated by the GAU since mid-October. In the Ten Commandments issued by Goebbels to the SA, the document read, the ninth reads, resistance to police and state authority today is always stupid, because you will always come off worse. The state will take revenge on you and on us with prison sentences and steep fines. So, if there is no other way, comply with the state authority, but console yourself, we shall square accounts later. The ban also quoted from Goebbels' pamphlet Ways to the Third Reich, domination of the street is the first step to state power. He who purveys his Velton Shaum with terror and brute force will one day possess the power, and thus the right, to overthrow the state. As such aims of association are incompatible with the criminal law, Zorgibel concluded, disbandment is justified too Goebbels was mortified. He refused to sign a form acknowledging receipt of the ban, stating that it was written in unintelligible German.3 Writing to Grotesinski, he pointed out that his Gau embraced the whole province of Brandenburg not just Berlin, the ban is therefore null and void, he argued. He also claimed 7, 
fighting the ugly dragon that Berlin's gutter press, asphalt press, another invented Goebbels' word, had deliberately distorted the pasture stuck business. He made no apologies for having publicly identified the journalists who dared to jibe at Hitler, a German frontline soldier. As for Stuck, he said, the clergyman had called out Du Hund. You dog, whereupon members of his audience had slowly ushered him out. He blamed the weapons arsenal on agents provocateurs and added that his cow had appealed in writing to Dr. Weiss for police protection after individual members had been attacked by red mobs. Your police president, he lectured Grotesinski, is being praised by the entire press of the international money capital. This proves that it is not the German people, only a clique of international money bags, who had an interest in seeing the German freedom movement banned. If Grotesinski still refused to lift the ban, history would prove him wrong since he did not possess the power to kill an idea. Still smoldering, Goebbels spoke to a provincial Nazi rally in Stuttgart with Hitler on May 7. Seizing the opportunity to accuse Weiss, Zorgibel, and Grotesinski of stage managing the incident with Pastor Stuck, a parson unfrocked for morals offenses. Point four on his arrival back in Berlin, his fans rioted at the Anhalter station, and he was taken off for questioning. Point five he hired a lawyer and appealed, using the Gauss headed notepaper, Zorgibel silkily advised him to refrain from using the banned Nazi. Note paper or rubber stamp again. Point six a great silence now overcame the party organization in Berlin. One fact Boyd Goebbels at this dark hour, the knowledge that he would soon found a weekly newspaper of his own in Berlin, Angriff. He announced his plan at a secret meeting in his apartment. But raising the finance was not easy. Point seven Gregor Strasser was furious at the plan and tackled Hitler at his favorite Munich restaurant about rumors that he had agreed to write a regular leading article. Hitler assured him the rumors were not true. Point eight Goebbels had no time for the Strassers since their newspapers had lampooned him and his club foot. A homeopath, Dr. Steintel, had told him in a Berlin pub how the Strasser brothers, especially Otto, had plotted to ruin the Gau lighter by highlighting his racial defect. There was enough circumstantial detail to make it seem plausible. When Steintel asked the truth about the club foot, Goebbels declared that he had had an accident as a teenager, which ruled out the racially otherwise permissible inference. Armed with this new information Goebbels dictated a furious letter to Hitler, neither Jews nor Marxists had, he said, stooped so low to get at him. He has to be destroyed, the Strassers seemed to have said, because he is inconvenient for Kampf Verlag, a private enterprise. Hinting at resignation, he warned Hitler that he would never succeed without eradicating personalities like these. Point nine. When Hitler, in a quandary, did not reply, Goebbels nagged Hess, Hitler's secretary, to issue a statement backing him. At a private meeting of the Berlin Gau's officers on June 10, attended by Steintel, he asked for a vote of confidence. He pointed out that Eric Cook, a humble railroad official, could not possibly have authored such a venomously clever article, The Club Foot he again insisted, was not congenital but the consequence of a teenage mishap. The split widened, as Goebbels stepped up the pressure on his rivals. When Gregor Strasser spoke in Berlin he had a member of the audience ask about his lucrative pharmaceutical practice and fat Reichstag paycheck. By mid-June the bickering was so bad that Emil Holtz, the Gauss legal arbitrator, appealed to Hitler to settle it in person. Holtz sided with the Strassers, while conceding that Goebbels had succeeded in spurring the Berliners on. He has made the movement famous, he told Hitler. But he lacks inner stability and attention to detail. 13 Since Goebbels was calling on his members to buy only Angriff it was now due to appear on July 4 Holtz feared irreparable damage to Strasser's publications, which was just what Goebbels desired. Nobody, Holtz pointed out, could tell how long Angriff would survive. Goebbels hurried off to see Hitler in Munich. He wanted both Strassers evicted from the Nazi party. The party's chief arbitrator ruled that the Führer would settle the whole matter at some major Berlin function later on. While still in Munich on the evening of June 20, Goebbels addressed 450 people on his first six months as Berlin's Gau Leiter and the ban. He claimed to have added 600 new members during April. Let the gentlemen in Berlin, he added 
take note that the time will come when the National Socialists will pay them back in the same coin and with interest. Nothing will be forgotten 15 The fight against Isidore Weiss went on. He who has the police headquarters in Berlin has Prussia, Goebbels would pronounce. He who has Prussia, has the Reich 16 justifying his rowdy methods in a speech on July 10 at Potsdam, just outside Weiss's fief, he said, a movement which means to smash the old state cannot march in bedroom slippers. We may not have won the affections of this city of four million, but we have earned its hatred, and hatred can turn to affection 17 even more seditious in police eyes was Goebbels' now widely disseminated 15-page brochure The Nazi which clearly spoke of plans to overthrow the state. History, he had written, has seen repeatedly how a young, determined minority has overthrown the rule of a corrupt and rotten majority, and then used for a time the state and its means of power in order to bring about by dictatorship and force the conditions necessary to complete the conquest and to impose new ideas. So too, wrote Goebbels, it would be with the Nazi party. And then we, the responsible minority, will enforce our will upon a flabby, lazy, supine and stupid majority lurking behind which the Jew prosecutes his dark plans. All of this was noted in Dr. Weiss's police files, and more. If the German people do not want to be liberated, Goebbels had written, then we shall act without their consent. Then continued Goebbels we march against this state, we take one last great risk for Germany, from revolutionaries by word we become revolutionaries by deed. 7. Fighting the ugly dragon then we stage a revolution. The will to power will procure the means to power. The others may have the weapons but we have what they do not, the willingness to use force, and this willingness will procure the weapons that we need. Speaking in Dusseldorf that summer he reiterated, without weapons we'll get nowhere 20 for the moment Goebbels' only weapon was the printed word. During the last days of June 1927 he reigned a carefully timed series of blood-red posters on Berlin. The first read simply, Attack. The second, Attack is coming. The third, The attack will come on July 4. To edit Angriff he had picked Dr. Julius Lippert, Lippert was imprisoned shortly before the first issue, and Dagobert Durr, a former meteorologist, stood in for him. But the first edition squibbed. The badly designed, anemic sheet sold only 1,200 copies, the next only 900. With the newspaper losing money and morale, several of his staff walked out. Goebbels was no quitter. His street salesmen adopted ruthless tactics. Angriff's circulation staggered upward to around 2,000. Its style was soapbox oratory in print. With a Jesuit's sure instinct for the niceties of the law he defamed without libeling, his pen dipped, thrust, parried, then dipped again. It was more anti-capitalist than Hitler approved of, but the Berlin working classes lapped up the subtle anti-Semitism of Mjolnir's caricatures. Goebbels contributed a venomous diary column and a weekly leading article ripe with lush verbal raspberries about the reader rabble of the gutter press. The newspaper would develop a sarcastic, irreverent, scurrilous, mocking style of its own, not unlike the satirical news sheets of later decades, written partly in a well-captured Berlin dialect, its humor was a mixture of sophomoric poetry, puns, innuendos, and insider jokes for the entertainment of a very few. The chief butt of its humor was of course the unfortunate Dr. Bernhard Weiss, the self-important, horseback riding, bespectacled Jewish ex-cavalry officer. Each week Angriff carried a regular column mocking the police force, entitled Watch That Truncheon. The paper's pages were strewn with puns on the name Weiss, with both blatant and surreptitious anti-Semitism, with unflattering comments on the deputy chief's riding and driving skills and on the shape of his nose and with assertions that of course his real name was Bernhardt was it not illegal now to suggest anything else, 21 soon it was enough for Goebbels to paint a word picture of him, motoring in a princely limousine down Kerfurst and Dam, for every reader to know who was meant. He seized upon his opponent's more cherished slogans. If enemies called him a bandit, his next posters announced him as the Archbandit of Berlin. A politician of the Weimar Republic had spoken of providing Germans with a life of beauty and dignity. Goebbels rode that phrase into the ground over the next six years. 
he began an article on the mounting suicide rate with the ironic comment, the following were unable to endure any longer the happiness of this life of beauty and dignity. He recognized that the target must always be an identifiable individual, like Isidore, rather than an idea or group. Humorless, dedicated, and self-important, Dr. Weiss made the perfect butt. Goebbels used that Isidore with such a thudding regularity that all Berlin came to assume it was Weiss's real name, as did some of his own officers, whom he then also prosecuted. Weiss had enjoyed a high profile until Goebbels' debut in Berlin, the papers carried many pictures of this diminutive, self-important official at public functions sporting a silk hat, tailcoat and striped pants. Mounting a campaign brilliantly designed to undermine his authority, Goebbels published no fewer than six leader articles about him. In every issue of Angriff until No there was an attack on Weiss, its cartoons depicted him as a flat-foot Jew with bow legs, thick-lensed pince-nez, mustache, and jug ears. Undaunted by the laws of libel Goebbels accused Weiss in effect of being a Jew and trying to conceal it. When Weiss sued, again and again, the courts decided that Isidore alone was not libelous. The Supreme Court in Leipzig found with Goebbels that to call a Jew a Jew was no more defamatory than to call a Catholic a Catholic. At the end of the third week in August 1927 the Nazis staged their third national rally, this time in Nuremberg. 100,000 people poured into the city, with unemployment rising, curiosity about Hitler's party was increasing. Berlin's forbidden SA turned out in force, eager to wear their uniforms, 50 of them had marched all the way to Nuremberg and Goebbels sent hundreds more in chartered trains. On their return Isidore Weiss ordered the train stopped at Teltow and his police arrested 435 Nazis. They were detained in police cells all day and 70 lost their jobs in consequence, Goebbels did not care, because martyrs were more useful to his go. As Schweitzer's banners for the Nuremberg rally had said, ours is the future. In northern Germany, in Hamburg and Brunswick, the National Socialists were now winning electoral seats. By the end of the year the party would have 72,590 registered members. Of these however only some 4,000 were in Berlin. Still banned, the Gau was not finding the struggle easy. On October 29, 1927 Goebbels was 30. At a small party his office staff handed him an envelope containing torn-up notes for the loans used to launch Angriff and 2,000 marks in cash, and gave him the news that they had collected 2,500 new subscriptions to the weekly. It was about to break even. In February 1928 it would be selling 31,000 copies each week. Powered by his articles, the newspaper would appear twice weekly from September 30, 1929 and daily from November 1, 1930, increasing its daily circulation from an average 68,600 in 1931 to a peak of 119,000 just after the seizure of power in 1933.7 fighting the ugly dragon on his birthday the Berlin political police lifted the speaking ban on Goebbels, but he was still on probation. The posters announced that he was to speak on Tuesday November 8 in the working-class suburb of Nuckeln on the German people's dance of death. Even without the swastika, Goebbels' hand was unmistakable. Addressed to men of the fist and brow, proletarians of the factory bench and study cubicle, the posters heaped ironic praise on the grandiose achievements of the Social Democrats since 1918. Peace, freedom, work, and bread. All of these social democracy has given to the German working man, plus in large letters a life of beauty and dignity. Tickets were 50 pfennigs, only 10 pfennigs for the unemployed. Thus the battle wagon was rolling again, and on November 6 he had the pleasure of seeing his semi-religious play The Wanderer premiered in a matinee by the National Socialist Experimental Theatre Company 2 at the end of 1927 Dr. Joseph Goebbels, agitator, street fighter, and journalist, received a letter from Cologne, as though from another world, the Catholic charity there was still trying to recover its student loan to him. It had reduced its claim to 400 marks. Goebbels tossed the letter away. Permitted to speak but with his party still banned in Berlin, he was careful to flatter Hitler to people with close ties to Munich. He particularly befriended Rudolf Hess, Hitler's private secretary, 
favored Hess's fiancée else with flowers and wrote to her praising the Führer in the sure knowledge that his words would be passed on. I was with the chief in Nuremberg on Sunday and Monday the 14th and 15th, he wrote to Ilse on November 16th. What a guy he is! I could almost envy you for being around him the whole time. We can all be downright proud of him. Now, he continued, I have barricaded myself back into this omnibus-ridden asphalt desert. Meanwhile we're back in combat with this magnificent ugly dragon, Berlin. We're at each other's throats again and that's why things are looking up again. Thank God, they've started cursing at us again 30 these Goebbels methods worked. The propaganda he explained in a speech which produces the desired results is good, and all other propaganda is bad. Therefore it is meaningless to say your propaganda is too crude, too cruel, too brutal, or too unfair, for none of those terms matter. Propaganda is always a means to an end. It is an art which can be taught to the average person like playing the violin. But there comes a point when you say, you're on your own now. What remains to be learned can only be accomplished by a genius. If people say, but you are only propagandists, then you should answer, and what else was Jesus Christ? Did he not make propaganda, dot is Mussolini a scribbler or is he a great speaker? When Lenin went from Zurich to St. Petersburg did he rush from the station into his study to write a book or did he speak before a multitude? By early 1928 Hitler confided in him intimately. In January he told Goebbels he was planning shortly to meet Benito 31, evidently nothing came of it. In February he promised Goebbels that if the Nazis secured enough seats in the forthcoming Prussian election, Goebbels would be their bloc leader, and that he would also be a Reichstag candidate like Gregor Strasser. A month later Hitler dangled the latter promise over him anew. The chief, Goebbels recorded smugly, used very bitter language about drive Otto Strasser. Strasser had founded a newspaper in Essen competing with the local Gau lighters. Now they all see how right I was in my fight against this loathsome swine, wrote Goebbels, he would take pleasure in helping the Gau lighter, Joseph Turboven, to smash this Strasser brother. That's what you get for heaping filth on me month after month, he remarked in his unpublished diary. Revenge is a repast best savored cold, it was to become one of his favorite aphorisms. His speeches were now one of Berlin's top attractions. Goebbels spoke on March 23 in the Swiss Gardens at Friedrichshain, the political police solemnly reported, opening yet another dossier. Poked fun at Mr. Polizavazi President Weiss 34 Weiss had 21,000 officials, 14,000 uniformed police, 3,000 detectives, and 4,000 full-blown civil servants, there were 47,000 photos and half a million fingerprints in his rogues gallery, his museum even had the original uniform of the captain of Kopenick. Yet he could not keep down this poisonous dwarf limping at the head of his Nazis in Berlin. Indeed, in March Goebbels sent off to the printers his 168-page Lampoon of Weiss, the book of Isidore, subtitled A Portrait of Our Times packed with laughter and hate 36 the entertaining public face-off between the pompous police chief and the propagandist continued throughout the year. One beer hall battle on February 23 ended with Goebbels driver Tonak again injured on this occasion, stabbed three times in the back dangerously close to the heart. Those were hectic weeks. The next morning Goebbels was arrested at 6 a.m. That evening he was heading for Cottbus with his S.A. lads. On March 12 he wrote to the courts asking to be excused from testifying in the trial of Nazis involved in the gun battle at Lichterfeld station. But the political police would not brook any delays, and he had to testify. He is in fact the leading personality, they pointed out, in the fight against the police headquarters 41 six of his men involved in the gun battle were sentenced to a total of three years and seven months in prison. On March 24 he was back in court. Today I have six hearings, he recorded. Four were for slandering Isidore, one for high treason, and one for causing bodily harm. The courts fixed April 28 for the case against Goebbels and Durr for libeling Dr. Weiss in Angriff. Goebbels did his damnedest to wriggle off the hook, filing several applications for postponements. Weiss's deputy Wundes, head of the Berlin political police, demanded that Goebbels be arrested if he failed to show up 
as they fully expected him to keep spinning things out until he won immunity in the forthcoming election. Midday 7, fighting the ugly dragon on the 28th found the Gao Leiter duly in court with his editor Durr. Before German judges, he seated in his diary. A ridiculous farce. Prosecutor demanded two months for Durr and myself. The sentence was three weeks. I just kept silent, he added. Once I'm immune I will accept full blame to spare Durr. 45 The judgment concluded that the newspaper had published wicked and deliberate libels on the worthy Dr. Weiss, by calling him Isidore and publishing the comment, How dare you kick me with your flat little feet they were underlining Dr. Weiss's Jewish origins. Revenge in this case was both sweet and cold. In May he received the printer's proofs of Isidore Dottis for the cartoon of the donkey with all four legs splayed on the ice, Goebbels allowed Angriff to publish it again with this solemn caption, in convicting our editor Der the judge stipulated in Ter Alia, this donkey does bear the face of Vice Police President Dr. Weiss 47 how he hated that man, and how the Nazis and Communists alike laughed when truncheon wielding police officers accidentally thrashed Weiss as well. The brown shirts added a new verse to their marching song on Isidore and Goebbels composed an unsympathetic leader for Angriff about the story of a Jew who didn't want to look like one, who forbade people to call him Isidore because his name was Bernhard Bear's heart, and who in broad daylight was thrashed by his own police officers with their rubber truncheons because they couldn't believe they could possibly have a chief who looked like that. The result was yet another prosecution for libeling the humorless Dr. Weiss. The Reichstag dissolved in March 1928. On the last day of the month Dr. Weiss lifted the ban on the Nazis, because the elections would be held in May. Goebbels formally relaunched the party in Berlin at a ceremony on April 13, then sent long columns of brown shirts to march defiantly through the streets again. We marched, wrote one of his SA men, and we marched. We marched although people bombarded us with every conceivable projectile and missile 51 The five weeks of electioneering were crippled by lack of funds. Goebbels sat in street cafes with his artist Schweitzer, suggesting poster themes. In the evenings he patrolled the section headquarters at Alexander Platz, Tempelhof, Friedenau, and elsewhere. Experimenting with propaganda techniques, he dictated one speech onto phonograph discs. He spent his spare time tinkering with Michael, inserting new vitriolic lines attacking the Jews, and Bloodseed. May Day found him in a grubby Polish international train heading for Dusseldorf, sitting in the audience there he glimpsed his mother, brothers, and little sister Maria, he only rarely saw them nowadays. On May 17 he hobbled at the head of 250 SA men marching through Spandau and Tegel and into working class wedding. Heedless of the screeches and whistles of their baffled enemies chinstraps tightened, he recorded proudly afterwards, with these lads will conquer the world 56 in the final weeks before the election he detected signs of unrest among these lads. Munich had appointed Walter Stennis, a former police captain aged 33, to command the SA in this part of Germany, a regular chap. Goebbels had written in February, and a splendid fellow in April but he was soon keeping Stennis at a distance. He was independently wealthy, and had only joined the party in December when Goebbels insisted. Stennis had found in the Berlin SA an undisciplined rabble which goaded the police to no real purpose. He had introduced Prussian discipline, and now he began asking for a larger slice of the cake more Reichstag candidates should be from the SA. To Goebbels it was the old story, of soldiers meddling in politics. The military should sharpen the sword, he decided, and leave it to us politicians to decide when it has to be used. 59 That he was now fighting with the ballot box rather than by revolution seemed a total betrayal of his own teachings. It was expediency. Besides, he intended to raid the Reichstag as the arsenal of democracy and seize its weapons. If, he wrote, we succeed in planting in the Reichstag 60 or 70 of our own agitators and organizers, then the state itself will equip and pay for our fighting machine it was streaming with rain as Germany went to the polls on May 20. Nationwide, the Nazi party had finished 10th in 1924, it now did rather better, though its share of the vote in Berlin was still unimpressive, only 1-5%. Over 800,000 voted for the Hitler movement, but only 13,000 Berliners. 
the party increased its representation in the Reichstag from 7 to 12. Goebbels heard the results at a gem-packed election bash at the Victoria Gardens. They shouldered him around the hall with whoops of triumph. He would now be a Reichstag deputy, the other eleven lucky Nazis would include Gregor Strasser, Wilhelm Frick, and Hermann Göring. As the spectre of prison faded, he wrote cynically in Angriff, I am an IDI and an I.D.F, in Haber der Immunität and in Haber der Freie Fahrkarte, possessed of immunity and a free travel pass. The I.D.I, he continued, can call a dung heap a dung heap. He doesn't have to mince his language by calling it a state. And he added, this is but a prelude. You're going to have a lot of fun with us. It's showtime. 8. Anka is to blame 8. Anka is to blame there were disadvantages in having such a high profile. On June 19, 1928 the Catholic Charity again wrote to Goebbels from Cologne, suggesting now that he pay off his 10-year-old debt at 50 marks per month. Their letter was returned endorsed delivery refused. He had resumed the feud with Dr. Weiss at once, do you believe that Isidore is behaving himself, his newspaper headlined. Yes, indeed, Isidore, Goebbels repeated. I'll defy the ban. Under the cowardly protection of immunity I'll name names. Isidore. The O must be long drawn out, and the R rolled until this name reverberates with inexpressible sweetness and power. The gift of the East. One try as he could, Dr. Weiss could not nail him. His prey always dodged in time. More items were clipped into the police dossier, Munich police were charging Goebbels with illegal fundraising, Berlin police heard him announce on May 13, the present state is a dunghill and the police president a Jew, an action was pending for incitement to class war, and there were countless breaches of press regulations. Point two, the court hearing of the Pastor Stuck case in June lasted all day. Goebbels spoke for two hours, the six-week sentence was reduced to a fine of 600 marks. A Jew, Lowenstein, sat on the judge's bench, he observed, otherwise we should probably have got off scot-free. Not a penny shall I pay anyway. Three he continued to run rings round the courts, his supporters packing the public galleries hooted and jeered as he and his lawyers made monkeys out of police witnesses, prosecutors, and the bench point for the fines were derisory. 200 marks or 20 days, he recorded, for libeling I.A. Weiss's political police. Point five. he received his free travel pass. Let my voyaging now commence, he wrote, at the Republic's expense, 6. The new Reichstag opened on June 13. The twelve Nazis marched in wearing uniform. Meeting afterward, the Nazi bloc assigned to him the portfolios of culture and internal affairs. Point seven, the Strassers blamed him in their publications for the party's poor showing in Berlin. Point eight, he sensed Gregor's hostility, but decided he could live with it. They were equals now. As he limped down the steps there was a ripple of applause that he recorded for posterity in his diary. After a month the Reichstag, under joint pressure from its communist and Nazi members, approved an amnesty for all political crimes committed before 1928. Dr. Weiss saw his tormentor's slate suddenly wiped all but clean. A year later Berlin police headquarters would endorse his file, all judgments and outstanding cases against Dr. Goebbels sick have been quashed or annulled on the basis of the law of amnesty passed on July 14, 1928. Late in June 1928 he transferred the Gau headquarters to No Berliner Strasse in Charlottenburg 14 newly furnished rooms on one floor, not bad going for 18 months, he reflected. Point nine. His health, never robust, had suffered in the election campaign. He now felt perpetually tired overshadowing the head and backaches, which he attributed to nervous problems, was the permanent agony of his steel-encased lame leg chronic pains and unpleasantness, he would write that autumn, before a phrase which suggests he was beginning to doubt his own sexuality, plus the malicious gossip that I'm a homosexual eleven such gossip was inevitable. Here he was, a young man of thirty, of brains, courage and notoriety, and yet, a bachelor. Seeking company he was as likely to pick Tonak or Schweitzer for a walk a do around the park at Wannsee or a visit to the lofty new radio tower as to scoop up two or three of his female staff for a stroll in Potsdam. I am sick in mind and body, he would confess. 
Since doctors found nothing wrong, he resorted to that most German of remedies, a cure, that did help him, or so he imagined, which was what mattered. His club foot never ceased hurting for weeks on end now, he would write early in 1929. Sometimes it just blights my whole day 15 His worries had been magnified by the onset of his father's last illness in the late spring of 1928. Laden with filial remorse Joseph Goebbels visited the paternal home as often as he could, sat silently watching the grey-bearded old man, wept as he felt the thin, bony fingers, and romanticized each farewell wave in his diary in case it was the last. In July 1928 Adolf Hitler came to Berlin. Goebbels wrote that he was fond of him as a son is of his father, and staged a huge private meeting for him at Friedrichshain. Although it was the summer silly season, wrote young Horst Wessel admiringly, the hall was packed out. Who else could do that in high summer? New members flooded in after Hitler's speech. Before Hitler left, Goebbels vented his anger about Dr. Otto Strasser, and the Führer waffled reassuringly about winding up the Strasser's publishing house in Berlin. He mentioned that he and his half-sister Angela Robel would be taking a trip to the island of Heligoland with Angela's daughter Julie would Dr. Goebbels like to join them? Knowing Julie already, Goebbels jumped at the chance. He has met Julie Robel, Hitler's barely 19-year-old niece, in Munich four months before. Unaware of the nearly 40-year-old Hitler's proprietary interest in her, he has hatched plans to bring her to Berlin. He is still pining for Enke Stahlherm. But married to the humdrum George VIII, Anka is to blame mum she lives in Weimar and he has not seen her for years. I must have a good, beautiful woman, he writes in his unpublished diary at the start of 1928. Goring has come back from Sweden married to a beautiful Swedish countess, Hess is marrying his ilts. His CRI de Kerr seems answered by a teenaged girl working at headquarters, a girl of, he writes, almost Asiatic submissiveness. I love Tamara von Heed, he records. Wonder if she loves me. Hardly. That's how it always is, what you get, you don't want, and what you want, you don't get. 21 Tamara puzzles the naive and sexually innocent Gao Leiter by being off color at monthly intervals. One evening canoodling with him in the park, she freezes him with a thoughtless remark, perhaps about his foot. She makes up the next day with a basket of fruit and other delights. Their friendship causes the usual tensions at headquarters. Meanwhile Anka abruptly returns to his life, there she is, standing in the doorway of the hotel foyer at Weimar after a renewed staging of his play The Wanderer. By his own account Goebbels trembles and stammers with joy at seeing his long-lost love. For half an hour Anka pours out her heart about her joyless marriage, Mum has concealed from her until after the marriage that he is infertile from syphilis. Her four-month-old son Christian is by another man. Goebbels is under her spell again, it is as though they never parted. Oh, Lamor, his pen exclaims after he has lain awake all night. I am like a child. 25 Tamara is disconsolate that Anka has surfaced again from his past, nevertheless he phones Anka from Berlin and they agree to meet again. A few days later she phones him twice, weeping, in the middle of the night saying she wants to come to Berlin, divorcing mum, he suggests, is her only escape. She arrives at his apartment but receives only coffee and sympathy as she rehearses her entire tragic life once more for him. I have kissed her, he writes afterward, and a lucky star has crossed from her to me. After Enka departs, Tamara phones. Poor Tamara, he writes, and, poor Enka and many a reader of his diary will agree. He spends another day with his goddess in Weimar soon after. I love her, she loves me, neither of us says it but we both know it. 28 at Easter however there is an awkward scene when her husband shows up. Goebbels capitulates. I'm off. Curtly informally took leave of them both. I'm shutting off my heart. For good. Great tasks wait upon me. Before me stands a nation. Germany. 29 A few days later, great task or no, he phones her Weimar number. Dr. Mum answers and Dr. Goebbels hangs up. God only helps those, he writes on a bouquet of flowers for her, who help themselves. Farewell. 
Ulex 30 he is not blind to the rest of the fairer sex. There is Adora, a hysterical lover who puts a letter through his door threatening to poison herself, doesn't know me too good, he comments callously. I've already yielded far too much to this hussy. Let her do it if she really must. I can't say anything but no. Since I have set eyes again on Anka, he sighs, justifying his sexual inactivity, all female beauty pales 32 it is therefore no surprise to see him shortly alighting from a train at Weimar on the way home from Wiesbaden, embracing Anka on the platform and sharing a compartment for a few minutes until the next halt at Weissenfels. An icy hand may well have clutched at his heart as she chatters away, because she now hints at leaving mum for Goebbels in Berlin. The ardent suitor takes refuge in the language of a cheap novel. Farewell, farewell, he writes in the diary. She waves until we are out of sight of each other. 33 He spends the next days in a guilty panic. No word comes from Weimar. Will she really leave her George? And what then? Dr. Goebbels appraises the alternatives, there is a pretty Miss Bohm at Schweinfurt, there is Willie Hess's little sister, a darling thing, unfortunately not good-looking, he will find the same trouble with a Miss Betk on Borkum Island too. Pity she's not prettier. 35 he has to speak at Weimar late in May, and diffidently phones the mum household. A voice tells him that Madame is away. Back in Berlin the next day he bumps into Dora, who has not poisoned herself after all, few girls do nowadays. Anka is to blame for all this, he writes helplessly. She's brought me to the point where women are just playthings. The revenge of a creature spurned 37 she is soon forgotten in Berlin. He is overhauling his cow, appointing Reinhold Mucho his chief of organization on July 1, 1928. He has resumed work on Michael, rewriting, dictating, proofreading, and mailing it for Franz Eder Verlag to publish that autumn. He goes on a chaotic cow outing down Brandenburg's waterways, a wasted day were it not for one beautiful girl. Without a word, he romanticizes again, we are in love. Neither of us betrays this by the slightest sign, but it is so 39 chemicals are brewing within the crippled, now 30-year-old Dr. Joseph Goebbels which he still does not care to test. I'll go to pot altogether, he fears, if I can't get together with women. They are out there, besieging him, but he is searching for a woman that he does not know. Two days later at Bayreuth, as the curtain goes up on the last act of Tristan he finds a stunning beauty next to him. We partake of a little feast of love, without a word between us just two glances, two sighs. And then she's gone. The whole evening I am at my wits end 40 matrimony is claiming all his friends. Even Karl Heinz Kalsch, Pill, his closest friend and rival from those Freiburg days, gets married this August. Tipsy and reeking of liquor he throws his arms around the little gal lighter and kisses him, Goebbels recoils, fearful that they might be seen. Ghastly, he exclaims in his diary. Kalsch always was an asshole. Together they pen a postcard to Anka at Weimar. So it goes on, his roving eye feasts on every female, spinster or spoken for, and ravishes or rejects them all the arrestingly beautiful wife of Dr. Robert Lay, and a pompous editor's wife with whom he falls deeply in love for, probably, hours at a time. Each time his train passes through Weimar he peers out, hoping for a glimpse of Anka. In September the chase is suddenly on again. This time, his quarry is young Hannah Schneider, a true Germanic beauty from Mecklenburg. She is a eight, Anka is to blame member of the party's women's order. After a hard day's work at his desk, Goebbels begins to look forward to negotiations with the order which he previously hated. He adores Hannah's natural childishness, she is in her late teens. She is pretty and clever, and another virgin. It is surely interesting that he writes of her as this glisteningly clean maiden 44 Let no careless biographer maintain that he has advanced far with the fairer sex even now, strolling in the tear garden after taking her to her first movie, he steals a chaste kiss from Hannah. She blushed like a child when I kissed her neck, he writes, rejoicing in his adventure. He delights in her innocent chatter and writes more than once approvingly of her Jungfräulichkeit, her virginity. But he is aware of her limitations. 
he needs a more mature woman, while Hannah is a totally innocent child. A little bombshell comes from Weimar. Anka writes that she is indeed divorcing mum and coming to work in Berlin. Goebbels reflects how much women have hurt him, and how much they have hurt for him too. Is this to be a new tragedy, he wonders, in which I am to be cast in the leading role? He tells little Hannah none of this. He writes cautiously back to Anka, perhaps they might meet on Tuesday October 2nd in Weimar? The next day, speaking at Haas and Heidi, he cites Hannah sitting reverently as though in a church pew, smiling with childlike attentiveness. A telegram comes from Anka, yes, Tuesday. In Weimar, they sit up late together. She tells him that she is now in two minds again. Meanwhile, should she come to Berlin for a month or two? That might well be ticklish, senses Goebbels in his diary. Hannah falls silent. She loves me, she loves me not, wonders Goebbels. I'm damned if I can tell. 48 Shortly a letter comes, spelling out the answer, she does not. Goebbels limps around baffled, groping for an explanation. Okay. So I shall have to stay lonely. To be famous or to be loved? That is the question. 49 On October 12, Hannah reappears at Gao headquarters. Suddenly the hour is filled with lustrous happiness, writes Goebbels, extracting much pathos from a scene which must have cruelly punctured his male vanity. I kiss her squarely on her full red lips. And then she confesses to me that she loves another. She only came to me because I was so lonely. A terrible discovery. From a thousand heavens I plummet to the depths of a thousand hells. Fifty innocently twisting her teenaged knife, Hannah writes asking if she can be a good sister to him instead. Always the same, fulminates Goebbels hopefully. First these women just want to be your sister. Then whoopee, it's mistress after all. Unhappy love, he summarizes tersely on October 17, 1928, there can be no such thing for a man with a mission 51 9. Conjuring up spirits there was a side to Dr. Goebbels which few suspected. He half believed in the occult. At the very end of his life he would have horoscopes cast for himself, for Hitler, and for the Third Reich, scattered through the earlier diaries or references to seances at which dark forces were consulted. On leave in Bavaria in 1928 he was to be found conjuring up the spirit of Leo Schlageter. The great martyr of the Ruhr resistance appeared and, when asked who shall save Germany, replied with a tact that was commendable under the circumstances, vest your hopes only in Hitler. One in 1929 Goebbels and his friends again conjured up the spirits. I don't really believe in such frauds, he noted airily, but it's usually quite amusing. Two visiting Princess Weed in August 1930 he found an astrologer there who conjured forth from the stars precisely what we would expect to happen anyway. Goebbels' own apparent cynicism was belied however by the diary passage that followed. Awi Prince August Wilhelm is very skeptical, but I am flabbergasted three he unquestioningly accepted the mystic powers of graphology. He allowed the party lawyer Ludwig Weissauer to read his hand, Weissauer told him that it betrayed sensitivity and a determination to fight on. Weissauer found one line to be flawed. That, guessed Goebbels, must be Anka. Since losing her he had had nothing but a sense of loneliness. Point four aided by young Horst Wessel, he had spent the summer of 1928 organizing a Hitler Youth Detachment and a Nazi Student Association in Berlin. But those months saw the first problems with the brown shirt SA battalions of party stormtroopers. They had believed his earlier talk of revolution, but with Hitler's newfound belief in the legal approach to power they saw the day when they might storm the Reichstag receding. Friction with their commander Captain Stennis grew. Point five Goebbels was in two minds. Unlike Hitler, he never wholly abandoned the idea of a putsch. He spent much of the summer organizing an SA march on Berlin, to culminate in a mass rally in Berlin's largest hall. It would be a show of power. In mid-August Stennis threatened to quit, taking several of his commanders with him. Point six Goebbels told him of the planned rally. We can do without a crisis at this moment he notified his diary. We must keep the peace. I convinced Stennis, against my own convictions seven at the party's nine, 
Conjuring up Spirit's annual general meeting in Munich at the end of August Hitler directed him to concentrate his efforts now on Berlin, while Brandenburg would be detached to form a separate Gau.8 Hitherto Goebbels had merely reacted to political events. Now he seized the political initiative. He proclaimed the last week of September 1928 Das Week, seven days of intense campaigning in Berlin against the pact obliging Germany to pay her war reparations bill regardless of her economic plight. He printed a special issue of Angriff, which sold 60,000 copies. Point nine growing bolder, he risked hiring for the first time the Sport Palace in Potsdamer Strasse for the third Brandenburg Rally, Markertag, to fill the cavernous building, which could seat 15,000 people. He placarded the city with lurid posters announcing, On Saturday, September 30, Adolf Hitler's brown shirts will march into Berlin. Ten that day, he drove out to Teltow to watch his brown army assemble. 4,000 SA men marched into the capital. At Steglitz Town Hall the immense throng, which Goebbels put at tens of thousands, paused, bared their heads, and roared the national anthem before marching on through the city's frightened, wealthy West End to the Sport Palace building. With thousands of communists massing threateningly outside, a riot began and the police opened fire. Four Nazis were seriously injured. Goebbels left under a barrage of rocks, jeers, and catcalls hatred and love, he philosophized. The next day's non-Jewish press was largely sympathetic, the rest less so. A day of triumph, he concluded in his diary, he had Anka sending him telegrams from Weimar, he had young Hannah, he had 15,000 Berliners hanging on his every word. A letter of congratulations came from Hitler. A few days later the Führer appeared unannounced at Gau headquarters in Berliner Strasse and repeated his congratulations in person. He reiterated that Goebbels alone had his confidence in Berlin, and he spoke harshly about Dr. Otto Strasser. The Gau leiter could now afford to give his staff, over 20 strong, a substantial pay rise. Deciding to move into larger lodgings, he finds just what he needs in Wurtemergisk Strasse in West Berlin closer to Gao headquarters. His landlady is a Miss Groth, an elderly spinster, as he is careful to record. The apartment has a pleasant drawing room. He feels entitled to some luxury I have not else, neither wife nor child, and only seldom a lover. He uses the word Gillet, although girlfriend would seem more justified. Most are passing fancies, like one Eva Otto she donates a piano to the new apartment. On October 31, 1928, the day before he moves in, his secretary circulates the new address, requesting it be kept secret for obvious reasons. A copy goes to Anka. He is still terrified of any hint of homosexuality, a criminal perversion that seems particularly prevalent in the Nazi party. Unable to form lasting relationships with women, he loiters in cafes or haunts movie theaters with his chauffeur Tonak or cartoonist Schweitzer, his only friends. After major events he returns to his empty apartment and mopes. He needs a woman, as a starter motor, but the malicious gossip will not go away. It's too filthy even to think about without being ashamed, he insists to his diary the day after moving into his new bachelor apartment. Decay. Decay. It must be expunged. Radically and ruthlessly 18 his reasoning is odd, however because if the enemy ever learns something like that, we shall be finished. Is homosexuality for Goebbels, this immoral vice, a crime in the detection rather than in the commission? It's got to be stamped out radically, he writes on November 4. It's all so dirty again, an interesting choice of word it's all so dirty that it would preferable not to hear or see it at all. Several of his officials are unmasked as homosexuals, and Goebbels does not know whom to trust. It's so alien to my own nature, he writes, that I can't work up for them even the vestigial sympathy that I do for any common murderer. Twenty over the next months Goebbels, now 31, tries relationships with half a dozen teenage girls but his eye soon roves on. Talking with Joseph Turboven his eye lights upon the Essengau lighters attractive, but unfortunately rather aging sister. When Hitler visits Berlin with niece Julie Robel in mid-November, Goebbels again finds her almost lovable but wisely smites from his mind the horrendous idea of cuckolding the Führer. He visits the party's women's order, 
despite their Herod and Elsbeth Zander, and spends an evening watching the healthy young girls dance and sing, surely a sign that he is desperate for female company. In 1928 alone he spoke at 188 meetings. He seemed not to know fear. On November 3 that year he led the SA into one of Berlin's reddest suburbs. A lot of blood will flow, he accepted. But I shall be with them 23 his book of Isidore had sold out and was reprinting. Dr. Weiss unsuccessfully canvassed his prosecution for felonious remarks about the Rathena murder. When the Reichstag reconvened in November there were immediate moves to strip Goebbels of his immunity. He hated the rotten parliamentary system, he behaved outrageously during the debates, and attracted several reprimands. The ban on Hitler speaking publicly in Prussia had been lifted. On November 16 Goebbels presented him with an overflowing sport palace, martial music and the ceremonial entry of Berlin's Nazi standards as a visible sign of the party's growing might. As Hitler spoke, 800 police protected the hall and its audience. The two men sat far into the night with Hess, Goebbels could not help noticing that Adolf now had his jolly, and Hess his ills, while he was still alone. The next day the body of Hans George Kudemeyer, a sheriffer in no Sturm of the Berlin SA, was fished out of the Landwehr Canal. What Goebbels called the Juden press scoffed that Kudemeyer had killed himself, and there was report of a morose letter to his wife about their poverty. Goebbels was not going to lose his first major martyr that easily, never have liars stooped so low, he wrote a eulogy in Angriff and began a noisy propaganda campaign. 9. Conjuring up spirits the party buried Kudemeyer with full honors on November 21. Thousands gathered at the graveside. Marxists. Goebbels street placards challenged. Why did you murder the worker Kudemeyer? 28 The police hefted into their Goebbels dossier a note that he had propagated untrue statements on the case. But the SA man's two killers were caught and given suspended sentences of two and four months for manslaughter in June 1929. Three Jews as judges, observed Dr. Goebbels, and vowed hatred, vengeance and retribution against the system. As the appointed Minister of Culture of the Little National Socialist faction he went more often to the theater and the movies, which were still silent. He took Schweitzer to a love movie, only to walk out before the end, but he found the romantic scenes in Anna Karenina a delight. Once he went to an all-Negro review, he sniffed at their silly do dying and dancing and was annoyed when the public roared applause. He found Buster Keaton unfunny and incomprehensible. After seeing his first Hollywood movie, again with Schweitzer, he recorded, Sheer Hell. Jewish Kitsch. Virtually all you saw were Hebrews 32 The dominance of the Jews in this relatively new industry did not elude him. They were everywhere. He heard often box opera The Tales of Hoffman on the radio and dismissed it in his diary as Jewish music. The Jewish question, he added intensely, is the question of all questions. 34 His enthusiasm for the Russian cinema, like much else from Moscow, was undeniable. He viewed Soviet movie director Sergei Eisenstein's silent epic Ten Days That Shook the World, and found its crowd scenes good but overburdened with party politics. We have a lot to learn from the Bolsheviks, he readily conceded, particularly in the fields of agitation and propaganda. 35 He was thrilled by any movie accompanied by Russian music. Seeing Eisenstein's famous battleship Potemkin, he rejoiced in this spectacle. The subtitles were so cunningly phrased that they defied contradiction. That is what is really dangerous about this movie, he concluded. I wish we had such a film 37 thus the power of the movie as political propaganda dawned on him. He began to take an interest in the party's own movie production efforts. He supervised the cutting of the movie of his September 1928 rally in the Sport Palace, and helped with a little production called Fight for Berlin His diary shows him driving out to Bernau to direct scenes involving 300 SA men. As the genre got into his blood, he produced a second Nazi movie, with the Berlin SA to Nuremberg. At its premiere, he introduced it with a little homily on cinema as a propaganda weapon. December 1928 finds Joseph Goebbels tired but increasingly fulfilled. He spends hours orating to the Reichstag. He has his own newspaper. He has a piano. 
He has at last perfected his autobiographical drama Michael and is about to rewrite his working class one act drama Bloodseed for the party's Walner Theatre. He will finish it in the Reichstag under the droning voice of some despised Democrat. He sends copies to Ilse Hess and all his other friends but even now Anka's is the only opinion he cares about. On December 9 we locate him, heart thumping, in a train steaming into Weimar's station. He finds her waiting on the platform, and lends her the first proof copy of Michael, in which she is, of course, herself the heroine, to come off the presses. We love each other as though but a day separates 1920 from now, he writes afterwards. She buries her head in my chest and weeps. He misses two trains in his distraction. A letter comes, returning the play, she is enthusiastic about it. She loves me, swoons Goebbels in his notes, and I her 44 I had awaited your letter with trepidation, he replies, asking to see her again. He suggests Hallie on Wednesday, at 1020A.M, or Erfurt, at 11.51. Something about these deliberately brief encounters pleases him, perhaps it is the reassuring knowledge that any demands she makes on him will perforce be limited to the short journey between two stations. I would like to talk things over with you, he writes her alluringly. I have got to do something about rearranging my life, now that I have put much of the past behind me with Michael 45 no sooner has he lit this fresh candle for Enka in his heart than it is snuffed out by the breezy debut of a young Berlin girl on his staff. Yuta Lehman. She claims she's a Tina slender, gracious, rococo little doll who chatters and giggles all afternoon with that infuriating mixture of brightness and inanity that females have long monopolized. She pretends to be engaged to another, but folds into the little Gao lighter's arms nonetheless and allows herself to be kissed before agreeing that she is not engaged at all. So that's Yuta Lehman, he muses, captivated, this spotless, gracious girl 46 he wallows in feelings of spurious guilt, knowing that sooner or later he must sacrifice her too on the altar of his mission. He lies awake, thinking of her tiny hand waving as he drives away, the tears in her eyes when he leaves for his own family fold at Christmas. She is silent on his return and he sees her as a child, a lover, a comrade. He is lucky to possess her, he decides. She's a good listener. She sits as quiet as a mouse just listening 48 one day she comes in floods of tears because she thinks he's leaving, the next the sweet little schemer turns up with a basket of things for his apartment like a coffee machine and silverware, so that he can stay home of an evening. But he realizes that she is pure and must stay that way. By mid-January 1929 he is back, in soul and body, in Weimar with Anka. Her husband mum is now ingratiating and servile to the Gao lighter, Goebbels despises him. She comes on January 19 to his Weimar Hotel and they sit talking until 2.30 a.m. on upturned crates at the railroad station. He decides that Anka loves him. And I, he asks his diary, I love her, uh, quite differently 50 the Nazi party nationwide now numbered over 100,000 members. Its leaders met at Weimar on January 20, 1929 to discuss the coming nine, conjuring up spirits year. Young Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's bespectacled deputy propaganda chief, reported on his efforts to develop their movie and press propaganda. The only decisions that Goebbels recorded in Weimar were that the SA was to be more firmly anchored to the political leadership, and that the party was to adhere henceforth slavishly to the legal paths to power. Take note, Berlin, noted Goebbels. Hitler had every reason to counsel restraint. Confronted with the growing Nazi and communist lawlessness in Prussia, Albert Krutusinski had appealed to the Reich Minister of the Interior, Severing, for a permanent nationwide ban on these parties and their paramilitary formations. The terms imposed on defeated Germany by the Peace Treaty of 1921 provided adequate legal grounds. Goebbels reluctantly bowed to Hitler's dictate. Issue no of Angriff portrayed a communist Red Front Street fighter and his Nazi counterpart, both bandaged and bleeding, shaking hands over the crumpled body of a Jew. The day of realization, Schweitzer's prophetic caricature was captioned, the dawn of the Third Reich 54 since January 5, 1929 his newspaper had 12 pages. 
Meanwhile he methodically built up the infrastructure of the Gao. It helped that he had a brand new limousine, a bright blue open seven-seater Landau built by Opel. Its license tag was IA53398 Goebbels claimed that a German idealist living in Argentina had just donated it to the Gao. The big car gave the crippled Gao lighter power, authority, and mobility. Taking his burly escort with him he used it to tour the sections in red-hot areas like Prenzlauerberg, Friedrichshain, Alexander Platz, and Kreuzberg. Mucho was doing fine work on the factory floor, establishing cells in big plants like Norbreak at Lichterfeld. Too late the Marxists woke up to this danger. Goebbels' schools of speaking and politics were also improving. Once he even let Gregor Strasser address a course. Standards here were often higher than in the Reichstag where, as Goebbels himself put it, listening to long boring speakers was like being a pianist and having to hear some lout grinding away on a magnificent grand piano. Great though his conceit about his own oratory was, Goebbels conceded that Hitler's was better. In fact their styles were different. Hitler's speeches were predictable and repetitious, Goebbels were more analytical, executed with a thrilling elocution and clarity. Albert Krebs later stated that his Nazis in Hamburg often debated which was better, those who opted for Goebbels sometimes indicated that he would make a better party leader too. The two men were in equal demand all over Germany. We lead real gypsy lives, Hitler had commiserated with him a few days after Weimar. On character, however, Goebbels found serious fault with Hitler at this time, a tendency to let things slide. He felt that the Führer should get his other men boning up already on their later duties. My task, he already knew in 1929, is to be propaganda and public enlightenment, 62 only Alfred Rosenberg towered above the beer hall milieu of Hitler's Munich cronies. Back in Berlin after Weimar, Goebbels is subjected to a scene by Tamara. He feels sorry for her, but she has lost the submissive Asian quality he valued before in her. What else is he looking for? It is not sex. Later the sweet chatterbox Yuta Lehmann, still one week shy of 18, turns up and keeps him tempestuous company Sturmis, evidently another diary buzzword until 11 p.m. How Yuta will weep, he notes, almost sadistically, when the time comes for us to part, 63 he is addicted to the company of teenage girls, but prefers them perhaps to bear anything except their intellects. When Kudemeyer's widow turns out to have opinions of her own, he shrieks in his diary, for God's sake let's keep women out of politics 64 in fact, he hates most if not all of the human race except for Yuta and Anka, both of whom know how to mother him. He yearns for Anka, the forbidden passion of his life. On February 25, 1929 he takes a sheet of Reichstag notepaper and tries to set up another tryst, it would be glorious if you could come to Berlin for a few days. On Friday March 8 there is an important and sensational session in the Reichstag, and on Sunday the 10th my new drama Bloodseed is being premiered at the Walner Theater. It's sold out already. He signs off as Ulex, just as in the old days. March 9, 1929. Anka phones. She's coming this afternoon for two days visit. In the afternoon worked at home. Frightful news, communists have stabbed two SA men to death in Schleswig Holstein Hermann Schmidt and Otto Streib. The first storm cones. Blood seed, from which the new Reich shall grow. Anka arrives, looking the picture of a cultured lady. He shows her over the Reichstag, then takes her to a patriotic movie starring the swashbuckling Emil Jannings with a powerful plot about a man giving his life for his people. In the Rheingold bar afterwards she yet again pours out her heart about her unhappy marriage, until 2 a.m. They sit side by side at Sunday's premiere of his play, which events in Schleswig-Holstein have suddenly rendered so topical. Over a meal at Kempinski's he has one unexpected difference with Anka, on the Jewish problem, now it is she who does not grasp it. Privately he reflects on the happiness that might have been. But, he adds, Priggishly distorting history, I had to choose, her, or something greater, my mission. Then, leave taking. Farewell, he writes, slipping effortlessly into the role of scriptwriter again. 
she smiles 67 his private life is becoming more dishonest. While he writes, and his teenaged Yuta cooks for him, he is agonizing over the married Anka returning to her worthless George. A few days later his diary encodes him as gossiping with the gypsy Annalise Hegert, another darling child. Most women are boring, he concludes, particularly the good lookers. But I suppose it's enough that they do look good 68 after he sees Anka again at Weimar on March 19, her husband comes to fetch 9, conjuring up spirits her. It is the first time Goebbels has seen Mum, and she seems ashamed of him. That is her husband, sympathizes Goebbels. Oh, Anka! George Mum civilly invites him to lunch the next day at their little household at No Johann Albrecht Strasse, Goebbels has so often tried to visualize their home. Her baby Christian is a stubborn little boy, seeing the child hurts Goebbels more than he expects. That was some situation you snared me in, he reproaches her in a letter. I felt like a fifth wheel on the wagon. Later he invites her to join the Gauss Easter outing to the Hearts Mountains, the cars at the doctor's, he writes with a levity that belies his nervousness, but will be discharged at the weekend. He adds that she must of course invite her George along too. Pity you can't see from the letter how I stammer out those words 69 Goebbels has the dull but comforting sensation that perhaps he can never marry, because there are so many women that he is fond of March 24, 1929. Afternoon at home. Annalise Hegard is coming round. How am I to meet her? Anka, sweet woman. Evidently he comes clean about Anka because the gypsy leaves in tears. Women, he ruminates, have only one real use as moles planted inside hostile agencies like police headquarters or the League of Human Rights. On the Easter outing Anka arrives wearing a costly leather coat, of the same grey-green hue as her eyes. She has brought George Mum along but pointedly ignores him throughout although he continues to sing the Gao Leiter's praises to her. Goebbels finds him insufferable, Mum gulps down his beer and cracks painfully pointless jokes, but it is George who shares Anka's bed each night and not the Gao Leiter. Thus, writes Goebbels, vengeance exacts a belated, but infinitely crueler, revenge. George utters not a murmur of protest as Goebbels squeezes into the back seat next to Anka and, Goebbels silently asks himself, staring at the husband, why should he? Don't I have a greater right to this woman than you, you ignoramus? In ancient Goslar, George tactfully lets them stroll off together like lovers and he returns that evening reeking of lust and liquor. Goebbels spends another sleepless night elsewhere under the same roof. At daybreak they drive off through the rain, snow and ice. Beneath the warming travel rug Goebbels feels Anka's hand seeking his. Unseen, she slips onto his finger the ring her widowed mother gave her. 10. A rather obstinate gentleman he had the uneasy feeling that he was leading a charmed life. He wrote to Anka that he would actually welcome some setback, preferably a minor one, to help break the spell. I have liquidated everything ugly from the past, he wrote, referring perhaps to Michael and Blood Seed, and can now contemplate the future with greater fortitude when one ugly item from the past still haunted him the Catholic charity in Cologne now instructed lawyers in Berlin to extract from him the 400 marks still unpaid from his student loan 12 years before. The lawyers served a writ point to the court awarded judgment in default on April 6, 1929. A few days later the bailiffs called and glued their traditional paper cuckoo to his radio set, the only item of value in his apartment. Still he did not pay up. We are evidently dealing the lawyers reported to Cologne, with a rather obstinate gentleman. It is to be hoped that this spokesman of the National Socialist Party will fight shy of declaring bankruptcy 3. The charity calmly ordered the lawyers to have him bankrupted. On May 16 the bailiffs removed his beloved radio with his piano, the only instrument he had wherewith to amuse his girlfriends and sent it to be auctioned. Point four when he appealed. The Catholics claimed they acted repressively only when there was evidence of a ruthless attitude on the debtor's part. Not until February 1930 would he make the final payment, closing the ledgers on a rather puzzling episode. True, he had weightier matters on his mind. Sunday morning, he jotted on April 15. We march, right into the communist districts. 
I stand in the thick of the melee and am recognized. Our men march unflinching through the catcalls and whistles of the Reds 5 he was planning ahead for the Nuremberg rally in August and for an open-air rally in Berlin in September as a prelude to the important November municipal elections. Constantly expanding his horizons, on May 10 he launched a National Socialist League of School Children at a jamboree of 1,000 eager girls and boys. Cash was always a problem, however point six he pleaded with Angriff not to court a renewed prohibition. Finding in one issue a blatant libel on their foreign minister Gustav Stresemann, he himself ordered all unsold copies recalled not that he was loath to wound the statesman. This plenipotentiary of German democracy, he called him, somewhat fat, jaundice hued, perspiring, his little tricky eyes bedded carefully in cushions of fat, a smooth, ten, a rather obstinate gentleman rectangular forehead topped by an enormous expanse of bald head, there he stands, in the midst of his beloved Jews seven suddenly there is Xenia. Her name means friendly stranger, she is another teenaged girl, and Goebbels risks a first letter to her just after writing to Anka.8 Xenia von Engelhardt's unexpected visit to Dr. Goebbels is the start of a platonic friendship, which endures almost to the end of his bachelor days. She wangles her way past the sentinels posted on his heart by the usual wiles, pouring out her woes about her unfaithful boyfriend, laughing, blushing, and instinctively gauging his needs. Point nine. Once she stages a scene and turns on her heel, then stalks back and spends a night with him which he describes as Gluck Durchbut, quaking with happiness. By May 4th they have captured each other, each presuming victory. They take in a Greta Garbo movie, Another Divine Woman, sighs Goebbels. After another tiff, Xenia storms off, returns, knocks on his door. He does not open he is reading the Sunday papers and, yet again, Moller van den Bruck's The Third Reich. That afternoon they go for a row, and make up again. And then, records Goebbels, selecting his words carefully, comes a long, blessed night, filled with silence. Xenia is all modesty and sacrifice ten back at his lodgings he finds a letter from the eternal temptress, Anka. She hopes to see him at Weimar. Poor Anka, he notes, but she wants it no other way. When he reaches Weimar Anka realizes that Xenia was coming between them, and bursts into tears. He returns to Berlin early. Here Xenia phones him, fearful on account of Weimar and Anka, as the smug Gau lighter records. Back in Berlin, vacillating between the two women, he writes, I love Xenia a lot, because she is so young and unburyright sexually innocent and all self-sacrifice and goodness. Anka is too scatterbrained 12 a letter comes from Anka with her photograph. He writes back proposing that he return to Weimar on Sunday week. But then we'll probably have to hang around with G all day and can't talk about the things we're interested in. At this instant in his complex epistolic devotions, Xenia arrives. Goebbels concludes his letter to Anka with a hurried evasion, sorry can't write much today. I'm about to fly to Dortmund. But just as he is, in fact, dining at his lodgings with Xenia, the phone rings. A voice announces, Hitler here. Hitler is in Berlin. Unable to conceal his joy, Goebbels dashes off the last line of the letter to Anka, Life is beautiful, O oh Queen. Yours, Ulex, and, abandoning Xenia, he hurries off to Hitler. There is no doubting his order of priorities now. Goebbels sat with Hitler and Hess that night until 2 a.m. Hitler asked if he would take over the Reich's propaganda Leitung, propaganda at national level, traveling down to Munich every fortnight for this duty, with a second home there. Goebbels was uncertain, and Hitler tried to tempt him. After the party rally, the Gauleiter noted, we shall all motor down to Italy for study purposes. I am to get a new Mercedes just for this. The question was left unresolved 14 and in July Hitler again failed to lure Goebbels down to Munich to this end. In Berlin, he felt he was somebody. His essay was growing fast. On May 26, at Frankfurt on Oder, he took the salute at a parade of 2,000 SA men and heard the bands play a stirring new march with words written by Horst Wessel, Die Fani Hodge. Hold the flag high. Later it would become a second national anthem. He itched to use the essay to seize power, 
although Hitler had told him, we must now learn to wait and above all avoid a ban 16 Hitler had good reason to fear a ban. The communists had begun violent disturbances in Berlin, in fighting after they threw up barricades on May Day, nine people were killed and 1,000 arrested. To Goebbels' disappointment Krasinski banned his main opponent, the militant Red Front. In the resulting debate demanded by the communists on June 8 Goebbels spoke for 40 minutes using language that differed little from theirs. The essence of the government's policy must be foreign, not domestic policy. They brandish the palm frond abroad, he scoffed, and the police truncheon at home. They are skulking pacifists abroad, but bloodthirsty militarists at home, determined to choke any nationalist resistance at birth. They sign slave diktats abroad and enact a law for the protection of the republic at home. Recalling that it was Severing who had banned Hitler from speaking, Goebbels mocked, Every Jew, international pacifist, and traitor has the right of free speech but not a German soldier four times wounded on the battlefield, on the pretext that he is a foreigner. The Nazi party had, he recalled, been dissolved in Berlin, although it had erected no barricades. We just tossed a lush out of a public meeting after boxing his ears. The Reichstag itself had annulled Gregor Strasser's immunity because he had dared to call the Republic a moneybags colony. Countless civil servants had been disciplined for joining the National Socialists. Goebbels teasingly added that he had no intention of mentioning the private affairs of the Prussian Minister of the Interior whether or not for instance Mr. Grotesinski travels with his lovely wife to Vienna and it turns out the lady's not his lovely wife at all such things were purely a question of taste. Nor would he dwell upon the fact that their police president had been chief carnival clown of Mainz before the war, don't get me wrong. We're not complaining that he was chief carnival clown. Merely that he still is. As for Dr. Weiss, whom we must not call Isidore, he had now sued Goebbels and his men 28 times for calling him a Jew. So this police chief has himself recognized how demeaning it is to be a Jew, and he considers it a libel to be properly identified by what we would call his religion or what he would call his race. The time will come, he shrilled in his peroration, when it will not be our party which brings this system crashing down, but the people itself. 19 once more that month, June 1929, he addressed the Reichstag, on the suffocating law for the protection of the Republic. After blandly reading out, to loud protests, a letter written by the Jewish mega-swindler Julius Barmet to the former Chancellor Heinrich Bauer promising him another thousand or fifteen hundred US dollars if needed, Goebbels snapped that in forty years ten, a rather obstinate gentleman their former Kaiser had not had so many people charged with lace majest as often as Prussia's Prime Minister Otto Braun had wielded the hated law. He hurled this parting shot at the protesters, once we have the absolute majority in the Reich, we shan't need a law for the protection of the Republic. We'll hang the lot of you. 20 He happily noted afterward, the Reds foam with rage 21 The Reichstag adjourned for the summer amid satisfying scenes of tumult The stage was gradually filling with the characters who would dominate this, already the last one-third of Joseph Goebbels' life. He knew young Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's deputy chief of propaganda, as a small, fine man, good-natured but perhaps a bit indecisive, a Strasser product 22 On Hermann Goring he was ambivalent, he had got to know the overweight, a meddled aviator better after sharing a platform with him in communist-dominated Friedrich Schein in May. Goring bragged of having known Mussolini intimately while in Italian exile, in fact they had not met. Partying with his eleven fellow Reichstag deputies at Goring's luxurious apartment in Badenskstrasse, the Gauleiter envied his style of life. Six weeks later he recorded that Goring was as thick as two planks and lazy as a tortoise, but it was the former Air Force captain who introduced Goebbels to Berlin's high society. The princes, dukes, and counts foregathered in the Goring apartment, and Goebbels gradually acquired a proclivity for having blue-blooded men around him too. His opinions on the Baltic-born Alfred Rosenberg, cold, arrogant, and unapproachable, varied sharply, he feared that Rosenberg's opaque treatise, The Myth of the Twentieth Century, would cause friction with the Church. Surprisingly, he also disapproved of Julius Stryker's Jew mania. This naked anti-Semitism, he recorded, is too primitive. The Jew can't be blamed for everything. 
we are as much to blame as anybody, and until we accept that we'll never find our way 26 but by 1930 he had a soft spot even for Stryker, probably because Hitler did too. I like him a lot, he noted, he's a real Nork guy, 27 Hitler towered over them all, but the picture of him, still only 40 and unmarried, that is presented by the early Goebbels diaries is an unfamiliar one the great Kunktator taking refuge in the comforting milieu of his beer bench pals in Munich, squandering the party's money, and forever chasing young women, of whom Julie was, in Goebbels' despairing estimate, only the latest example. But Hitler had an instinctive, engaging manner. Meeting Goebbels' mother for the first time, Hitler remarked, she's just like my own 29 the summer of 1929, a real tarboiler in Berlin, sees Dr. Goebbels still fighting shy of sexual relations. He observes his caricaturist Hans Schweitzer, whose drawing pen is the scourge of the highest officers of the Republic, living in mortal terror of his new wife. True, in her temporary absences Schweitzer briefly flutters his clipped wings, but she always returns wielding the clippers afresh. Goebbels prefers to shuffle the pack Xenia, Yuda, Annalise, and occasionally a glimpse of Anka in Weimar. The kindly and submissive Xenia, now on school vacation, tries in vain to dominate him, she sulks for hours, then capitulates and returns for a night which the Gau lighter mechanically logs as Selig, blessed, though with no supporting details. He serenades her on the piano, but has no intention of letting any woman capture him. He has witnessed two Tonak's fate, totally ensnared by the hysterical females of the Nazi women's order now the silly lad's gone and got engaged. So Xenia runs the whole gamut of female trickery from flouncing and huffs to affectionate letters, in vain. She is too easygoing and fluttery, he reports to his diary. I don't think it'll last much longer 33 setting off on vacation that July to Prero, on a Baltic peninsula, he takes his secretary Josephine von Baer and does not invite Xenia, despite her tearful entreaties. Too late. On July 5, Anka phones from Weimar she has a sudden chance to visit Berlin for several days. Has the great moment finally arrived? Goebbels responds, I have thought about it all night. I can't stay in Berlin, I would never get away from work. I can't cancel pre row and I'm fed up with Berlin 34 he suggests an alternative plan that Anka come to a town 50 miles from Berlin and he will come over and spend one or two days with her there. He even spells out the train times and connections. But at Prero his little fantasy is dashed. She telegraphs that she cannot come. How about this plan Goebbels then suggests? I'll come down for a week to Weimar. Can you get me that room in your building again? I hope it won't be too expensive, as I want to go to England in August and to Italy in September. In fact he undertakes neither foreign trip. Is it okay by you and George if I come on Saturday, July 20th? You'll have to leave me to myself a bit as I've a new book in my pen. And don't tell anyone I'm coming to Weimar. He begs her to cable her agreement otherwise I may go up to Sweden for a week. 35 The book is his drama The Wanderer, which he has begun to rework at Prero. Walking along the rain-soaked beaches he contemplates the placid, grey-green Baltic and reflects how different it is from the wind-whipped North Sea the one a gentle mistress, the other a diabolical old maid. The great moment in any young man's life is, it seems, drawing nigh. But there is an unscheduled interlude. At a seaside concert he sits next to Erica Kellius, daughter of a local forester, aged 23. Not good-looking, he concedes but provocative. Is the chase on again? She presses a posy of flowers into his hand and for several days goes out with him and Josephine. Together they all go on a moonlight sail, and Erica talks and flirts and asks bright questions. He suddenly realizes that it is the young Anka that she reminds him of. Back in Berlin, Xenia comes round for the evening, then it is on to Weimar for the great, week-long adventure with Anka. George Mum carries their self-invited guests' baggage to the apartment just above their own in Johann Albrechtstrasse. I am torn many ways, confesses Goebbels in his diary that ten, a rather obstinate gentleman knight. Something is it fear? Is clutching at his vitals. He thinks a lot about Erika Kellius, 
and suddenly Mrs. Prero after all. But here he is, at last, only one floor above his dream woman. Anka, he writes, is waiting downstairs for me 39 one day that week George goes off to Leipzig. Anka bustles happily around her old friend, cooking meals and looking after him, but nothing happens. Neither makes a move. The last day comes, July 25, 1929. Dr. Mum has again gone away, and Goebbels and Anka spend a blissful afternoon out together. Even at 2 a.m. George is still not back. Cursing himself, Goebbels is upstairs, standing irresolutely in the middle of his room when he hears a soft tap at the door. He opens, it is Anka, trembling with so far unrequited passion. George just phoned, she announces. He can't get back tonight. Seized by panic, Goebbels firmly closes the door on her. Perhaps he has smelt an ambush, or just possibly he may have been motivated by those loftier emotions which he carefully sets down for posterity in his diary afterward, no. I cannot abuse the hospitality and trust of George. Wretched though he is in my esteem, and though mine be far the greater right to this beloved woman standing before me in all her wondrous loveliness, Anka must leave the room. I am trembling in every limb. I lie awake for a long, long time. But this morning I shall be able to look George squarely in the eye. Their paths cross briefly at Weimar Station Goebbels and Mum. Fare thee well, the both of you, he writes. I'll have to leave you to your wretchedness and nothingness. Greater missions await 4111, the nightmare J. Osef Goebbels' obsessive devotion to Hitler was illustrated by an incident in September 1929. He was about to speak at Breslau when a telegram signed Rosenberg arrived, Adolf Hitler killed in accident. Goebbels swayed on his feet and nearly fainted. The telegram, a fake, left him a sobbing, nervous wreck. Only now, he wrote afterward, do I realize what Hitler means to me and to the movement, everything. Everything. One the latter part of the year was dominated by the final illness of his father and his campaign against the new young plan for the payment of reparations. Point two he embarked on the latter unwillingly, as it had been initiated by their reactionary rivals the Stahlhelm and the DNVP, German National People's Party, who were demanding a referendum, Volksbegehren, but Hitler gave him no choice. Visiting Berlin on July 4 the Führer told him he was meeting Alfred Hugenberg, chairman of the Deutsche National Volkspartei, DNVP, to discuss a joint campaign against the iniquitous diktat of Versailles and the Young Plan. The prospect of Hitler among these moth-eaten reactionaries alarmed the radical Goebbels.3 in Nuremberg on the eve of the annual party rally, however, Hitler invited him to dine in his suite with him and Julie a pretty child, noticed Goebbels again, and managed to get close to him in the group photographs later. He addressed the rally on propaganda and politics. Point four with their great fireworks displays, concerts by the S.A.S. massed bands and torchlight marches, the famous Nuremberg rallies were beginning to take shape though Goebbels could not help noticing with vexation the Stahlhelm dignitaries lined up on Hitler's platform. Three chartered trains had brought his men from Berlin. Erika Kellius stepped out of the first. The Berlin stormtroopers marched snappily into the city center with Horst Wessel at the head of his Sturm. 5. The SA contingent from the Palatinate wore white shirts, the French occupation authorities had banned the brown. The time will come, Hitler promised them to cheers, when we'll have the shirts off the French. There was one episode with the SA that forewarned of trouble to come with them. Hitler was in mid-speech when the heavy doors burst open. Several hundred communists had arrived from Berlin under the leadership of Max Holtz, bent on staging a bloodbath. The SA dealt with them roughly and, their eleven, the nightmare bloodlust aroused, rampaged through the streets of Nuremberg afterwards leaving two dead and many injured. Hitler sent a chalk-faced Goebbels out by car to call the stormtroopers to order. Horst Wessel showed particular bravery in reigning in his young toughs. Walter Stennis his SA commander, later said that the brown shirts would have taken over the city there and then had he and their national commander Franz von Pfeffer not headed off the catastrophe. Point six on the evening after the riot Erika Kellius joins Goebbels, brimming with coy aspirations. She mentions that she has a twin sister, Double Delight. 
to Goebbels' dismay Xenia von Engelhardt also suddenly appears, furious at his romantic foray to Weimar. Hoping no doubt to escape her, he drives with Erika over to picturesque Rothenburg. Downstairs the next morning he finds the importunate Xenia again. But as suddenly as this tearful apparition appears, it melts away. Point seven back in Berlin he broods all day on the fair sex. Women, he exclaims. Women are to blame for almost everything. Eight for Enka, of course, he will always make an exception. Twice after the 2 a.m. Weimar fiasco, which must have wounded her deeply, he writes to her and cannot understand why she makes no reply. Twice he asks Chatterley if she has the time and inclination to see him on his way through Weimar. Again no reply. How lazy you are at writing, he chides her. Point nine. Here in Berlin all hell is loose, he adds. And in a sense it is, because Erika and her twin Trot have come to drive him out to their forest home. He takes the insufferably jealous Josephine von Baer along too. On September 29 he writes again to Anka. The Reichstag is meeting on important matters, he explains, and suggests she ask George's permission to come to Berlin. You'd get to see all sorts of things. 10 She makes an excuse she is not well. Goebbels apologizes that he cannot come to Weimar because of his parliamentary duties. It is just frightful, he continues, writing from the Reichstag. In the long run one has to dispense with every friendship for the good of the cause. He might be able, he adds, to fit in Weimar on Sunday. But. I've also got to go home as my father is gravely ill. Farewell, he concludes. The division bell is ringing. It's showtime 11 none of these letters has been published before. He makes no mention of them in his diary. Anka has defeated him. Notions of nationalism had stirred only infrequently in his diaries until now. In October 1928 he had thrilled at the majestic airship Graf Zeppelin cruising over Berlin on her 1 12-hour flight to New Jersey, four weeks later, he and Schweitzer had watched the newsreel report on the voyage, furious at the unpatriotic jeers from an audience who only a few minutes later fiercely applauded a Soviet movie. In August 1929 he copied down the inscription on the Brandenburg Gate to all the World War dead and made the acid comment that they had forgotten to add, except the German. The idea of taking over national propaganda began to appeal to him. Staying at Anka's house he had read Eric Maria Remarque's classic anti-war book, All Quiet on the Western Front. He had found it a mean-spirited and even seditious work, and ventured the prediction, Two years from now nobody will talk about this book anymore. 14 nature documentaries like with Amundsen to the North Pole, or the mountaineering movie starring the delectable Lenny Riefenstahl, enthralled him. He fully recognized the subtle persuasive power of the cinema. At the advertising exhibition in Berlin he lingered at the movie section, and a few days later he took his editor Dagobert Der to see the latest sensation, a talking movie. He dismissed the production, The Singing Fool as kitsch, but the technological advance itself impressed him. Here lies the future, he wrote, and we should be wrong to dismiss all this as American gimmickry. Join it. Beat it. 16 He wanted to use sound films for propaganda. Here, he repeated in November 1929, lies a gigantic future, particularly for us orators. The more the movement grows, the more we must exploit technology 17 in the approach to the city elections that month he was already using new techniques. He had posed for a propaganda film in his office. Their amateurish movie Struggle for Berlin and two documentaries on the Nuremberg rally were already circulating. Taking control of their propaganda in Berlin, he composed 20 placards. In the evenings he held training courses to ensure that all candidates emphasized their socialist policies. After a block meeting in October he noted with approval that all his fellow Reichstag deputies had come down firmly against the right wing. With himself at their head, constantly aware of his own dwarf-like shortcomings, he led the SA and its battle standards on violent marches through the communist strongholds of Berlin. He hammered into his SA that attack was the only sure defense against being overwhelmed by the communists. Gate crashing a communist rally in Charlottenburg on August 25 he demanded permission to speak and, when this was refused, 
turned 150 of his tufts loose on the audience. A few days later Horst Wessel's No. 5 Sturm launched a violent attack on the communist headquarters in Berlinkies, injuring several Reds. It was open war. Goebbels called the Reds roaring, raging subhumans, and the women worst of all they scream, they shriek, they bear themselves to us quite shamelessly. The communists referred to him as Goebbels the workers' assassin 22 police chief Isidore Weiss II went on to the counter-attack. Gregor Strasser, his immunity revoked, was sentenced to six months jail. In September Weiss seized one entire issue of Angriff, charging it with incitement to treason. Angriff developed an iconoclastic style of its own, making fun of people's names and lampooning the Central Verine, the pompous Jewish Central Board which had protested at a spate of Nazi attacks on harmless passers-by by calling it henceforth the Central Board of Harmless Passers-by 24 to Goebbels' discomfiture, the Juden press struck back by printing every truly seditious word he had said, and many he had not, trying to get the party banned again. But there was no going back. 11. The nightmare his courage, or bravado, was nearly his undoing. One Sunday in September 1929 he took 2,000 SA marchers into proletarian Nukuln. He expected blood to flow, and it was nearly his own. Standing in his open car he took the salute at Wiener Strasse, then ordered Tonak to drive on and park near the Gorlitz station. Here a burly communist called Hans Kraus shouted, It's Goebbels, the assassin of the workers. Let him have it. Before my very eyes, recorded Goebbels, there appear blackjacks, knives, and knuckle dusters. A communist hurls himself at me. A shot rings out. The shots were answered from his car, a pistol loaded with blanks. His chauffeur was injured yet again. I staunch Tonak's bleeding. He accelerates away, bouncing the car off street signs and curbstones. A hail of rocks follows us, and more shots are fired. 26 Tonak got them to a police station, but the police arrested them both for using a firearm. It was 7 p.m. before they were released. The ill-conceived campaign for a referendum on the Young Plan, which would ask voters among other things to approve the incarceration of any minister guilty of enslaving the German people, occupied him throughout that month. He wrote privately however that nothing was to be achieved by parliamentary means, the revolution must march 28 by midday on November 2 it was plain that the Nazis and DNVP combined had collected signatures from more than the requisite 10% of the electorate some 4,135,000 names. The government however blocked the referendum and the campaign collapsed. Goebbels' next campaign was for the communal elections in Prussia. He ordered every man an implement into the fray. Our doctor, wrote one, was everywhere 30 he spoke in Berlin and in other cities too. At Weimar he met Anka for five minutes in November, she suddenly kissed him with tears in her eyes. But these women were now history he was impressed by the sudden firmness of his own resolve. His headquarters was like a warehouse, with bales of printed propaganda being moved in and out. Fighting on a shoestring the Nazis could not match their rival's expenditure, but Goebbels' campaign was not without effect. While in May 1928 39,000 Berliners had voted the Nazi ticket, on November 17, 1929, his campaign attracted 132,097 votes or 58% of the total. Twice during the night he gleefully phoned Hitler. There would now be 23 National Socialist deputies in Prussia, with Goebbels at their head. The next task, he declared the day after the election, our own daily paper 33 The problem of financing this leap forward had troubled him all year. Angriff's street sales were soaring. He hoped to go daily with it from January 1930. But they would need at least 8,000 new subscribers and massive extra capital. Swallowing his pride he asked Elsbeth Zander to get the women's order to raise the 40,000 marks, and 5,000 new subscribers too. After he addressed a giggling meeting of 600 women on November 7 they collected 4,500 marks on the spot. Police agents learned that Helene Bechstein had donated 5,000. As another woman, of the old Russian Potempa family, handed over 5,000 marks Goebbels could not help noticing her pretty twin daughters. 
Party headquarters in Munich was unenthusiastic about his publishing plans. His politics were still radically different from Hitler's. For a while Rosenberg talked of bringing out a Berlin edition of his stupendously boring VB, with Angriff as a local supplement. But the latter's war chest was expanding. A Mr. Heidenreich donated 10,000 marks, trusting, as he said, in our victory. By early January the women's order had amassed 26,000 marks and 2,000 new subscribers' names. Three days after the November 1929 election Goebbels had traveled down to Munich for planning talks on Angriff. After an evening of speeches he stayed up talking with Karl Kaufmann, Göring, and Wilhelm Cuba, another Gau leiter. They shared his view of Hitler's Beer Hall milieu. Hitler again promised to relinquish control of national propaganda to Goebbels, if he would spend more of his time in Munich. Goebbels was appreciative but critical, I am not overlooking his failings, he wrote privately about Hitler. He's too soft and he works too little. I suspect, he continued primly in his diary, that he indulges in too much womanizing too. Lying awake pondering these failings in his adopted father figure, Goebbels charitably concluded that Hitler was different and that he had a right therefore to be judged on a different scale. Hitler the myth must stand, like a rocher de bronze 37 in raid, he was losing his real father. The Goebbels family doctor pronounced the old man's condition as beyond hope. Ashen and gaunt, his face streaked by tears of pain, his father had lain on a sofa in their spotlessly tidy kitchen when he last saw him at raid, surrounded by his family. There we are, Paul Joseph had soliloquized in his diary, the Goebbels family, of diverse character every one of us, but all of the same blood. Soft as children, and hard as nails. 38 He wrote a long last letter to the pious old man and traveled to raid again. A living skeleton, whimpering with pain, his father asked only that they all pray for him. On December 7 he died. What person does not suffer pangs of remorse upon a parent's death? Without his children, Goebbels reflected, and all alone, he crossed to the wilderness of Nirvana. Forty Tonak chauffeured the Goebbels brothers up to the church where the body of their father lay surrounded by flickering candles, helpless tears trickling down his cheeks. Joseph stroked the waxy hands and face of the man who would now never know to what heights his own sacrifices had propelled his son. A letter of condolence came from Anka. It will be my endeavor, he solemnly replied, to equal my late father's fanaticism and devotion to a cause, with the difference that his was for his family, whereas mine shall be for my people and eleven, the nightmare fatherland. I should be glad, he mechanically concluded, to hear again from you soon. 41 in raid he had run into Elsyanka. She pinked, turned pale, and asked if he ever thought of her. What should I reply, he reflected and answered with a lie. All of these events unsettled him. A week before Christmas he had a grotesque nightmare. He dreamed he was back at school being pursued along echoing corridors by rabbis from eastern Galicia. The Jews were chanting as they ran, screaming hate, hate, hate. He always kept a few limping strides ahead of them, and answered with the same taunt. In his dream it seemed as though the pursuit lasted for hours, but they never caught up with him. 12. Hold the flag high with only five dead by the end of 1929 Berlin had as yet few Nazi martyrs. Point one, but the war in the streets was intensifying. Sometimes Goebbels found somebody in the headquarters kitchen being treated for stab injuries, bullet wounds increased. Point two, as he was visiting Edmund Benck, an SA man slowly dying from the original Ferris Rooms brawl, another man was brought in with a slashed forehead. Point three, on November 4, communists murdered Gerhard Weber. On December 14 a communist gunned down Walter Fischer during a raid on an SA office. Capitalizing on these martyrs, Goebbels organized ever larger funerals. At Fischer's he spoke alongside Göring, Prince August Wilhelm, and Horst Wessel. Point four, spending Christmas with his now widowed mother he heard that their opponents had slit the throat of yet another SA man, the bookbinder Fritz Radloff, and New Year's Eve found him at a rain-soaked cemetery burying Radloff too. No murder really fired the imagination of the party so much as that, when his time came, of young Horst Wessel himself. Goebbels had considered him one of his most promising apostles, 
although still only 22.5 but he was a marked man. Wessel's No. 5 Sturm had angered the Communist High Command by recruiting freely from their ranks. More recently, according to Stennis, he had fallen in with bad company. He dropped out of his law studies and was working as a laborer. Point six. Perhaps this was no more than youthful rebellion. His late father had been an evangelical pastor and Freemason. Against his mother's wishes, he had moved into a sleazy attic room at No Gross Frankfurter Strasse with his girlfriend Erna Janikin, whom he had rescued from the streets. Point seven. That December, his brother Werner had frozen to death in the mountains. Goebbels buried him with a torchlight parade rooted provocatively past the communists' Karl Liebknecht building. On the evening of January 14 the enemy squared accounts with Horst, a dozen communists and Jews beset his lodgings, the carpenter Albrecht Holler, Salomon Epstein and another man raced upstairs and hammered on his door. When Wessel, inside with Erna and another girl, opened up, Holler shouted hands up, and discharged a 9mm parabellum pistol into his face, blowing away his jaw. Seizing papers and a gun from Wessel's locked cupboard, his disaffected landlady, widow of a communist, had obliged them with the keys, the attackers twelve, hold the flag high escaped, Holler kicked the prostrate Wessel as he ran out, yelling, you know what that's for. The communist headquarters put a well-oiled escape plan into action for Holler, providing refuges in two Jewish households and then funds and a forged passport to flee to Prague. Point eight Horst Wessel clung to life in the hospital for weeks. Goebbels visited him often, he mused that this was the stuff of a real Dostoevsky novel The Idiot, The Workers, The Harlot, The Bourgeois Family Nine Once Wessel croaked, We must go on, ten foolishly returning to Berlin, Holler was arrested and confessed. The aftermath was a textbook example of the brilliant disinformation techniques used by Goebbels' opponents. The defense lawyer hired by the communists, Lowenthal, started a whispering campaign to smear Wessel as Erna's pimp. Thus he could portray Holler's motives as purely personal. The Juden press seized on this tidbit. Communist playwright Bertolt Brecht mocked, in the search for a fitting hero who really personified the movement, the National Socialists opted, after considerable deliberation, for a pimp. Goebbels gritted his teeth and fought back, he now had the one real martyr the movement needed. On February 7 he had the Horst Wessel anthem, Die Fani Hodge. Hold the Flag High, sung by massed choirs at the end of a Sport Palace rally. Visiting the hospital he urged the young man not to give up the fight to live, but he died 16 days later. Thou shalt live on with us, wrote Goebbels mawkishly after visiting the deathbed, and shalt partake in our victory. 13 He ordained a colossal funeral parade for March 1, and Hitler himself promised to attend. Fearing major disturbances Dr. Weiss banned it allowing only ten cars in the cortege and a ceremony confined to the walled Nikolai Cemetery itself. Police officers confiscated the flag draping the coffin. Communists, out in force along the route, snatched the wreaths from the horse-drawn hearse and sang the Internationale. At the cemetery Goebbels found a large slogan painted on the wall, a final Heil Hitler to Wessel the pimp. He swallowed his fury. As the coffin sank into the ground a thousand throats defiantly roared the anthem that bore its murdered composer's name. In ten years, Goebbels prophesied to the SA men parading within the cemetery walls, in one of the finest speeches he ever delivered, that anthem would be sung by every schoolchild, by every factory worker, and by every marching soldier in Germany. A barrage of rocks came flying over the wall from the jeering mob outside. They rampage recorded Goebbels upon his return home, and we win 16 Hitler had missed the funeral, he had decided to spend the weekend at his Obersalzburg cottage with Julie instead. Goebbels took this very hard. He felt he had got to know Hitler better, and deprecated his indolent, undependable, indecisive personality. He believed that Goring shared this view. He Hitler works too little, wrote Goebbels, and then the women, the women. How many promises Hitler had now given him and broken, to attend the Horst Wessel funeral, to break with Otto Strasser, to enable Angriff to appear as a daily newspaper, and to appoint him Reich propaganda director these were only some of them. 
delayed by obstructionism from Munich Goebbels had failed to upgrade Angriff as planned to a daily newspaper in January 1930. That month the Strassers announced that they would publish a daily in Berlin, National Socialist, from March 1. Since it would flaunt the party's swastika emblem it would be a lethal stab in the back for Goebbels. He protested to Hitler. Characteristically, Hitler did not even reply. He lacks the courage to take decisions, Goebbels deduced. Finally Munich phoned, inviting him down to talk it over with Hitler. Goebbels set off determined to threaten resignation. Hitler however claimed to know nothing of the Strasser's newspaper plan, he feigned a convincing rage about Otto's disloyalty, a rather smaller rage about his brother Gregor, and, with the beloved Julie at his side, comforted the Gauleiter, saying he would publish VB in Berlin. That puts Strasser up against the wall, wrote Goebbels maliciously, just where, he wanted to put me 23 he returned to Berlin appeased. In fact, Hitler's subsequent announcement of his plan seemed even to disavow Goebbels. There were howls of glee from Berlin's organized Jewish community and particularly from their central Zeitung. An open breach with Munich threatened. Hitler had promised to squelch Otto Strasser's plans to publish his daily newspaper, the Strasser brothers continued however to announce it as coming. No sooner had Hitler persuaded the VB to publish an item on Goebbels' behalf than the Strassers talked their Führer round again. Their new daily newspaper hit the streets on March 1, the day of Horst Wessel's funeral. Hitler's capitulation to the Strassers was evidently one reason why he dared not show his face in Goebbels' city. Immediately after the ceremony Goebbels phoned him and drafted another letter threatening resignation. He sent Goring down to Bavaria carrying this ultimatum. Hitler offered still more promises to be conveyed back to Goebbels. He repeated in particular the offer to make Goebbels Reich propaganda director, for the umpteenth time, commented Goebbels sarcastically, learning of this. His faith in Hitler was cooling. Several times his diary carried signs that the Nazis were gaining support in Berlin's regular police force. Half of them were former army officers. While Dr. Bernhard Weiss seemed secure in office, to Goebbels' delight his political superior Albert Gretesinski was suddenly obliged to resign on the day of the Horst Wessel funeral because of his marital irregularities. That, Goebbels triumphed, is one swine down thirty he had relied hitherto on his parliamentary immunity to protect him. On February 11, 1930 the Reichstag took the first steps to revoke his immunity in three cases. I'll probably be spending the next years in the clink, he gloomily reflected. His benefactress, the Dowager Victoria von Dirksen, asked Prince August Wilhelm to contact the lawyer Count Rudiger von der Goltz. Goltz, and twelve, hold the flag high imposing figure who had lost a leg in the war, would act for Goebbels, three years his junior, in many of the coming court battles. They met over dinner at the Dirksen home in Margarethenstrasse. When Goebbels boasted that his Nazis were willing to die for their ideals, one guest, Baron Freitag von Loringhoven, murmured, I am sure some might be prepared to die for the DNVP cause. Indeed, mocked Goebbels, but only of old age, 32 the most serious allegation was that of high treason, and on March 10 the Reichstag revoked his immunity on that charge. Meanwhile despite its crippling financial provisions the government passed the Young Plan into law and President von Hindenburg signed it. Anticipating violent opposition, the government revived the hated law for the protection of the Republic. Goebbels led the parliamentary protest on March 13. Rounding on Karl Severing, the Minister of the Interior, he evoked laughter when he recalled that it was Gustav Niski, a predecessor, who had once said, even an ass can rule by state of emergency 34 and that was precisely what this new law was. It is no coincidence, he shrilled, that the law for the protection of the Republic is being given its second reading precisely one day after the Young Law is enacted. You yourself point out that in the course of the Young Plan economic hardships are inevitable, and that two or three millions will become permanently unemployed in Germany. This, he said revealed the law in its true light a law against the unemployed. You promised freedom, beauty and, dignity. Several times the speaker reprimanded him. Marxism, declared Goebbels, tried before the war to destroy an honest state with dishonest means. 
We want to get rid of a dishonest state with honest means. There were screams of fury. He was ordered to sit down, and the Social Democrats cheered. The new law was certainly repressive. It was designed to choke even the parliamentary opposition, under it, any prison sentence rendered a person unfit for public office, Dr. Weiss's police were empowered to dissolve any political association and to confiscate its entire assets. The crisis however continued, and Dr. Heinrich Brüning became Chancellor. Loss of immunity therefore threatened Goebbels with far-reaching consequences. Apart from the old allegation of high treason the files which the police now avidly dusted off concerned a ragbag of misdemeanors, many of them centering on his efforts to puncture Dr. Weiss's pride and vanity. Weiss was publicly considered the uncrowned king of Berlin, and in Weimar Germany as in many authoritarian states the offense of Lace Majest was taken dreadfully seriously. Worse, on October 20 Angriff had referred to the then Prussian Minister of the Interior as Comrade Kratosinski, born in the House of Cohn. The court summons in this latter case survives in the archives, a cheaply printed form folded into an envelope and stamped Moabit Criminal Court 36 more summonses seemed to arrive by every mail on April 14 he counted nine, including the one alleging high treason. A fine show this is going to be, he wrote in his diary. Several times he simply refused to testify, and the hearings ended with the judge in a deeply satisfying fury. The most delicate case against Goebbels involved the president, a recent article and caricature in Angriff had asked is Hindenburg still alive, 38 the writ from the field marshal disturbed him, and he cursed the editorial staff of Angriff for saddling him with this case. Hindenburg's personal prestige was very great, even though by modern standards of journalism the article was quite tame. It had appealed to Hindenburg to invoke his presidential powers to block the ruinous young plan, but even the remaining personal admirers and friends of Hindenburg the article had said entertain few illusions about any activity to be expected from him in this direction. Here as in every other similar situation Mr. von Hindenburg will do whatever his Jewish and Marxist advisers ask of him. Goebbels was all for pleading justification, Ritter von Epp had provided him with annihilating material about the field marshal. Goltz discouraged this. Goebbels drafted his own defense speech and looked forward to the court hearing set down for the last day of May 1930. On the eve of the trial however Goltz brought him the unwelcome news that two of the three judges were Jewish. He challenged them right away, but his motion for recusal was denied. Then, he recorded immodestly in his diary, I speak, 90 minutes and I am in tip-top form. The whole court is deeply impressed. The prosecutor demands nine months prison. Gold speaks, very effective 41 after a two-hour recess the judges announced their verdict a trifling fine of 800 marks. Their judgment all but exonerated Goebbels, who wrote, I could have yelped with joy. Only the cartoon was considered libelous inasmuch as it portrayed one arm of Hindenburg's presidential throne as a Jewish-nosed, star of David wearing gargoyle. No longer mentioning that the judges who had served him so fairly were themselves Jewish, Dr. Goebbels recorded in his diary only the wonderful propaganda effect of this victory. The news even made the faraway columns of the New York Times. Lunching during the long recess with Hermann Goring, Goebbels noticed that the aviator was by no means comfortable with his attack on the old field marshal. His attitude to Goring was now one of scorn tinged with envy. Relying on his war record Goring had established himself firmly in Berlin's society, still lacking home comforts of his own, Goebbels often spent his evenings with Hermann and Karen and one or other of the Nazi princes. His own principles had begun to fray from exposure to the corrupt, blue-blood-loving Goring. He must have realized that Goring could only finance his lifestyle with hefty bribes from the aviation industry precisely the kind of behavior that Goebbels thundered against when detected in Jews like the financiers Max Sklarek or Julius Barmet. In March Goring grandly offered to procure a new car for Goebbels, this offer proved as empty as the apartment he had promised earlier. 12. Hold the flag high when Easter came in 1930 Goring invited him along to visit his Swedish in-laws. They made a memorable couple the swaggering aviator and the diminutive figure limping at his side. It was Dr. Goebbels' first trip overseas. Every time he awoke the train seemed to be passing a boulder-strewn landscape. The Swedes themselves made up for it. 
he lusted greedily after the statuesque blonde women, and concluded that they were superior to their menfolk. The Swedish men were doormats, from their monarch downward, German on the outside, he wrote, half Jews within 45 when he left the Gorings he decided that Karen was on the verge of tears and added, using his coded doublespeak, she is fond of me, meaning, he was of her, and more meaningfully, I revere her like a mother. Hermann Goring, he decided, was a good sport. Hitler's birthday came during the absence. Goebbels did not write his customary eulogy. He was still aggrieved about the Strassers. By mid-March sales of the Strassers' new daily National Socialist in Berlin were soaring, and both Angriff and Folkisker Biobotter were in difficulties. Reluctant to carry out his threat of resigning, Goebbels wrote, Munich, and that includes the chief, has run out of credit with me. He added, Hitler hides away, he takes no decisions. He just lets things drift. 47 His office manager Franz Wilk returned from Munich with more empty Hitler promises. Himmler came and assured Goebbels that Hitler really wanted him as Reich propaganda director. Goebbels had heard that before. He had brooded for months on Hitler and his broken promises. He doesn't dare make a move against Strasser, he noted. What's going to happen later when he has to act the dictator in Germany? 50 When Hitler suddenly surfaced in Berlin for a conference with Hugenberg and the DNVP on ways of bringing the government crisis to a head, Goebbels tackled him taking along Goring for moral support. He frankly accused the Führer of letting things drift. A second meeting with Hitler left Goebbels with the impression that he was losing his nerve. In the event, Hugenberg's party refused to join Hitler in forcing a vote of confidence. The government's crisis peaked on April 12. Bruning just survived, his majority reduced to seven. On April 14, his majority slumped still further to three but again he survived. Hitler, who had hurried to Berlin, returned to Munich. None of their opponents wanted an election from which only the Nazis and Communists were likely to profit. As the Depression bit deeper Hitler's party had begun to expand. It ended 1930 with 389,000 registered members. Dr. Goebbels doubled his Gauss membership, although the wealthier districts were still sparsely represented. The huge West End Orts Group, local, extending from Schlossstrasse to Pitchelsdorf and from the grimy Siemensstadt industrial suburb to Halensee still yielded only 45 members. Late in April 1930 Goebbels learned while in Munich that Hitler had at last reprimanded Gregor Strasser. The Führer confirmed that he had issued an ultimatum to Strasser to drop either his newspaper in Berlin or the organization department in Munich. Since everybody now had their eyes on Reichstag seats, Hitler had regained his influence. Thank goodness, wrote Goebbels. Everybody is right behind him. Strasser sits there like guilt personified. Hitler has strung him up courteous to the last rung of the scaffold. Then came the moment that Goebbels had badgered for. Hitler announced amidst, if Goebbels is to be believed, a breathless hush his appointment as the party's national chief of propaganda. With it went the rank of Reichsleiter making him one of a very select body indeed. Goebbels saw Strasser go pale. Afterward, the whole bunch except for Himmler came round to Goebbels' side. The Berlin Gau headquarters now had about 30 on its payroll, including Mucho, who was in charge of perfecting the factory cell system. Goebbels had twice been able to raise their pay. He began looking round for larger premises, perhaps even an entire building. Cleverly mollifying him, the party's national headquarters purchased for him a brand new open Mercedes with a supercharged engine. He was still a big car enthusiast like all the top Nazis. His own modest budget was quite strained. His brother Conrad's business had folded, leaving Hans and Joseph as providers for their mother. I want to look after mother as best I can, wrote Goebbels. Good old mum. She deserves an old age free of worries. 56 The glittering Mercedes soaked up his income, however. It was an essential mobile display of might and rank, with some of the attributes of a tank as well. One night after his SA men had killed three communists he was driving with six brown shirts to a parade when he was recognized by his enemies. My heart missed a beat he recorded, 
but our magnificent supercharger rampaged triumphantly through the howling mob. 57 His disenchantment with his Führer continued. Horst Wessel's mother complained that Hitler had not written even one line of sympathy. Privately Goebbels blamed Hitler's waywardness on his womanizing 58 Two days after the new Mercedes arrived, Hitler came back to Berlin to speak at the Sport Palace. He again brought his young niece Julie. Goebbels again pleaded with him to kill off the rival newspaper National Socialist. From the Berlin Gauleiter's new offices Hitler phoned Otto Strasser and forbade him to sell the newspaper that evening. But Otto proved more slippery than that. True, he undertook to sell off the newspaper to Hitler's publisher Max Eamon and to cease publication from the 20th, but he broke both promises. On May 21 Hitler returned to Berlin for a showdown. This time even Gregor disowned his brother Otto. Hitler threatened open war against them. Goebbels returned to the fold. In Munich Hitler enthusiastically showed him his plans for the Brown House, the party's new national headquarters. It seemed rather overopulent even to Goebbels. Whereas the departed Social Democratic Chancellor Heinrich Müller unlovingly described by Goebbels as having a badly rusted voice well oiled by slime had ruled by the truncheon, Brüning's two years in office would be marked by emergency laws and prohibitions. On April 1 Hanover banned the 12, hold the flag high activities of the Hitler Youth. On June 5 Bavaria banned political uniforms in theory those of all parties, in practice only of the Nazis. On June 11, as Goebbels had anticipated, Prussia's new Minister of the Interior Dr. Heinrich Weintig banned the S.A.S. brown shirts, and two weeks later Prussia forbade its civil servants to join the Hitler party. Attired in white shirts with beer bottle rings as badges, 1,000 of Stennis S.A. men marched through Charlottenburg that evening and Friedrich Schein two days later. The police had to adopt ludicrous tactics to enforce the bans. Goebbels no longer feared them. He had their measure. The real enemy, he recognized, is at our rear meaning the Strasser faction. The Strasser's newspaper continued to appear, spiced with cruel remarks about Goebbels and his cult of personality. Several section heads, Kreis Leiter, declared for Otto Strasser. Goebbels blamed Hitler and his procrastination, and meeting him in Leipzig he told him so. Hitler again promised to take action. Sick with worry, Goebbels wrote, Hitler's got to act he's got to. Or there'll be a catastrophe. He found out which of his men were traitors, and lodged complaints with the party's powerful arbitration committee, particularly about Eugen Mosikowski, editor of the NS Presse Conference and two section heads. Mosikowski had done something unforgivable, at Gauleiter conferences in Berlin and Brandenburg he had accused Goebbels of lying about his heroism during the Ruhr struggle and of forging documents to make his entry into the party seem earlier than it was. These were sore points for Goebbels. Hitler told Göring that he would authorize the Strasser's expulsion on Monday the 23rd, and personally confirmed this to Goebbels while electioneering at Plauen in Saxony on June 21. Again however he did not act. When Goebbels phoned him he said he preferred to wait. Typical Hitler, wrote Goebbels. Rampant at Plauen, and procrastinating here 66 with Hitler's permission however he expelled the mutinous small fry like Mosikowski. Mosikowski preempted his expulsion by issuing a statement through the wire services repeating all the lies, and several cruel truths, about Goebbels before resigning. Gregor Strasser saw the storm signals and assured Goebbels he had broken with his brother Otto. Goebbels trusted none of them. If only we had acted in February, he wailed. The entropy inside his organization increased. There were disturbing reports from Nukln of scuffles between rival SA factions. Hitler, the familiar old Hitler the eternal procrastinator, kept a low profile. Goring told Goebbels that he too was shattered by Hitler's disloyalty. But the very next day, June 30, he phoned Goebbels, victory was theirs. Hitler had now written a powerful open letter excoriating both Strasser brothers. Gregor laid down the editorship of his newspaper and survived, Otto was expelled from the party. As Hitler's bluntly phrased letter was read out at a Berlin party meeting there were shouts from the floor of String M up. Three disgruntled Angriff employees left the hall, but that was all. 
the meeting ended with a spectacular vote of confidence in Hitler and Goebbels. Goebbels persuaded the Führer to decree that Kampf Verlag was an enemy of the party. With that, Otto Strasser's goose was cooked. One problem which remained for Dr. Goebbels that summer was the law courts. Dr. Weiss was determined to see him serve his two months in jail. On May 13 the prosecutors confidentially asked the Reichstag if it was still formally in session. On Goltz's advice Goebbels persuaded Dr. Leonardo Conti, the Gau's medical officer, to sign a sick note. That would give him four weeks' grace. The prosecutor's office demanded an independent examination. The mailman brought to Goebbels were Temergisk Strasse lodgings a new summons, for libeling Albert Kretisinski, by calling him Cohn, it was returned to the courthouse with a note, gone away, and no forwarding requested. 70 His relations with women have come to a similar impasse. Visiting Anka in January 1930 he has failed to detect that she is four months pregnant by yet another man. Returning to Weimar in June he checks into the Elephant Hotel and sends her tulips and a card. Can I call round, it reads. A half-cocked but still platonic episode begins in June when Lucy Kammer, a young shorthand secretary, still a pure child, with a much older, unloved and now mortally ill husband comes to the Gau Leiter with her marital problems, he rapidly grasps that she loves him. A few days later he decides that Princess Ziaweed loves him too, at the Gorings he meets the Baroness Erika von Palsk and records that Ika, because there is already another Erika in his menage, also loves him. His phone jangles all day Charlotte, Xenia, Lucy always the same, he whimpers in his diary. I am a victim. Women are a plague upon him. But they are an incredible stimulation to work, he confesses. What he fears is losing his liberty. He writes about Ika that August, she comes on too strong. Thank goodness we were sitting out in the open 73 he is vacationing or hiding at Erika's house in the forest when word comes on July 18, 1930 that Brüning's government is in difficulties. Tonak rushes him back to the Reichstag building in the Mercedes supercharger. Goebbels romanticizes that his one vote may seal Brüning's fate. In fact Brüning dissolves the Reichstag. As the communist deputies roar the Internationale, Goebbels slips out of the building, naked to the law, even his residual parliamentary immunity annulled. 13, his week in court 13, his week in court as so far Dr. Goebbels had had to face no real challenge as Gau Leiter. But, as the new Reichstag election of September 14, 1930 approached, the rift between his Gau's officers and the impoverished and disgruntled fist fighters of the Berlin SA came to a head. Most of the SA men were unemployed. They saw no signs that Hitler intended to allow them any tangible reward for their bravery. Battered and bruised, they watched bitterly as the party squandered considerable sums on the Brown House, its national headquarters, in Munich. Point one recognizing this, Hitler had ordered the Gau Leiters to enforce a 20 Pfennig monthly levy on each party member to support their local SA men, Goebbels sympathized with them. He ordered an additional 10 Pfennig levy in Berlin the SA Groschen as it was known. Point two, we shall reach our goals only on the basis of the S.A., he asserted at one confidential meeting. Point three, the SA however wanted to get at the pork barrel now, and they were not prepared to wait. The result would be the first full-scale SA mutiny, during the heat of the summer in Berlin. Captain Walter Stennis, the ex-army officer who is Supreme SA Commander, Osef, Ost commanded 25,000 of these disaffected men east of the river Elba, shared many of Dr. Goebel's political views. He had dubbed the Gau Leiter the Nazis Joseph Stalin, responsible for preserving the purity of the movement's ideals. Point four both deprecated Hitler's legalistic approach to power. Though not as radically left wing as the Gau Leiter, Stennis was like him an activist and revolutionary. Goebbels was torn between instinct and logic. Captain Stennis and the SA represented manpower and muscle but Hitler and Munich held promise of power, office and ever bigger automobiles. Late in July Hitler called a secret conference to decide the official list of Nazi candidates. Goebbels was amused to see how tame Strasser and the other fractious big shots suddenly became. They finally agreed a list of 100 names, though not in their wildest dreams did they expect to win so many seats. 
5.5 the list brought the problems with the SA to a head. Stennis sent to the National Supreme SA commander, Franz von Pfeffer, a letter asking for safe Reichstag seats for three SA men.6 but Hitler was opposed to allowing the SA any more political clout than it already had. On August 1 Stennis mentioned in his diary reports from his subordinate commanders that relations between the SA and Munich were becoming intolerable. He invited his boss, Pfeffer, to Berlin at once. Meanwhile on the 2nd his SA commanders reiterated their demands for Reichstag seats. The next day Pfeffer revealed that Hitler was on the contrary talking of cutting the SA back to what they could afford. Financial prudence did not commend itself to the brown shirt rednecks. This shows, reported Stennis chief of staff, that the objectives of the Reich director i.e., Pfeffer in Munich are no longer those of old. This was true. Hitler intended to attain power by strictly legal means. In Munich Goebbels, now Reich propaganda director, briefed his deputy Himmler on the broad outlines of the election campaign, then returned to Berlin. Nationwide over the next two months the glaring red and black Nazi election posters would invade telegraph poles, billboards and newspapers.7 He printed millions of leaflets to be sold to Nazis at one pfennig each. Sleepless with work and worry, his nerves tautened, frayed and snapped. At the beginning of August 1930 1,000 of his officials so rapidly was the party now expanding packed into a pre-election conference. From tram conductor to princess, every rank of society was active in the party's campaign. Point eight in this election battle Goebbels would organize 20,000 meetings up and down the country, in Berlin he would stage 24 mass meetings on the last two days alone. The ruling Social Democrats tried to bury Goebbels with court actions. The Hindenburg case was revived along with the ancient charges of high treason. Seven more summonses arrived, accusing Goebbels of having libeled the Prussian Prime Minister Dr. Otto Braun 9 Albert Gritisinski, municipal officials and the entire Jewish community. Fearing summary imprisonment he stockpiled a batch of articles for Engriff. On August 3 he was notified of ten more court dates, with the gentlemen of Engriff to blame for most of them. While the SA built up an ugly steamhead in his rear, Goebbels was fighting a nationwide election campaign and preparing half a dozen trial defenses. Thus the SA could hardly have chosen a less propitious moment to strike. Stennis, a sheaf of resignation letters from his commanders in his pocket, wrote to Pfeffer that his SA had a right to a hearing from Hitler. He got no reply. He then tackled Goebbels and threatened to withdraw his SA commanders the Berlin SA would then shrink from 15,000 to perhaps 3,000, he predicted. Goebbels exploded, Hitler described the S.A.S. actions to Pfeffer as mutiny and conspiracy. Believing that Stennis' clumsy intrigues were at the bottom of the S.A.S. unrest, Goebbels tackled the top SA commanders in Berlin like Bruno Wetzel, he too spoke of mutiny, comfortable in the knowledge that he had Hitler behind him. A few days later Stennis took an SA delegation down to Munich, where he demanded to see Hitler. For two days they waited in the lobby. Loyal SS men barred the way. Goebbels, worried, discussed the gathering crisis with Goring. I don't trust Stennis at all, he warned his diary. So let's keep an eye on him, 1313, his week in court his week in court arrived on Tuesday August 12 beginning with the Otto Braun libel action in Hanover. The Hindenburg appeal was set down for Thursday in Berlin. President Hindenburg let it be known that he would drop the case if they could agree on a joint statement, they could not. On the 12th he and his lawyer Goltz took the morning train to Hanover. An eager crowd of Nazis met them at the station along with the local Gauleiter Bernhard Rust and his SA commander Victor Lutz, one of the few who were refusing to truckle to Stennis. The rowdy procession swept the onelegged Goltz and his lame client along to the courthouse. The charge was that Goebbels had accused Braun of taking bribes from Galician Spivs. Three police agents swore on oath that he had said this, supported by witnesses, Goebbels admitted having accused Bauer, the former Social Democrat Reich Chancellor, of taking bribes. The prosecutor demanded nine months prison arguing that if Goebbels had libeled Hindenburg he was quite capable of having libeled the Prime Minister. Goltz pointed out that even the Jewish arch-swindler Julius had been sentenced to only 11 months, with half remitted. 
Goebbels was acquitted and awarded his costs. Instead of a jail term he had won huge publicity. Early SA men chaired him out of the courtroom, singing the Horst Wessel anthem, he went off to carouse with Lutz, their commander. One down, three to go. On Thursday the 14th the court heard his appeal in the Hindenburg case. The prosecutor again demanded a nine-month prison sentence. Goltz however read out a letter from Hindenburg the president himself wanted to withdraw the original complaint. As that was not possible, he now considered the matter closed and had no further interest in punishing Dr. Goebbels. The public prosecutor snapped that he, and not Hindenburg, represented the state in this courtroom. The judge disagreed, he too acquitted Dr. Goebbels, finding that his statements had been made in the public interest. Goebbels could see that the newspapermen were stunned by this renewed victory. Still a free man he prepared for the third day in the courthouse at Moabit on Friday the 15th. The plaintiffs here were the Reich government and exchange on sailor Hermann Muller, charging that in Angriff in December 1929 he had labeled the Social Democrats a bunch of hired traitors. The elderly judge Dr. Tolk invited him to justify the words, and Goebbels did so with relish, emphasizing how the Social Democrats had signed away Germany's birthright in the post-war treaties while deceiving their own people. Goltz told of how the Social Democrat governments of Saxony, Thuringia and Prussia had sabotaged the government's post-war struggle for the Ruhr, how Saxony's Prime Minister had betrayed government secrets to France, how the Social Democrats had thwarted attempts to rescue Schlageter from execution, and how their Philip Schademann had betrayed details of the Reichswehr's violations of Versailles. Judge Tolk was aghast. If we are to hear evidence for all these claims, he stammered, well, I have two months from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but Dr. Goebbels, interrupted Goltz, has stated openly what millions think. He wants to justify his allegations. He is at the court's disposal. We have the time. Goebbels had already brought a platoon of military witnesses into court, but the judge refused to allow them. Goltz solemnly picked up his crutch and hobbled out. The prosecutor asked for a six-month sentence on Goebbels. The court reserved its judgment, and moved on without a break to the Gratisinski libel action. That Saturday, August 16, Goebbels expected to go to prison. Instead the court stipulated modest fines of 600 and 400 marks for libeling the government and Muller, and 400 for Gratisinski. This was cheap publicity indeed. These demanding court actions are doing my gut no good, wrote Goebbels. It's enough to throw up. Three down, the court moved on to the next charge, of incitement to violence, and handed down another petty fine, of 300 marks. Let them give their verdict, wrote Goebbels grimly on the 17th. We shall utter our verdict on September 14 election day. He visited his mother at Raid. Berlin phoned him there four more court summonses had arrived. By the time of his return the number had doubled to eight. Braun and Gratisinski had both appealed for stiffer sentences, Goebbels was now also accused of having, in a speech at Prero in July 1929, called the Reich's war standard a Jewish flag, a dirt rag, and any republic that it stood for a Jew Republic 19 he decided to ignore these fresh trials. Court officials demanded to see him. He refused he was now planning the biggest sport palace meetings of the campaign. The courts, he recorded are now hounding me with summonses. I've got a thick skin. I won't budge twenty by the late summer of 1930 there were signs that his diaries had begun concealing his true anxiety about the essay. The incriminating notebooks might have been snatched at any time by communists, the essay, or the police. Thus the diary avowed that he shared the S.A.S. indignation. In reality he got his office manager Franz Wild to take precautions against them. This became more urgent as rumors multiplied that Stennis was planning to issue an ultimatum to Munich. Dr. Leonardo Conti, the S.A.S. chief physician, warned both Hitler and Goebbels that Stennis was up to no good. At the end of August, realizing that he could not curb his underling's revolutionary passions, Pfeffer resigned. Stennis waited until Goebbels was away in Dresden, then called his commanders together. Melita Wiedemann, Features editor of Angriff, 
could see him through the windows one floor below standing in a white cap at the head of a table round which crowded Berlin's SA commanders. There were thirteen, his weak in court growls of approval as Stennis proposed they go on strike immediately unless Hitler accepted their demands for a bigger slice of the action. By telephone Goebbels heard from Berlin that the SA commanders had collected their ragged regiments, Standarten, for a confrontation with both Berlin, Goebbels, and Munich, Hitler. This put at risk the big sport palace election meeting on Friday the 29th. Back in Berlin on Thursday Goebbels found Stennis demanding three Reichstag seats and more funds. Otherwise, in best trades union jargon, he could not guarantee that his SA lads would not break up Goebbels' meeting, an unparalleled impertinence in the Gauleiter's view. It was an ugly situation. Goebbels phoned Munich and advised them to play for time. They could appear to yield to Stennis' demands, fight the election, then take revenge on him. Hitler however said he did not propose to yield anything. Goebbels swooned with rage, Hitler had lost touch with reality 15,000 SA in Berlin were threatening violence against him and his embattled headquarters. He left for Hamburg that evening. In his absence 30 SA men appeared at the Hedmannstrasse headquarters with the intention of giving Franz Wilk the kind of head massage in which they specialized. Only the intervention of Stennis himself, according to his diary, prevented a rough house. The SA commanders, he dictated, left no doubt that, far from protecting today's sport palace meeting of General Karl Litzmann, Drive Wilhelm Frick, and Dr. Goebbels, the SA men of the Gaussturm intended to smash it up. Stennis ordered them to assemble in a beer hall at Hassenheide instead, to receive special orders from him, which his diary does not specify. Wilk reacted by moving a reliable SS guard unit into the headquarters building. Goebbels discreetly left by car the next morning, Saturday the 30th, for Breslau. Stennis ordered his commanders to meet him at Hedmannstrasse. As they were meeting here, they found an SS man, Hertel, writing notes on their conference from the locked room next door, on orders from above 24 an SA unit bloodily evicted the SS men, though not before one of them. Walter Kern, had alerted the police. Dr. Bernhard Weiss sent a massive force round within minutes, who hauled off the SA trespassers. An urgent telegram notified Goebbels in Breslau. He phoned Hitler at Bayreuth, Hitler said he would come to Berlin at once. Back in the capital Goebbels found his headquarters a shambles. There were bloodstains everywhere. Unshaven and baggy-eyed, Hitler, Himmler and Hess reached Berlin around 11 a.m. and checked into an hotel near Potsdamer Platz. Hitler asked Wilk for a full report, then toured the city's SA units to test morale. He was jeered at some locations. That evening he invited the lesser commanders, and then Berlin's SA Oberführer Wetzel, to meet him in Goebbels' apartment. Hitler, Goebbels, Göring, and Himmler were present, but not Stennis. The Berlin SA commanders, recalled Himmler, trooped into Dr. Goebel's apartment that afternoon and acted in an incredibly rowdy manner toward the Führer. Gangs of SA men were chorusing slogans outside in the street. Stennis had probably staged the whole thing. For two hours they bandied allegations and counter-allegations. Rudolf Hess mentioned the odd fact that Stennis had a gun permit issued by the head of the political police, Wundes, and implied that he was a police agent, a belief which Goebbels came to share. Hitler ruled that Stennis would have to go. In the middle of the night however a Herculean figure, Richard Hareward, probably the toughest man in the Berlin Sturmabteilung, S.A., came clattering upstairs into Goebbels' apartment, flung a salute, and roared, Adolf, don't get tough with your own S.A., 30 urged by Hareward to give Stennis himself a hearing, Hitler reluctantly agreed. It lasted until 6 a.m., when Hitler sent for all the SA commanders once more and declared that he was going to cut their brown army rigorously in size. This was getting nowhere. Goebbels left to snatch an hour's sleep he had to be in court for yet another libel action that morning, he refused to offer any defense, was sentenced to prison, appealed. Exhausted and almost asleep on his feet he pleaded with Hitler once again to promise the SA whatever they demanded. Winning the election must come first. It was now Monday, September 1st. 
According to Goebbels' diary, at 4 p.m. Hitler took the decision he had urged, Stennis should stay. But he would dismiss Pfeffer as supreme commander, despite his resignation, and take over the SA himself, with the notorious Ernst Röhm as his chief of staff. A letter went to Stennis, and Stennis pledged loyalty. Taking selected SS men as an escort, Hitler spoke in the Veterans Building to his entire Berlin SA, promising to meet Stennis' fundamental demands. Police observers reported that Hitler, his voice cracking, appealed for unswerving loyalty, let us pray in this hour that nothing can divide us, and that God will help us against the devil, screamed Hitler. Almighty Lord, bless our fight. And the roars of Heil, so the police reported, had died away as the audience noticed their Führer's hands folded seemingly in prayer. The Gorings threw a little reception at Badenskstrasse afterwards. Stennis was not invited. The whole reconciliation had been a charade, as Goebbels had recommended to Hitler. This became plain from remarks made by the top Nazis at the reception. Everything shipshape, wrote Goebbels later that day. That's the end of the Stennis Putsch 36 they would, he added be drawing the necessary conclusions after the election. The campaign resumed. Germany had never seen a battle like this. Over the last two weeks the Nazis staged hundreds of dramatic meetings in the open air, in halls, by night, in marquees, by torchlight. Goebbels willingly spoke side by side with Gregor Strasser. His headquarters printed tens of millions of leaflets. The streets were carpeted with them. Sixty truckloads of Nazis careered around the capital tossing out pamphlets, Goebbels clambered from truck to truck, 13, his weak in court haranguing pedestrians through an amplifier and whipping on his men. The posters clearly betrayed his own handiwork. One contrasted unlovely photographs of all their thick-lensed oppressors pride of place being given to Dr. Weiss with majestic studio portraits of the top eleven Nazis. As for his own likeness, Goebbels placed this right next to Hitler's. Unemployment had been 2 million as the year opened. It would reach 4,380,000 as the year ended. Out with this rabble, cried Goebbels in Angriff. He hoped for a quarter of a million Nazi voters in Berlin. When Hitler came to the Sport Palace on September 10, 100,000 people applied for tickets. The photos show him with clenched fists raised orating into a box microphone some three feet in front of him, in Hermann Schaefer, Goebbels had now gained one of Europe's finest public address system technicians. With fanaticism like this, wrote Goebbels afterward, a nation can and will rouse itself again. He attributed the public curiosity to the SA mutiny. The SA must give up all political ambitions, he wrote after discussing the problem over supper with Hitler and Goring, now the party's liaison to the SA. All three Hitler, Goebbels, and Stennis were to be seen amiably sharing a meal the next day. On the final electioneering day, the 12th, the little Gau Leiter spoke at seven meetings motoring in his Mercedes supercharger from hall to hall, flanked by motorcycle outriders. Keep calm, he admonished himself. He had rented the Sport Palace for election night itself, September 14, 1930. By mid-evening the cavernous hall was rocking with cheers as the first results came in. Hitler had banked on winning 50 seats, or 80 at most. As midnight approached, the Nazis had already won 103. Exultant young men jogged around the hall with Goebbels on their shoulders. The final tally was 6,406,397 votes, entitling the Nazis to 107 seats. Suddenly the Nazis were the strongest party in Germany after the Social Democrats. This was democracy with a vengeance. The Communists however had also increased their share, from 10.6 to 13.1%. In Berlin the Nazis, with over 360,000 votes, had won 12.8% of the vote. Hot months lie ahead, predicted Goebbels. The Communists have gained 2.43 he is in grave danger of arrest. A month will pass before the Reichstag convenes and he is immune again. He needs to empty his fevered brain, and for this purpose female company is ideal. He flirts with Xenia, the best of all, he escorts Karen Goring, he accompanies the delightful Potempa twins, or phones Charlotte, 
and he gets to know not only the Weimar architect Professor Paul Schultzenaum but his lovely wife as well, and decides as often as he needs to that they are all madly in love with him. Horrified by the Nazis' election victories, Dr. Weiss's police show him no mercy. Five days after the election baton-wielding police fling Goebbels down the steps of a police station as he protests at their treatment of an SA man brought in for questioning. The courts set down five new cases for surely no coincidence Monday October 13, the very afternoon that the Reichstag is due to swear him in. The police are ordered to bring him in by force if need be. He takes refuge out at Erika's forest cottage, armed with a dispensation from his doctor. He hunkers down in the back of the Potempa's car to go to Weimar where Hitler speaks in the National Theatre, with Goring following as a somewhat implausible decoy in the supercharger. What wizard fellows these flyers are, enthuses Goebbels, changing his mind yet again. He drives back from Thuringia that Sunday night in the Schultz and Ambig's car, squeezed enjoyably between the professor's comely wife and her stepdaughter Babette, he sleeps at the Schultz and Ambig's and it is just as well for Dr. Weiss's police are meanwhile ransacking his lodgings in Wurtemergisk Strasse and lying in wait for him. October 13 comes. He lies doggo all morning writing up his diary. In three hours I am immune again, thank God. As Berlin's Nazis go on an orgy of destruction through the West End, smashing the windows of Jewish-owned stores on the Potsdamer Platz and in Kurfürstendamm an inspired move by the Gauleiter to distract Isidore he is driven at breakneck speed over to the Reichstag. Portals way, he shouts. Plain clothes detectives see him hobbling frantically up the long flight of steps to door two, wearing a light raincoat buttoned tightly to his neck, and grab at him just as he lurches through the great doors. The Gau official Hanno Konopath and a Reichstag flunky get a firm grip on him and bundle him inside. They have torn off his coat. Beneath it for the first time he is wearing the forbidden uniform of the Nazi party. He is once more immune, and he can do and say as he likes. 14, a blonde in the archives 14, a blonde in the archives after all the other deputies had taken their seats the Nazis marched in. Like Dr. Goebbels, all were wearing the forbidden brown shirt. A cacophony of insults greeted them. Five days later Chancellor Bruning set out his economic program. To packed benches the bull-headed, broad-shouldered Gregor Strasser delivered one of the best speeches of his life. Even Goebbels was impressed. The house pays the closest attention, he wrote with more than a soupkin of envy. Thus he's back again firmly in the saddle when the Nazis called repeatedly for votes of no confidence in Brüning. The Reichstag was then adjourned until early December. Goebbels was bored with it already. The fight had been the fun. The toxic haze of parliaments is not the right air for me, he decided. I can't breathe there. Back at his lodgings he revived himself with whiffs of the leader of Brahms and Wolf to which he provided his own piano accompaniment. Point two, with the political wind in Germany now beginning to blow brown, the highest police officials faced an ugly option, to smash the Nazis or to join them. The first alternative entailed facing the risk that the Nazis would gain power. Increasingly the middle-ranking officers decided that Germany's future lay with Goebbels and Hitler. According to Berlin's Aktur Abendblatt at least one senior police officer had been seen cheering the Nazis on during the riots of October 13, 1930 and singing a Nazi song. Albert Kortosinski wrote to Prussia's Prime Minister Braun that evening, protesting against this deliberate breakdown of police authority. Point three In grave times like these, he wrote, what counts is being tough tough as nails. If Skutspolizei Commander Heimansberg himself proved guilty then he too must go. If wrote Kortosinski, getting to his real point, Comrade Zorgibel Berlin's police president stands up for both these officers, we must not spare him either. Braun agreed, he dismissed Weintag as Minister of the Interior as well as Zorgibel, appointing Kortosinski in the latter's place. It's going to be some winter, commented Arigobels in his diary. But if these bastards think they can get us down with terror and persecution they've got another think coming for the mood at Alexander Platz, the Brownstone Police Headquarters in Berlin, was jubilant. Dr. Weiss personally welcomed back his fellow socialist Kortosinski at a little police ceremony. When we heard it was you, said the oily Dr. Weiss, 
the real power behind the scenes, we all cheered five he had turned 33. That month he recorded his first radio broadcast, debating international art with the renowned left-wing stage director Erwin Piscator. A new friend, Arnold Braunen, arranged both this interview and another two days later on neutrality in broadcasting and the cowardice of government's point six Fritz Prang, his old school friend, had given him a splendid radio and he sat up late marveling at the sounds coming from Rome or Copenhagen. Preferring the aristocracy to carry his bags for him, he had taken on the upright young Count Karl Hubert Schimmelmann as his private secretary. Point seven. His party headquarters in Hedmanstrasse was turning into a fortress. From the reception area one door to the right led to the quarters of the increasingly ill-humored S.A., the other to the left to his GAU headquarters. Uniformed men stood guard on each door. Visitors were taken through a locked and guarded doorway at the end of a short passage, past a long suite of rooms separated by shoulder-high glass partitions, to a side chamber off which more locked doors concealed three large rooms, in the very last of these sat the GAU lighter, Dr. Goebbels, in an otherwise empty room at a desk a full ten yards from the door. He could reach this room via a side staircase directly from the yard door where his new Mercedes delivered him each day. He installed the editorial offices of Angriff on the first floor of this building. From November 1, 1930 it appeared as a daily. Its masthead now read, Berlin's German evening paper. Months of wearying negotiations with Max Amon had preceded this innovation. Goebbels mistrusted the party's publisher, but in September a deal had been worked out giving Franz Eder Verlag 60% of the stock in Angriff and the Gau 40%. Goebbels retained editorial control. Point eight. The new rotary presses had been assembled at the printers, Susserat and Co. That afternoon, November 1, Dr. Goebbels found the printer's yard crowded with his Angriff salesmen all wearing smart uniforms with the newspaper's name picked out in silver on their red cap bands. The presses glistened with chrome and oil like a locomotive at a station. He gave a signal to start the presses rolling. Everybody saluted, and Horst Wessel's anthem echoed until drowned by the whirring and clanking machinery. Now a daily, the newspaper differed little from its predecessor except in topicality. Goebbels demanded relentless personal attacks on Dr. Weiss, and the editor Dr. Lippert complied. On November 3 the robust headline read Bernhard Weiss allocates nightclub concessions, his brother gets the bribes. The story dealt with Weiss's murky dealings with his criminal brother Conrad and an unrelated Jewish nightclub owner called Tog Weiss. On the 6th, as his headlines rhetorically asked Bernhard Weiss to resign, Goebbels privately rejoiced in his diary, Isidore is being destroyed. On November 8 Angriff reported that a communist had punched Zorgibel in the face, Sometimes, the newspaper editorialized, though not often, the acts of the communists are not entirely unwelcome to us. Nine for this licentious remark Grotesinski banned Angriff for one week. Goebbels was livid, his 14, a blonde in the archives newspaper would be banned on 15 more occasions before August 1932, for periods ranging from three days to six weeks. Grotesinski, bolder than his predecessor, banned several Goebbels meetings too. Rumors abounded that he would soon ban the party as well. Goebbels doubted the police would really try that now. Later in November the Sport Palace audience was treated to a double bill as he and Goring harangued them. I make short work of the Social Democrats, recorded Goebbels. The giant arena thunders with rage, hatred, and screams of revenge. How much further can this be pushed? 11 He envied Goring his easy access to wealth and high society. Already however a perceptible frost was settling over their relations. On October 9 he had written of Goring, he is a true comrade but not devoid of ambition. The day after the Reichstag had reconvened he commented privately, I rather fear that Fatso Gregor Strasser and Fatso Goring may shortly hit it off together. 12 Admittedly the aviator had introduced him to several useful contacts like Fritz Thyssen, the steel baron, the former airman Eric Neiman, head of Monus Steel, and Wilhelm Tengelmann, Rear Kohl. They would inject badly needed funds into the party in Berlin. But Hitler had now appointed Goring his personal viceroy in Berlin. This was bound to lead to friction with the Gau Leiter. As a Reichsleiter Goebbels in fact ranked somewhat higher than Goring in the party, 
and a heartier tone of mordant criticism crept into the diary entries. Victoria von Dirksen revealed confidentially to him that Goring was still having problems beating the recurring morphine addiction inflicted on him by Austrian doctors in 1923. Having already made observations about the aviator's evident corruption, he made a note to keep an eye on him. Entering his headquarters one day in November 1930 Goebbels sees a platinum blonde coming down the steps. Donnerwetter, Schimmel, he exclaims to his private secretary. Who was that? The blonde is working in his press clippings section. The next day he sends for her, to work on his confidential archives. She turns out to be wealthy, married, and 29 much older than his usual preference. She rates another diary mention on the 14th, helping to sort out early photographs. Thus he has finally met the woman he will marry. Other females will flit across his stage as, aged 33, he belatedly approaches manhood. He has detected the first gray hairs. There is his former secretary, the wondrous, goodly, attractive, and affectionate Ilse Stahl, who stays over one evening until 6 a.m., and, he writes, wholly sexually innocent, at that 17 she blushes the next day and he scribbles her a note, phone me at 7. But that evening he has a visit from another, the blonde actress Hella Cook, who is already married. His roaming eye alights on Olga Forster, the fiancée of his new friend the broadcaster Arnold Bronin. Olga, another petite actress, visits him alone a few days later and tries a much-worn female ploy she is engaged, she sighs, but does not really love her Arnold. But me, records Goebbels smugly, she likes a lot. He thinks of her that evening as he addresses the Gauss women's order the women all well behaved and the girls all spotless 19 he invites Bronen and his Olga to the movies and she visits him again the next day. She wheels out every available weapon in the arsenal of female seduction. He is a sitting duck. He is nest building for the new apartment that he and Xenia have found at Steglitz no Ambake Quell. He browses the furniture stores, determined to create a drawing room to rival Karen Goring's. His female admirers often come to see his performance in the Reichstag. And perform at last he does, on December 6 the touching and devoted Olga Forster comes round. She loves me madly, he resumes afterwards, to which he adds a nonchalant parenthesis, one, two, dot five days later Olga comes again as indeed does Goebbels, not once, twice, but thrice, three, four, five. 22 A week later she marries her Arnold Braunen and that is that. No regrets, writes Goebbels, not once, but TWICE 23 although it does pain him when a gossip columnist gets hold of the story and phones him about rumors that Olga's new husband has Jewish blood, Braunen assures Goebbels it is not so. For two months after his seduction Goebbels' private life is a flurry of former girlfriends. He has some catching up to do. He treats them one hopes, more kindly than he writes of them in his diary. Helping move to Stiglitz, Ilse is crowned by a falling equestrian bronze and her head bleeds profusely. She yammers on all evening, he writes heartlessly. I am quite reactionary, he confesses to the Bronins. Having, and raising, children is a job for life. My mother is the woman I most revere so close to life. Today women want a say in everything. They just don't want children anymore. They call it Emancipation 25 in December 1930 Goebbels staged his most effective propaganda demonstration yet, against the Ufa film version of All Quiet on the Western Front. The movie was pacifist and anti-German, its author had already emigrated. In one scene, German soldiers were depicted haggling with a dying comrade whose legs had been shot away, over who should inherit his new boots. At its first public showing on the 5th, Goebbels' S.A. men emptied the cinema with stink bombs and live mice. The Nazis found Berlin's police, many of them ex-army officers, in broad sympathy with them. Angriff reported laconically that their doctor had been present for informational purposes, and planned to see the rest of the movie for informational purposes on Sunday evening. His men took the hint and trashed the movie theater while thousands of cheering Berliners looked on. The management cancelled the next performance after that. Even Moss's Berliner Tageblatt dared not to criticize, 
because this time the Gao Lighter had the people behind him. On the seventh the movie theater tried again. Gobel staged another spontaneous riot. He called for further protests the next night. The police cordoned off entire districts. This time, he estimated, 40,000 Berliners turned out to protest against the movie, 14, a blonde in the archives opposing newspapers put the figure at 6,000. Under pressure from Grotesinski the Prussian Minister of the Interior Severing banned all open-air demonstrations. On the 11th the Reichstag itself debated the situation. Goebbels was evicted from the building, but the victory was his. At 4 p.m. the Brüning government ordered the objectionable movie withdrawn from distribution because of the danger to Germany's image abroad, then adjourned until February 3, 1931 We are going to be on the verge of power soon, assessed Goebbels on December 2, 1930. But what then? A tricky question. He mistrusted the alliance that Hitler was forming. Strasser warned the Nazi Reichstag bloc that they were making too much headway in bourgeois circles and that this would taint the party's image, bravo, Strasser, observed Goebbels to himself. At a function at the Gorings afterward he had a long talk with Strasser, trying to find common ground with this impressive politician. I want to bury the hatchet, wrote Goebbels, and I think he does too. 32 he celebrated a pagan Christmas with the SA around a Yuletide bonfire at Skinnerland. But he spent Christmas Eve with the Gorings, who had less time for such pagan rites. Karen gave him a fine porcelain bowl, decorated with white mice. Her husband's morphine addiction caused him real concern, and he mentioned it to Hitler. Hitler said he would take Goring under his wing. Turning to grand strategy Goebbels warned that their party was in danger of losing momentum it was approaching freezing point, as he put it. We must start a crescendo of operations. And he did, in July the red flag had challenged him to a public debate, knowing full well that for him to accept would be to invite arrest. His immunity restored, he now challenged both the Social Democrats and the Communists to debate before a working-class audience at Friedrich Schein. A thousand Communists turned up on January 22, 1931. Their ace propagandist Walter Ulbricht spoke for nearly an hour. The communists then pitched into their rivals with chair legs and broken bottles, while Goebbels and his Nazis held their ground. In Goebbels' narrative, Dolbricht fled whimpering to the SA stewards for protection, before leaving the hall with his jacket over his head. They banked on brawn instead of brain, mocked Goebbels in Angriff, then found that where they had arms, our SA men didn't exactly have liverwursts dangling at their sides. There were over 100 injured including his chauffeur Kunis and Olga Bronen, who was taken to hospital with concussion. A quavering voice phones him in the small hours, after the riot, Olga, calling from the hospital. Goebbels remains callous and aloof. Ilse Hess writes, chiding him for his attitude to women and holding up Karen Goring as a shining example of feminine supportiveness. Goebbels replies evasively promising to look the Hesses up more often in 1931. He plans to spend three days every fortnight down in Munich then. Unfortunately my sister won't be able to come either to Munich or Berlin, his letter continues. She has to keep my mother company she's feeling very lonely since my father died 36 for the first time since he was at university he has not gone home for Christmas, guiltily suggesting in his diary that he must spare his mother the risk. He moves into middle-class Steglitz on the first day of 1931. It is a well-appointed two-room apartment. Meanwhile one woman has by her beauty and sheer force of personality crowded out her junior's Magda Quant, the platinum blonde working in his private archives, which consist of press clippings from all over the world. There is a perfumed classiness about her. She finds herself drawn toward this Savonarola who has set all Berlin by the ears. Late in January his diary records that she is bringing her work on the archives round to his new Steglitz apartment. Knowledge is power, he explains to Magda, gesturing toward the clipping's files. She reminds him inevitably of a younger, classier Enka. The other girls' names gradually fade from the diary's pages. Charlotte stalks around with a face like thunder. When Magda visits him again, Goebbels finds himself wishing that she were in love with him. Two weeks later, 
the wish becomes father of the deed. 15, Maria Magdalena Quant 15, Maria Magdalena Quant Magda Quant was later the object of much malicious tittle-tattle. She was first married to a crook, sneered Prince Otto von Bismarck, a German diplomat, and earned money through prostitution. Later she became Goebbels' friend, but this did not prevent her from going to bed with many of the habitués of the party meetings at the sport palace. Now she goes around looking for men, and when she does not suffice there is also her sister-in-law Elo Quant, who is another whore one none of this was true. Magda had been born in Berlin on November 11, 1901. She believed her father was Oscar Richel, an engineer, an inventor, of strict Catholic upbringing. Her mother Augusta Berend was 22, an unmarried servant girl of the Evangelical Lutheran faith working for a family in Berlin's upmarket Bülow Strasse.2 In fact she later gave this street as Magda's birthplace, while her birth certificate puts it in a working-class suburb at No Katzeller Strasse.3 Augusta was in Goebbels' words a frightful person, for she was probably never married to Richel. In later years she was curiously vague about their divorce stating that it was when Magda was about three the word about seems to cast doubt upon the precision of the matrimony itself. 5. It is unlikely that a man of ritual standing would have married a servant girl. 6. In a codicil to his will he mentioned his first wife Hedwig, but no others. 7. To Goebbels, ritual was always a skewbiak, a scoundrel, and wretched prig. 8. Since ritual was living in Belgium, Augusta chose the infants. Names herself Johanna Maria Magdalena, or Magda for short. Ritchell arranged for the girl to be raised from 1906 in an Ursuline boarding school at Tildonk in Belgium. Augusta visited her behind these forbidding and often chilly walls with Friedlander, her Jewish boyfriend whom she had, perhaps, married in 1908. Nine upset by the draftiness of Magda's dormitories her mother transferred her to another Ursuline boarding school, Virgo Fidelis, at Vilvoorde. Her placid existence was interrupted by the Great War. The expatriates in Brussels were shipped home to Germany in evil-smelling cattle trucks. It took six days for the Friedlander family they had all adopted his name to reach Berlin. In a refugee camp an East Prussian woman, a MRS Kowalski, read Magda's palm. You will one day be a queen of life, she pronounced. But the ending is fearful. Magda, always a romantic, often retold this prophecy. She dramatized it sometimes, making the fortune teller a gypsy, and having her appear mysteriously aboard the refugee train. Friedlander became manager, or perhaps only an employee, of the Four Star Eden Hotel in Berlin. Their milieu was Jewish, Magda's first real friend was Lisa Arlazorov, whose parents were Ukrainian Jews living in Wilmersdorf. Richel paid for his daughter to attend Berlin's Call Morgan Lise and sent her 300 marks as monthly pocket money. Friedlander, the German Jew, faded from the picture and history is not entirely sure what became of him. Asterisk in the autumn of 1919 Magda Friedlander matriculated and was found a place at the exclusive ladies' college run by Frau Els Holtausen in Klausdor Promenade in Goslar. Even at 19 she was a girl of considerable presence. Traveling down to Goslar on February 18, 1920 she shared the reserved compartment of a Dr. Gunter Quant, a prematurely balding, wealthy entrepreneur just twice her age. His first wife had died in a flu epidemic two years before, leaving him with two sons, Helmut and Herbert, he related all this to Magda during the train journey. Strongly taken by this teenage girl with the foreign allure, he visited the college more than once, claiming to be her uncle and took the matron and Magda out for rides in his open landau. She dropped out of college, and phoned him instead, one thing led to another, and she invited her mother out to his lakeside villa at Babelsberg, outside Berlin. Events moved rapidly toward matrimony. As a first step Quant required her birth certificate to be amended so that she was declared the legitimate daughter of Richel, to expunge the undesirable name Friedlander. Richel lodged the necessary application in mid-1920. As a second step, Quant required his bride to embrace the Protestant faith. They were married on January 4, 1921 at Richel's parental house in Godesberg. After the honeymoon, said her mother later, Magda rushed into her arms wailing, How could you have let me marry him, 
16 but as their first and only child Harold was born just 10 months later the matrimonial ardor evidently flickered just long enough. Gunter Quant was old for his age. Escorting her to concerts or the theater he usually fell asleep behind the Berliner Bersanzi tongue. The boardroom was his true world. Once when she, with girlish pride, produced her meticulous household accounts he absentmindedly signed them in red ink, seen and approved. Gunter Quant. She rapidly tired of his company. Even when he went on business trips to exotic locations like Egypt or Palestine she was reluctant to go with him. He wrote her regularly from abroad, she replied only once. She began a furtive relationship with his eldest son Helmut. Sexually unfulfilled, the 23-year-old Magda was fatally attracted to this gifted and delicate young man, then aged only 18. Her husband found it wise to send young Helmut to complete his studies in London and Paris. After an operation for appendicitis in Paris, complications set in and Helmut died tragically in her arms in 1927. Heartbroken, she accompanied her husband on a asterisk probably he died in Buchenwald in 1939. See Appendix, page 696 FF15, Maria Magdalena Quant's six-month tour of the Americas, taking their big red Maybach car everywhere they went. Standing next to the balding, blazered, bow-tied millionaire Quant this board, blue-eyed blonde was a star attraction in high society on both sides of the border. Something intimate evidently passed between Magda and the former President Herbert Hoover's nephew, because he came to Berlin after her estrangement from Quant and pleaded with her to marry him. Back in Berlin, Quant settled down and purchased a roomy winter home in Charlottenburg, while keeping on their new villa at New Babelsberg for the summer. Magda took refuge from her boredom in books buying a ten-volume Buddhist catechism one day in Leipzig and wafted from store to store, from one empty social event to the next until she could stand it no longer. In the summer of 1929 she embarked on an affair with a 30-year-old law student, a Jew. She pleaded in vain with Quant to release her. Hoping to catch him in some infidelity, she had him watched, but equally in vain. The student was a perfect and attentive lover, plying her with flowers, and she accompanied him on a trip to the Hotel Dresen at Godesberg. This time however Quant had hired the detectives, after reading their report, he threw her out. Penniless and unemployed Magda returned to her mother while she negotiated a settlement with Quant. Ello Quant, her sister-in-law, advised her to blackmail her aging husband about a bundle of papers she had found. It proved unnecessary, however. He remained a perfect gentleman, agreed to a divorce, and willingly accepted the fiction that he had contributed to the breakdown of the marriage. Do we not all, he would write, at times assume the blame, when in fact we are not in the wrong, 23 until she should remarry he granted her custody of their son, a lavish 4,000 mark monthly allowance, and 50,000 marks to purchase a house. She leased a seven-room luxury apartment at No. 2 Reichskanzler Platz in West Berlin. There could be no question of marrying her unemployed student lover marriage to anybody would cut off her alimony cornucopia. So she lived, loved, and traveled around as her law student's paramour while privately planning her future without him. Drinking heavily one evening at the Nordic Ring Club she met the Hohenzollern Prince August Wilhelm, Goebbels' comrade, Awi, who had now joined the SA with a suitably high rank. The prince suggested that the party needed people like her. She heard Goebbels speak soon after, fascinated. She enrolled at the Nazi Party's minuscule West End branch run by the young engine driver's son Karl Hanka. Her party membership dated from September 1, 1930. She found herself taking charge of the local women's order. From there she gravitated to headquarters at No Hedmanstrasse. With her above-average education she was appointed secretary to Dr. Hans Mainshausen, Goebbels' deputy as Gau Leiter. Goebbels, it must be said had little going for him at this time. He was a cripple, his total monthly salary was one-eighth of Magda's monthly alimony, but she heard him speak again, and she passed him once as he came limping up the steps. I thought I might almost catch fire, she told her mother excitedly, under this man's searching, almost devouring, gaze 26 she told Elo Quant that to judge by his suit Goebbels was obviously in need of, well, 
Mothering. A few weeks later it struck Gunter Quant, who still frequently met her, that she talked of nothing but the Nazis. At first I thought it was just a passing fad for the oratorical gift of Dr. Goebbels, he wrote. Her law student lover also noticed, and flared that she seemed to be losing her head to that clubfoot loudmouth. You're mad, she snapped. I could never love Goebbels, Goebbels had other preoccupations right now. At the end of January 1931 an SA man had gunned down the Berlin communist Max Schirmer, four days later Nazis shot dead the communist Otto Gruberi in a Charlottenburg street fight. On February 4 police chief Grotesinski banned Angriff for two weeks. Goebbels was also down with flu. What sickened him even more than this was how close to the communists he found his position really was. After one Reichstag interruption on the 5th the Social Democrat rounded on him with the stinging rejoinder, that is from a gentleman fully aware that Messrs Hitler, Frick, Jung, etc., have been to the Ruhr several times to explain their National Socialist program to the gentlemen of heavy industry and to demonstrate that they have nothing to fear from the National Socialist brand of socialism. A few days later the government revoked the immunity of 300 deputies, including all the Nazis. Goebbels alone had eight criminal cases pending. He recommended to his colleagues that rather than just becoming poorly paid extras they should walk out en masse. Their salaries would stop, but the tactics were undeniably sound. The move would demonstrate to voters that the Nazis dissociated themselves from the government's rule by emergency decree. On February 10 the Nazis marched in remained standing while their bloc leader Franz Storr read out the tough declaration which Goebbels had formulated then marched out again. After that, 100 police officers raided Hedmanstrasse and searched the building. Goebbels' Lustgarten rally of the 15th was banned on the usual pretext, danger to peace and quiet. Your peace and quiet, swore Goebbels in his diary, will be endangered soon enough. 28 It has been a tense and angry week for Dr. Goebbels in the Reichstag. At its end Magda Quant comes round to see him in his new, luxurious Steglitz apartment. He finds himself captivated by this woman. Her dress is subtle, her whole posture is that of a person who now knows where she is going. It is a Saturday February 14, 1931 and Goebbels enters certain code phrases, circumlocutions, into his diary which show that this visit is not for mere archival gossip, and stays for a very long time, he carefully records. And, how are you, my queen? The answer follows. 1. Magda has seduced him, after Olga only the second girl in his life to do so. Sunday finds him in a trance, 15, Maria Magdalena Quant or replete with satiated happiness, as he writes. Magda writes him a fond note the next day. Magda Quant returns to her elegant leased apartment and servants, and Dr. Goebbels goes over to Dortmund where 20,000 people are waiting to hear him. In Hamburg he speaks to 12,000. His mind is on her. When he speaks at Weimar, Anka's Weimar, he takes Magda with him. He phones Anka, speaks tersely with her, and decides that he can't stand her whining and her a lack of discipline any longer. Now that he has Magda he can afford to be standoffish. He takes Magda to the automobile show in Berlin. She wants to buy a new car, but can't make up her mind. Does she buy him one? Suddenly he has a new opal, it has been stolen already by March 9th. They have the usual rose. Magda writes a farewell note. Goebbels has seen it all before the same old melody, he writes, amused. He can handle it. She comes round for a very formal talk and flounces out as though to leave. Goebbels holds the door open for her. You are so hard, she murmurs, and relents. She visits several times during March 1931, chats, laughs, makes music with him, meals for him, and occasionally love. On the 9th he adds, 2, 3, to his score, and 5 days later, 4, 5. But mysteries abound. She is often sick, she does not yet invite him back to her own fine apartment in Reichskanzler Platz. Sometimes she is inexplicably away or does not answer her phone. Jealousy wells up within him. 
At this time the adventure probably means very little to her, but not to him. Goebbels convinces himself that he has drawn a historic line under his philanderings. I'm going to stop the womanizing, he writes secretly on March 15, and favor just the one in Hamburg the Gauleiter Karl Kaufmann had once remarked to Goebbels that Bruning for one considered Goring mad. Goring had certainly been unbalanced by Karen's near-fatal illness during January 1931. After visiting her sickbed Goebbels wrote that he revered her, a word he had used before only for his mother. He was alarmed by Goring's character regression, probably a result of his addiction. We've got to get him into a mental clinic in time, he wrote despairingly. He mustn't go to the dogs like this. 38 Hitler promised to tackle Goring about the morphine. But the aviator's behavior worsened to outright megalomania. He alternates, observed Goebbels in February 1931, between imagining he's Reich Chancellor and imagining he's Defense Minister. Today he's just ludicrous. After both men spoke at Essen to an audience of 16,000, including the industrialists Krupp and Thyssen, Goring accompanied him back to Berlin but refused to discuss his drug problem. The Gauleiter's remarks about him took on a bitter edge. After they had both addressed some 25,000 people in Frankfurt, Goebbels wrote that Goring had spoken the usual crap. 41 Sunday he again tackled Goring about the addiction, the aviator's spluttered denials were too thin to be plausible to Goebbels. They separated that evening half friends again, as Goebbels noted, in which was implicit that they were now half enemies. On March 6, 1931 the Gauleiter addressed another huge meeting at the Sport Palace. His audience greeted Grotesinski's two police observers with roars of out, lasting several minutes, and Goebbels heaped his own special kind of ridicule on them. On the following day Angriff repeated his words verbatim. Seeking public sympathy, on the 13th he staged a stupid bomb plot, Having ordered the SA man Edward Weiss to open all mail addressed to him at headquarters he arranged for a crude homemade device to be delivered to him there. Although there is no doubt about Goebbels' authorship of the attack, he lied to his own diary about it. More court actions crowded in on him eight altogether during March. On March 14 the Reichstag decided that he could be arrested after all. The courts declared severing span on the brown shirt uniform in Prussia unconstitutional. On the 15th Grotesinski nevertheless repeated the ban, and he imposed a speaking prohibition on Goebbels in Berlin, in revenge for the Sport Palace episode. He instructed his police to prevent the Gauleiter from speaking to transport workers in Hassenheide the next night. Hitting back, Angriff instructed Berlin's Nazis to wear their uniforms and to sue Grotesinski if he ordered any arrests. The next day, two Nazis gunned down a communist deputy in Hamburg. The press called for a general ban on the party, and the speaking ban on Goebbels was extended to the whole of Prussia. After that Bruning's emergency decrees could no longer contain the rising discontent. Goebbels arrived at one huge Königsberg rally to find that he had been banned from even entering the hall, where 12,000 had gathered to hear him. Thousands of cheering East Prussians escorted him and Prince August Wilhelm back to the railroad station, carrying the little doctor shoulder high up to the platform. As he climbed onto a bench, a police major ordered truncheons drawn and thirty of his officers waited in, laying out both Goebbels and the prince. The incident was widely reported abroad. Magda Quant visited the injured Gauleiter upon his return to Berlin, and her accomplishments in bed that night, six, seven, made up for his bruises. In his diary he passed over the irritable letters from Hella Cook, from Erika and from Charlotte almost without comment. I now love just one, he wrote. When Hitler now invited him down to the Obersalzburg for Easter, Goebbels surprisingly turned him down. His notes had recently contained several disparaging references to that damned party home, the brown house, to Hitler's coffeehouse mentality and milieu, and to the Fuhrer's softness and fanatical compromising nature. He spent Easter with Magda instead, and added two more notches to the score, eight, nine, nine times in six weeks. At 15, Maria Magdalena Quant was not, perhaps, enough to justify the jackrabbit reputation which posterity would endow him with, and which he had carefully encouraged. On March 26, the Reichstag adjourned for nearly seven months. 
Two days later Bruning issued an emergency decree allowing his government to ban any meetings, and to censor the leaflets and posters of any party. And Bruning is Goring's friend, commented Goebbels sarcastically. He did not mind the ban on speaking. At the Big Sport Palace meeting on March 27 the recording of his latest speech was played. But he did fear a ban on his newspaper, which was now printing 80,000 12-page copies a day. The Supreme Court declared Grotesinski's latest ban illegal. Meanwhile Hitler appealed to all his followers to avoid being provoked into illegal actions. This was particularly addressed to the SA. The taut relationship between them and the party overhung Goebbels throughout that spring. He was torn between loyalty to Hitler, and his gratitude to these long-suffering street fighters. In Munich Hitler had confided to him in October 1930 that he was gradually going to reconstruct the SA and recover total control of it. But Goebbels found it hard not to sympathize with the criticisms of Munich voiced by his Berlin SA men. Their plight was unenviable, two-thirds of them were unemployed, including their Oberführer Bruno Wetzel. While in Breslau one SA Sturm could not go on parade in the snow because they had no boots, they heard of the opulence of Hitler's new headquarters in Munich and of elite new SS units being raised which were no longer subordinate to the SA as they should have been. Both Walter Stennis, the supreme SA commander in eastern Germany including Berlin, and his subordinate commanders were already deeply concerned about Munich's wretched waffling about legality and Hitler's persistent wooing of the bourgeois parties. When Hitler now demanded that the SA membership cough up another 4,000 marks for a painting to go in his study, they were baffled. At the end of November 1930 Hitler had revealed to his party lieutenants his latest plans for the SA. He was now their commander, with the pallid, flabby Ernst Röhm as his chief of staff. Goebbels had vaguely known Rome since 1924 and had read his memoirs, A Traitor's Story. After Rome's return from Bolivia, he had entered in his diary, He's nice to me and I like him. An open, upright soldier type. Two weeks later, he added, He's a dear fellow, but no match for Stennis. 63 Stennis, however, noticed only that Rome was a blatant homosexual, who made few friends other than other notorious homosexuals like Karl Ernst and his lover Paul Rarbein. Stennis had nothing but contempt for Rome and his unmanly ways. Dr. Goebbels deduced that Hitler intended to phase out the regional SA commanders like Stennis. He suspected that Stennis was plotting to set up a revolutionary free corps proof, he felt, how naive these fellows are about politics 66 but Goebbels was even more naive. He solemnly tipped off Rome in January 1931 that Rarbein was a homosexual, and noted afterward that Rome was very concerned 67 only six weeks later did he learn the truth about Rome from Stennis. Disgusting, he expostulated in his diary his own sexuality being at last a matter of record. Here too Hitler is paying too little attention. The party must not be allowed to become a paradise for Pufter's 68 fearing Stennis growing influence meanwhile, Hitler removed several SA regions. North Saxony, East Prussia, Danzig, and Mecklenburg, from his control. Stennis sent a long letter of complaint to Rome, causing Goebbels to wonder if Stennis was not biting off more than he could chew. Rome personally came to Berlin and there was a furious row with Stennis which ended with a categorical refusal by the SA commander to swear obedience to Rome. This put Goebbels in a dilemma. Not only did he need the SA stormtroopers, they provided much of the staff of Angriff too. In Munich on March 23 Ernst Röhm told him he was going to get rid of critics like Captain Stennis. Goebbels was horrified and urged both Hitler and Röhm not to do it. But Hitler's loyalty was to Röhm, his old and intimate friend. In his diary, Goebbels began writing alibis, if there's got to be a clean break, he recorded on March 25th, then I'm with Hitler. At the same time he told Stennis men that he was with them. He had no choice but to equivocate. The Berlin SA was approaching flashpoint. All their hatreds were mirrored in the sarcastic Samis. Newsletters which now began to circulate in Berlin. One dated March 20 referred mockingly to our own Aryan son Dr. Goebbels, whom race experts have branded an Israelite, and described cruelly how he had left one meeting early via a back door on account of his aching paw. 73 This SA crisis came to a head in the last week of March 1931. Karl Hanka, 
the young and virile commander of Gobel's West End district, told him of rumors that Rome was about to dismiss Stennis. Fearing this would bring his empire tumbling down, Gobel said he would fight tooth and claw to prevent it. Stennis had gone to Pomerania that Tuesday, March 31st, ostensibly to cool down S.A. hotheads. In his absence, a telegram arrived in Berlin ordering all his senior officers to Weimar for a meeting with Hitler. It was clear that he was about to dismiss Stennis. According to police intelligence, he also intended to relieve Goebbels as Gau Leiter. Goebbels had already left to speak in Dresden, from there he drove straight on to Weimar, to see Hitler. This may be the occasion which Elsa Bruckmann later related when Hitler had planned to sack Goebbels for disloyalty whereupon the Gau Leiter threw himself whining at his feet in a most unworthy manner. On balance Hitler decided to keep Goebbels, but nothing could save Stennis. Wetzel, the Berlin SA commander, had already received a phone call at around 8.30 p.m. reporting that Rome had ordered Stennis dismissal. Wetzel's men decided to defy Hitler's summons to Weimar. At 4 a.m. Kurt Deljuch, the regional SS chief, SS Oberführer Ost, typed an urgent warning to Rome, reporting that since midnight these local SA commanders had 15, Maria Magdalena Quant been meeting in secret cabal in Berlin, and that mutiny was once again in the air. Deluge in fact suspected that Stennis was acting in cahoots with the government, because the mutineers had learned perhaps through government wiretaps of Hitler's intentions. John has told them, reported Deluge to Rome, referring to Stennis' chief of staff, that Stennis is to be dismissed by our Führer at a meeting in Weimar at midday today April 1. The mutineers, he added, had decided to defy Hitler and send a delegation to Goebbels in Weimar to win him over for an independent freedom movement 78 things were thus in an unholy mess. It was now April 1, 1931. At about 4.30 a.m. Stennis arrived back in Berlin from Pomerania. A few hours later he was wakened with news that the papers were reporting he had been dismissed. He discounted the story and went back to sleep. Meanwhile his commanders in Berlin went on the rampage, mutinied, and seized Goebbels' Gau headquarters and the Angriff editorial offices in the Hedmannstrasse building. Thus the second Stennis putsch began. Perhaps this is a misnomer. Stennis himself was still largely in the dark. At 2.30 p.m. he received first a registered letter from Rome dismissing him, then orders from Hitler to go to Weimar. But the fat was already in the fire. This time the S.A.S. political actions met with active support from both Goebbels' staff and the Angriff's employees. Dr. Ludwig Weissauer published a statement in the newspaper backing Stennis. Whatever Goebbels' private feelings, however, he knew which side his bread was buttered. He wrote unhesitatingly in his diary, I stand loyal to Hitler. The SA must come into line. He applied for a court order to evict the SA trespassers from the building. Stennis was still floundering. He sent this telegram to Hitler in Weimar, is Rome's dismissal order valid, i.e., backed by you, signed Stennis. Hitler responded ambiguously, you are not to ask questions but having received a proper order are to report to Weimar at once with the commanders as listed signed Adolf Hitler. By now Deluge was also in Weimar. Hitler gave Goebbels sweeping powers to smash the putsch in Berlin, regardless of consequences, and to dismiss the disruptive elements regardless of rank or office in the party. You have my backing, he wrote in this document. Whatever you do 80 at that evening's public meeting in Weimar both Goebbels and Deluge swore undying loyalty to Hitler. In Berlin meanwhile Stennis had printed thousands of handbills announcing that Goebbels was sacked as Gau Leiter for breach of faith and replaced by Wetzel, the handbill once more rubbed in the Brown House scandal. Ignoring frantic appeals from his headquarters to return to Berlin, Goebbels went south to Munich, sharing a railroad compartment with Hitler. Hitler was undoubtedly shaken by these events. The next day's bourgeois press crowed over his embarrassment. In an article in the VB he vigorously attacked Stennis for his treachery. Goebbels now wondered which dark powers might have bribed Stennis and Weissauer to act as they had. The party later obtained copies of urgent Berlin police instructions ordering police officers not to seize Stennis' handbills announcing his takeover. Hitler signed an authorization for Goebbels to act ruthlessly in purging his Berlin Gau. 
better no national socialist movement at all, this read, than a party in disarray, without discipline, or obedience 85 it was time for backbiting all round. Hearing that Göring had pleaded with Hitler to give these powers to him, Goebbels noted, I'll never forgive Göring. He's a mound of frozen crap 86 acting from Munich headquarters, he issued appeals for loyalty and sacked the mutinous SA men. Stennis took perhaps 200 others with him, and began a brief flirtation with Dr. Otto Strasser. Worried and ill Goebbels finally slunk back to Berlin on Wednesday, April 8, 1931. Paul Schultz, who had replaced Stennis, assured him that the Berlin SA now stood behind him. Goebbels' five district commanders confirmed that evening that not one party official had defected, only SA men. Addressing his officials on the 10th he explained why he had put so much distance between himself and Berlin during the crisis. During a battlefield crisis, he said, the generals did not go into the mutinous trenches either. Of course the whole Jewish press is shrieking with glee, he realized privately, and confined himself to bed with a thermometer for company. 16, The Stranger and the Shadow 16, The Stranger and the Shadow The thermometer's mercury thread has climbed to 40 degrees Celsius. Goebbels is ill, but Magda phones only once, saying she's at the Quant estate in Mecklenburg. Point one, he struggles out of bed on the Friday, April 10, 1931, to speak to 2,000 party officials. On Saturday he learns that she is back in Berlin, she does not contact him. Ilse and Olga fuss around the invalid. He is too weak to resist. On Sunday he phones Magda's home. She is not there, later however she phones him, and admits that she has been seeing off a young lover but he has brought things to a head and fired a revolver at her. She tells Goebbels she is injured, in fact the Jewish law student's bullet has struck the door frame next to her. If you had really aimed at me and hit me, she scoffs, I might have been impressed. I find your behavior ridiculous, point two too late Goebbels realizes how much he loves her. Must he always be lonely? These and other thoughts lay siege to him. He spends Sunday pining for her and writing a gripping description of his jealous delirium. Perhaps thirty times he telephones her home, but nobody answers. He glares at the phone, willing it to ring. Staying home on Monday the 13th he at last reaches her by phone. They drive out to a remote forest house at Pitchelsdorf. She pours out her heart about the grief her crazed ex-lover has caused her. She answers his reproaches with floods of tears, the last resort of feminine culpability, but she wishes to spend Saturday with the other man, to say farewell. She refuses Goebbels' ultimatum to spend that Saturday with him. Thus it is over, writes Goebbels. Unconsciously scriptwriting again, he adds, she exits weeping 3 on the 12th he had returned to Gao headquarters for the first time since the putsch. Everybody was very kind to him and the SA stood smartly to attention. But there were problems. The account books showed that Angriff was deep in debt. Point 4 he instructed Hans Hinkel, Weissauer's successor, to cut back its size from 12 to 8 pages. Point 5 his deputy Mainzhausen warned that Goring was double-crossing them. Goebbels needed few warnings on that score. Point six. The next morning he was back in court, charged with having said in a speech at the Veterans Building in 1929, We don't speak of corruption in Berlin or Bolshevism at City Hall. No. We just say is it or Weiss, and that says it all. 7. He was fined 200 marks on one count, 1500 marks for having picked on Weiss because of his Jewish origins, still running a high fever, he limped out. He suspected traitors everywhere. Keep on marching he penned into his diary. Don't look back, 8 there seemed no end to the court actions. On the 17th he was fined 2,000 marks, then 500, and finally 100 more for contempt of court. More summonses were heaped onto his desk. Point 9 he resolved to take revenge on all the Isidores of this world when the time came. A severe depression seized him a mental crisis which he acknowledged only when he deemed that it had passed. Magda's shenanigans had triggered it. There was a shadow still lurking around her apartment. Apparently she had had a stormier past than the comparatively innocent Dr. Goebbels had suspected. Insane with jealousy, he trusted nobody. 
the word spy surfaced more often in his diary. He searched for them at his headquarters, he even suspected Hinkle, his political life seemed more arduous than ever, a constant round of strange hotel beds briefly sighted at 3 a.m., of 6 a.m. railroad platforms for the return to Berlin, of persecution, court hearings, prohibitions, and the constant fear of violence or even assassination. Kretosinski enforced a new three-month ban on Goebbels speaking which sometimes meant listening to the pompous and vapid Hermann Göring standing in for him. Hitler now entrusted the aviator Göring with important missions abroad. In May 1931 he visited Rome and returned with a signed photograph of Mussolini for the Führer. Jack of all trades, sniffed Goebbels, meaning master of none. Eight more court appearances faced him late that April. Maddening, he recorded. But I'm not going to lose my nerve. 13 at Itzaho near Hamburg he faced a four-month prison sentence but was acquitted. Squirming under Gretesinski's speaking ban, on April 25 he reluctantly signed an undertaking not to make fun of the police observers assigned to his meetings anymore. Another hearing was scheduled at Moabit for April 27. He notified the court however that he could not miss an important Nazi meeting in Munich. But the Berlin courts had issued a bench warrant after his non-appearance. As he was eating at the Rose Garden Hotel three detectives arrested him and escorted him to the night train to Berlin. So much for immunity, he fumed. With a barmet, a scleruk, and a kudisker, declared Angriff that morning, referring to the Jewish racketeers, they didn't go to such lengths. But then they weren't the elected representatives of 60,000 Germans just major embezzlers. Sixteen press photographers crowded the platform as the train arrived back in Berlin. The Juden press is howling with joy, Goebbels noted. In room 664 at the Moabit courthouse, Angriff helpfully told its readers where the eight new cases were to be heard, the world's press awaited him. He told the judges what he thought of them, then sat down and refused to speak another word. He was given a month's suspended jail sentence, and heavy fines. Choking with rage he lodged an appeal. 16. The stranger and the shadow to his lawyer he snarled, indicating the prosecutor Dr. Stenyk, let's make a note of that man for later 19 May brought still more cases. But daylight was filtering into this long dark tunnel of police harassment. On June 12 he was again acquitted. The courts, he gloated, are getting a whiff of things to come a reference to the growing likelihood that Bruning's days in office were numbered. Then it's our turn 21 keeping a tryst with Magda at the five-star Kaserhof Hotel, he recognizes that the other man, the shadow, is still coming between them. Fretting, he spends his evenings alone at Steglitz fingering his piano keyboard, leafing idly through a book, or fitfully dozing. He phones countless times without reaching her. After one colossal sport palace gathering she invites him back to her own luxurious apartment for the first time. The shadow has gone. Her elegant suite of seven rooms includes a music room, and quarters for her guests and servants. He decides that the worst is over between them. His diary soon finds him making plans for the future with her, and he is no longer keeping score. Shadows flit in and out from his own past. Magda remains a vexatious enigma still, often inexplicably unpunctual for their dates. Once she tells him that a stranger has warned her that Dr. Goebbels is a Jew, and has shown her an original letter stolen from the Gao headquarters files written a decade earlier by Goebbels to director Conan, a family friend at Menken Gladbach. Conan was the Gao lighter's real father, suggests the stranger, who also mentions Peter Simons the husband of Goebbels' maternal aunt Anna. This is what I have to put up with, winces Goebbels, puzzling over the stranger's identity. The stolen document is probably a product of Magda's own feline snooping around while working in his personal archives, but this evidently does not occur to him. The two spent Witson on her ex-husband's estate, Severin in Mecklenburg, Gunter Quant's manager, a leading local Nazi, lets them in. Alone at last they iron out their remaining differences. Sometimes she still wounds him with an ill-considered word, but the wound soon heals. He longs for a hearth and home. He begins talking about setting up a matrimonial home when victory is theirs, this is comfortingly vague, and she goes along with that. After he returns to Berlin alone, 
as she has asked to stay on for another day in this country idol he writes, when we have conquered the Reich we shall become man and wife 27 In fact Magda probably entertained little real ambition to harness her uxorial ambitions to such an uncertain chariot. He writes her a real love letter the first such essay in ten years. Visiting her to give her a clock a few days later, he is thunderstruck to find the shadow still living there, Magda tells him that since the student will not budge, she is moving out and will have the police evict the trespasser. As a sop to Goebbels, she agrees he shall have the right to walk young Harold to the Herder School across the square. After speaking at Erfurt Goebbels meets Anka Stahlherm and breaks the news about Magda to her. He is pleased to see that Anka goes to pieces. She wants not to believe him, thinks she can hook him back even now. But it is too late I am with Magda, he vows to his diary, and shall stay with her. 30 When his latest book Struggle for Berlin appears later in the year, he will have it mailed to Anka with a typed note, Dear Party Member, signed by his secretary The police lifted the speaking ban on May 1, 1931, and how the thousands cheered when he rose at the Sport Palace that evening. But the ban had hurt. His cow was in debt. He decided on a two-month plan to double membership. By mid-June 1931 it had risen to about 20,000. Angriff II was entering troubled times. On May 4 the editor Dagobert Der had finally begun serving his two-month sentence for libeling Dr. Weiss. Each visit in jail was a reminder to Goebbels of the volcano rim around which he himself was dancing. He found he had much more in common with the ordinary SA men than with the party's self-important aristocracy. We are still a workers' party, he wrote. Goring irritated him the most. At a rally in Saxony he cold-shouldered the former aviator. He's sick, he felt. Looks a wreck 35 he really does go creeping up Hitler's ass, he added crudely. Were he not so fat he might succeed, too. In Munich for a leadership conference on June 9 however he found himself arguing alone against this disgusting big-mouthed slob. I have few friends in the party, he realized, yet again. Virtually just Hitler 36 as the recession bit deeper, the central parties in the government flailed at the parties on the left and right. On June 16 Bruning enacted an emergency press decree. Berlin's police chief Grotesinski boasted, my powers have been augmented just as I desired. The next 14 days would see the prohibition of Angriff, the VB, and a string of other papers, Nazi and bourgeois alike. The press protested vigorously. When the Frankfurter Post was banned, the rival Frankfurter Zeitung bravely reprinted the offending sentences for its readers to judge. Angriff reappeared on the 19th. Hitler himself started spending more time in Berlin. Police agents cited him with Goebbels at the Kaiserhof on May 9. Jealous of their intimacy, Goebbels' rivals continued to spread rumors of his imminent resignation. He published a defiant denial. That same evening he staged the Gau's annual general meeting at the Sport Palace the first time that any party had dared to hire the huge arena for such a purpose. He blamed Himmler, who had taken over leadership of the SS from Erhard Haydn, for the rumors. He found that the SS was now spying on his headquarters and demanded, visiting Munich on July 2, that they desist. After speaking to 40,000 at Dresden's cycle race track 40 he set off on a month's seaside vacation, he took Magda she is a lady, a woman, and a lover and a secretary Ilse Betk, whose role was less clearly defined. With Goebbels temporarily absent, on August 1 Hitler appointed the virtually 16, the stranger and the shadow unknown journalist Dr. Otto Dietrich as chief of his new press office. Dietrich, six weeks older than Goebbels, had got to know Hitler only recently, while working for the Rheinische Westfalische Tung. Goebbels loathed all journalists, but for Dietrich he would reserve a very special fury until the end. That July he spends five weeks with Magda in a cottage on the cliffs at St. Peter listening to storm rains pounding the roof while the grey-white waves of the North Sea lash the rocks below. He makes love to her, he plays the piano, and he begins a new book, The Struggle for Berlin, dictating a new chapter every day or so. Unemployment has passed the five million mark. Bruning's miseries are music to Goebbels' ears. He bickers sometimes with Magda probing remorselessly into the darker crannies of her past. 
he dredges up noisome episodes, which he attributes to her wayward manner and tries to forget. The more she teases him with stories of past lovers, the more helplessly jealous he becomes. It seems that some of these old flames are not extinguished even now. No matter how loving Magda is, he cannot forget that before him she loved another. She has loved too much, he writes, and keeps telling me only the half of it. And I lie awake until the small hours lashed by jealousy 44 driven by these powerful emotional engines he has completed 300 pages of the manuscript when he returns to Berlin, he truly loves Magda, but a shadow still darkens the horizon. Important new faces met him at his Gao headquarters. The dynamic, heavily built, square-jawed Karl Hanka, aged 27, was his new chief of organization. He had a dry, ironic manner that belied his tough, no-nonsense attitude. Berlin's new propaganda chief was Carolee Kampmann, determined to force back the rising Munich tide of bourgeois reaction best translated by the word diehards Goebbels ordered Kampmann to concentrate his efforts on recruiting new members from Berlin's factory floors. Millions of leaflets and stickers were printed with the new slogan, Into the Factories, 47 That was the only place, Goebbels would write, where the workers could be won over and he intended to gain 10,000 new members in the next three months. In consequence of this shift of emphasis to the factory floor, the regular pace of his public propaganda slowed down that autumn, in October, his Gao would stage only 125 public meetings. During 1931 the political violence worsened. Since May 1930 there had been 29 political murders in Berlin alone including 12 communists, 6 Nazis, 1 Stahlhelm member, 2 Social Democrats, and 4 policemen. In July 1931 Ernst Röhm put a new man in charge of Berlin's SA, the 34-year-old aristocrat Count Wolf Heinrich von Heldorf. Heldorf had joined the party only in August 1930, Goebbels, meeting him a month later, had not liked him at the time. A whiff of perfume caught his nostrils, and he wondered if Heldorf were a pufter like the rest. He had since then tackled Hitler about Rome's homosexuality, about which a Munich newspaper had made headlines in June. Goebbels concluded that Heldorf's appointment was a backdoor affair with Rome and his bisexual adjutant Karl Ernst. The future of the SA looks grim to me, wrote Goebbels. 175 The clause of the penal code on homosexuality casts its shadow right across it. 52 Yet he soon came round to liking, even adoring, Heldorf, forming an enduring friendship with the scoundrel which, in the words of the Spanish proverb, tells us much about Goebbels himself. Born on October 14, 1896, the arrogant, wastrel son of a blue-blooded landowner, Heldorf was a thoroughly nasty piece of work, a bully, a Jew baiter, and a murderer. Police records showed one warrant against him in 1922 for manslaughter, and another for carrying an unlicensed weapon. During the Stennis revolt he had sided with the insurgents, saying Hitler is a traitor 54 none of this appeared to bother Goebbels. Early in September 1931 he briefed Heldorf and his chief of staff Karl Ernst to stage an operation ostensibly a demonstration by the unemployed to rough up Jews along and Dam on their New Year's Day, Yom Kippur. On the chosen day, September 12, Heldorf cruised up and down the boulevard in his green opal, according to police reports, directing his stormtroopers, who were disguised as ordinary passers-by, to set on anybody who looked like a Jew. The police however had been tipped off one disgruntled SA man in Potsdam said later that it was odd that the police learned what had happened at a secret briefing attended only by Goebbels, Heldorf, and ERNST 57 and arrested Heldorf with Ernst, another member of his staff Heinrich Ewer, and 34 other SA men. More likely the informer was Goebbels' own secretary Ilse Stahl, 59 The police docket six days later described Heldorf's private life as messy he was swamped with unpaid bills currently separated from his wife, and not on speaking terms with his family, and he had all but bankrupted his family estate at Wolmestadt. The court sentenced him to six months in prison as ringleader of the riot but he did not serve one day. At Heldorf's appeal in January Goebbels stood by his new friend, screamed at the prosecutor Dr. Stenike, outrageously insulted the court, demanded that the chief of police produce his informant as a witness, and flatly refused to testify otherwise, 
bringing about the collapse of the prosecution case and earning a fine of 500 marks for contempt. Helderf's sentence was reduced to a piffling fine of 100 marks. His lawyer was Roland Freiler, whom he would meet again under different circumstances after July 20, 1944. Helderf's street fighters were less fortunate, they received prison sentences of up to two years for a fray. This inequality widened the breach between Goebbels and the SA men, and that winter saw several intemperate leaflets circulating in Berlin claiming that he and Heldorf had left them in the lurch. His attitude toward the SA officers became ambivalent. He began sniping 16, the stranger and the shadow against Rome. But he kept up his support for the army's rank and file. On September 11, 1931 the day before the Kurfürsten Dam riot he resorted to his old propaganda tricks at a sport palace fundraiser for the SA clinic, at which he presented six recent SA casualties. On Goebbels instructions wrote one of the six we were given brand new white hospital gowns and the staff at the party clinic began to bandage us. One of us who just had a bad headache was given a gigantic turban bandage. Another who had been kicked in the stomach was given a large and totally pointless bandage around his abdomen. As we entered the sport palace it was announced that we were the victims of political terrorism. The resulting applause was deafening. Still ruling by emergency decree, on October 6 Chancellor Bruning empowered the police to shut down dens of activities hostile to the state. Kurtisinski and Weiss immediately sent in their police to evict the SA and SS from the hostels that Goebbels had set up for them in Berlin, tossing the beds and furniture into the street. Hundreds of Nazis, already unemployed, now became homeless too. The steamhead of hatred slowly built up pressure. To the authorities' distress Adolf Hitler now moved his political headquarters away from Munich where a personal tragedy, the suicide of his niece Julie in his apartment, had deeply shocked him to Berlin. Burying forever the womanizing, indolent, procrastinating Hitler of old, he retained a suite of rooms in the Kaiserhof Hotel, within leering distance of the Reich Chancellery. Here he held court with his henchmen like Rome, Hess, and Julius Schwab. Kurtisinski and Weiss were shocked by their government's lack of dignity in tolerating this, their agents learned that Hitler was meeting millionaire businessmen including even Gunter Quandt at the Kaiserhof and that they were pouring money into the Nazi coffers having accepted that Brüning was not going to rescue Germany. The locals jostle and vie with each other for Hitler's ear. Göring, his political attaché in Berlin, is also overshadowed by tragedy, as his wife Karen has now contracted her final illness and returned to Stockholm with no hope of recovering. Goebbels tries to buy from the prosecutor's office the documents incriminating Rome. Rome stung by Goebbels' campaign against him, tells Hitler that all Berlin is gossiping about Goebbels' affair with the former MRS Quant. But this backfires on Rome, as Goebbels now often hangs around the lobby of the Kaiserhof with Magda taking tea. Once they send young Harold Quant, now nearly ten, upstairs to see the Führer wearing the little blue uniform Magda has sewn for him. Harold gives Hitler the appropriate salute and says that he feels twice as strong when wearing a uniform. Goebbels invites Hitler downstairs to meet Magda the divorced wife of the industrialist you saw earlier, he adds. A stickler for etiquette, Hitler asks Goring whether there is any reason why he should not be seen with Magda. No, admits Goring, but you can't be too careful with a Madame Pompadour. The name means nothing to Hitler, and he does not grasp that Magda is in a relationship with his propaganda chief. Thus the three points of an extraordinary triangle converge Hitler, Magda, and Goebbels. Over T. Magda, not quite thirty, and the freshly bereaved Hitler, twelve years her senior, feast their eyes on each other. To Hitler she looks uncannily like Julie, sixty-nine while Magda, imbued by this time with Nazi lore, feels she is in the presence of a demigod. Hours later, in his upstairs suite, Hitler remarks to his henchmen that in Julie he believed he had found something almost divine. I thought these feelings were dead and buried, he adds. But today these same feelings have suddenly overwhelmed me again. For an instant he seems to have fantasized about Magda, she told her mother that he had made cautious and discreet advances to her. His reverie lasts however only a few hours. After midnight he learns that Magda has casually invited Schwab 
the SS commander Sepp Dietrich, and his chauffeur back to her apartment for drinks, Dr. Goebbels then shows up there, letting himself in with a key, and declares stiffly that he is somewhat surprised to find them there at such a late hour. Hitler is clearly astonished to hear this from them, Goebbels, that limping little runt, has won this Germanic beauty. He pulls a wry face and tries to laugh off his disappointment. It was just a brief relapse, he confesses to an aide. Karen Goring died early on October 17. Hitler took this fresh personal loss hard and again spoke wistfully to the Nazi economics advisor Dr. Otto Wagner about Magda Quant. This woman, he mused, might yet play a role in my life. She could become a second Julie for me. It's a pity, he continued, thinking out loud, that she is not married. He was worried about appearances. Wagner took the hint, and we have his probably reliable account of what followed. That day, October 17, and the next Hitler and Goebbels were both due to attend a rally by the SA at Brunswick. Wagner invited Magda to go in his large 100-horsepower horch. On the drive over, Wagner stopped for a picnic and put an unusual proposition to her, Hitler, he said, was a rare genius who needed a woman's gentle influence, she must be able to help the Führer to find himself as a human being somebody to accompany him to the opera, and to entertain him to tea with the finest porcelain. This woman could be you. But I would have to be married to somebody, she pointed out. Correct, he said, and mentioned Goebbels. Magda was hesitant. But for Adolf Hitler, she bravely announced, I am willing to do anything. She promised to keep Wagner informed. It seems to have been an unusual bargain all round. Magda later told her sister-in-law Elo Quant that Goebbels attached one condition to their marriage, if he was quasi to share her with Hitler namely that he be allowed extramarital adventures, a man of his vitality needed this emotional leeway, 16, the stranger and the shadow he argued. Early in November she phoned Wagner to say that they would both be coming to Munich a few days later, I have come to keep my promise. Over lunch with Hitler they announced their engagement and he attended their little hotel celebration afterwards. The mood was so carefree, recalled Wagner that I had the feeling that three people had at last found happiness the Reichstag was due to reconvene after its seven-month recess on October 13, 1931. On the 10th President von Hindenburg sent for Hitler to size him up. He was not impressed. On the following day, in an attempt to concert their opposition, Hitler chaired a meeting with the bourgeois opposition leaders at Bad Hartburg. The upshot was the formation of a Hartburg front against Brüning. On the 14th the Nazis re-entered the Reichstag, but only briefly because two days later they walked out again. By the end of the year there were 5,660,000 registered unemployed a desperate people turning to the Nazis for their salvation, and a regime determined to stay in office by hook or by crook. On December 8 Brüning issued still more emergency decrees, banning political uniforms and prohibiting all political assemblies until the new year. Two days later Hitler held court again at the Kaiserhof with Rome, Hess, Ernst Putzi Hanfstengel, and Schwab. The next day police headquarters learned that Hitler was conferring all morning with the Ruhr Steel millionaires Albert Vogler and Fritz Thyssen, and planned to hold a press conference with American journalists. Kretasinski pleaded with Severing to ban at least the press conference as an illegal assembly, or failing that to deport Hitler from Prussia as persona non grata the Berlin police could then forcibly put him on the midday train to Munich. President von Hindenburg however disapproved another sign that the Nazis were coming in from the cold. Hitler had begun visiting Magda Quant's apartment on Reichskanzlerplatz more often than Goring's. Both Goebbels and Gregor Strasser welcomed this the Goring's, said Strasser, had always had a house full of fortune hunters hoping to meet the Führer. I myself get on quite well with Goebbels, Strasser told Wagner. With Karen now dead, Goring moved permanently into the Kaiserhof. Fleeing from the political atmosphere there, Hitler became a still more frequent visitor to Magda's household. She served her home-baked pastries to Hitler and fussed over him, while he relaxed and expatiated upon the credence who claimed to admire the degenerate modern works of art. Dr. Goebbels, he said casually, 
I want you to think over how we're to stop this rot when we take over and you're in charge of all government propaganda. The Goebbels wedding was fixed for December 19, 1931. As a divorcee and convert to Protestantism, Magda could not marry under the rights of the Catholic Church. Goebbels' plea to the Bishop of Berlin for a waiver was denied. Marrying as a Protestant, he would be excommunicated. He thereupon saw no further reason to pay their church tax, said Hitler years later, mocking the church's hypocrisy. But the church informed him that excommunication did not affect the obligation to pay up as before 74 Hitler acted as one witness, and General von Epp as the other. Since a Berlin wedding was out of the question the communists would have raised mayhem it was solemnized at Severin, the Quant estate in Mecklenburg. Quant did not hear about this until afterwards, he stopped paying alimony forthwith. The village notary of Golden Bow performed the legal ceremony, then Dr. Wenzel, a pastor from Berlin, officiated at the Protestant ceremony in the chapel at nearby Frauenmark, a swastika banner draped the altar. Magda's mother came, but not her father, who disapproved of Goebbels, she had stitched together a little brown SA uniform for her son Harold to wear as a pageboy. We accept the obligation to bring up our children in the evangelical Lutheran faith, the couple affirmed. As for Joseph Goebbels, if Magda had looked closely, she would have seen that her new husband was wearing a gold tie pin shaped like a wolf's head a gift, he had once told a friend, from a girl he had become very fond of at university. 17, the man of tomorrow 17, the man of tomorrow leaving Magda alone, Dr. Goebbels spent Christmas Eve 1931 with the SA Nationwide, the party now had over 800,000 members. Two years later he published a popular edition of his diaries for the coming months entitled From the Kaiserhof to the Reich Chancellery. The book would sell half a million copies by 1939. One textual comparison with the handwritten original, which has survived on Nazi microfiches in Moscow too shows that Goebbels edited them less severely than his critics believed. There are the usual exaggerations. The diary's 20,000 people listening to him speak in Leipzig become 30,000 in Kaiserhof 3 his meetings are always overflowing, and with the right class of people, almost all artisans, four virtually only workers in Essen, and a sport palace brimming with workers in Berlin.5 he who has the working man, he pronounces, has the people. He learns more, so he writes, from a sleeping car conductor than from far more august gentlemen. Point six. The published diary also treats President von Hindenburg with far greater respect, this venerable figure and the grand old man, seven than does the original handwritten text. As for Hitler, the image that Goebbels offers readers of his book is of a clear-thinking, resolute, pragmatic Führer who never hesitates unless for tactical advantage. He has the tougher nerves and the greater staying power, writes Goebbels in his book. Point eight banished from the printed pages the image of Hitler Kunktator, the prevaricating Munich coffee shop demagogue familiar from the handwritten diaries of previous years. The Führer is the best raconteur I know, he writes. Point nine wonderful, he writes of Hitler's final appointment as Chancellor, how simple the Führer is in his greatness, and how great in his simplicity 10 in editing Kaiserhof he has however settled a few old scores. Gregor Strasser lurks through his apparently clairvoyant essay as a sinister figure unrecognizable as the man of bonhomie and talent of whom Goebbels has in fact written so recently in the diary. There is one man in the organization trusted by nobody, he thunders in Kaiserhof. And this man's name is Gregor Strasser, 11 unlike the real man, the book Strasser is a boring and ineffective speaker the one of our number whom our opponents most love which tells strongly against him 12 Hermann Goring II is barely recognizable. Gone are the references to his morphine addiction, no longer a mound of frozen crap, Goring is a massive and powerful speaker against Defense Minister Wilhelm Groner. In one handwritten entry he has called Goring an archprig, erpampig, the published entry reads, I find myself agreeing with Goering sick on all fundamental and tactical issues. The difference is that by 1934, the year of publication, Goring has become a very dangerous man indeed to cross. The published diary represents its author, Goebbels, as the one comrade whom Hitler trusts and regularly consults, two men sitting like spiders in the center of the Kaiserhof web, 
watching as their pawns move to topple first Groner, then Bruning himself in the late spring of 1932. There is no trace in it of the depression that laid the Gao lighter low the year before, and only the most antiseptic glimpses of his private life. The book records the Gao's crippling financial plight 17 but suppresses any reference to the excesses which the private diary reveals for instance his craze for the latest automobiles. On May 22 the diary notes, the gentlemen from Mercedes come to beg forgiveness. I am to get new coachwork for the Opel Nuremberg and a new Mercedes Open Tourer. Now, that's talking. 18 The published text also casts a discreet veil over Hitler's private life. On the anniversary of Julie's suicide, Hitler tearfully visits her grave in Vienna. In Kaiserhof however he is shown only as driving there for a private visit. There is more, the real diary shows that contrary to popular belief Miss Eva Braun, the blonde laboratory assistant of Hitler's photographer, did not step straight into Julie's shoes, but that a Miss Weinrich briefly claimed Hitler's attentions first. So that's Hitler's pet, notes Goebbels. Poor taste. Glum girl. Moist hands. BRR. He finds her lunching with Hitler at the Osteria restaurant the next day. Pig stupid, Goebbels decides, before allowing more charitably, how great Hitler's longing for a woman must be. He wondered what his chief saw in this little flipperty gibbet he ought to find a more respectable lady friend. There is not even a hint of this in the published Kaiserhof of course. 1932 would be a year of elections one presidential, two Reichstag, and five provincial. In most the National Socialists would increase their vote. Goebbels brought the National Propaganda Directorate permanently to Berlin from March 1, and campaigned tirelessly. He now had a vast following in the capital. The regime could no longer ignore the Nazis. Bruning actually invited Hitler for talks about extending Hindenburg's term of office. After discussing it with his partners in the Hartberg Front, Hitler published his refusal in the full Kisker Biobotter, insisting on a new presidential election. To Bruning's embarrassment, Deputy Police Chief Isidore Weiss chose this moment to ban Angriff for the tenth time in a year, for inciting contempt of the Jews in 1932 there were 172,672 Jews among Berlin's 4,024,165 population. On January 8 he shut down a meeting at the Sport Palace just as Goebbels had begun speaking to 15,000 people, for inciting contempt of Weiss in particular. Enraged by Goebbels' behavior in court two weeks later during the Heldorf appeal hearing he had demanded that the police informant 17, the man of tomorrow testify in open court Weiss slapped a fresh three-week gag on the Gau lighter. Weiss also telexed to every provincial governor in Germany. National Socialist Deputy Dr. Goebbels sick forbidden to speak here. Meetings only under proviso that G is not speaker, Police President Berlin 26 at the next few meetings organizers read out messages from Goebbels, until the police banned these two. The fight continued. On legal advice and by now Goebbels was surrounded by eager lawyers willing to help he deeded his personal library to a third person in case Weiss seized it on the pretext that it served the purposes of spreading revolution. The tide of political violence was rising. 86 Nazis were murdered during 1932, in 12 months Goebbels alone lost seven men, and the police seldom caught the murderers. The killing of 15-year-old Herbert Norcus was particularly nasty. He and five pals had been distributing leaflets early one Sunday morning when they were overwhelmed by communists. The body of Norcus, son of a working-class Nazi from Plotz and C., was found in the entrance hall of No. 4 Zwingli Strasse, where he had bled to death from six stab wounds. Goebbels personally inspected the scene with its 20-yard trail of dried blood and the one bloody handprint on the whitewashed wall. After going on to the morgue he wrote these words in his newspaper, there in the bleak grey twilight a yellowing childish face stares with half-open, empty eyes. The delicate features have been trampled to a bloody pulp 27 the next day he buried the artist Professor Ernst Swartz, an SA officer gunned down in a communist ambush a week before. One evening Dr. Goebbels returned home excited, limped up and down chain smoking for a while, then told Magda he had had a splendid idea. Hitler himself must stand for president, he said. Hitler however proved unexpectedly difficult to persuade. 
he wanted the opposition to come out with their candidates before making up his own mind. Still delaying his decision, on February 9 Hitler reviewed 15,000 of Rome's stormtroopers in the Sport Palace. Goebbels enthused, Chief of Staff Rome has pulled off a miracle. This embarrassing laudatio appeared only in the first edition of Kaiserhof, and was struck out of all editions published after June 1934. Police Chief Krutisinski gagged at the prospect of Hitler, his archenemy, becoming president. This centurion of social democracy made little pretense of impartiality. How shameful it is, he declared in Leipzig, that millions of Germans are trotting along behind a foreigner. How shameful that this foreigner, Hitler, not only conducts serious talks with the government on foreign affairs, but is able to speak to foreign press representatives about Germany's future and about Germany's foreign interests without somebody seeing him off with a dog whip. 30 Dr. Goebbels made hay with that remark. In Angriff he pointed out how often Grotesinski had banned Nazis for precisely the same kind of incitement to violence. Let's see, he crowed in Kaiserhof, published when he already knew the answer, which of us gets seen off with a dog whip out of Germany. 33 Hindenburg announced on February 15 that he intended to stand again. Taking Hitler's decision for granted, Goebbels began designing election posters with punchy slogans like Schluss Jetzt. Time's up. 34 Hitler was still undecided. Goebbels decided to present him with a fait accompli, subjecting him to the pressure of public acclaim. To a cheering Sport Palace audience on February 22, Goebbels simply announced that Hitler would stand for president. Hitler's headquarters in Munich was horrified and issued an immediate embargo to the party newspaper, forbidding them to print Goebbels' announcement. Hitler had no choice but to agree to stand writing in Kaiserhof two years later Goebbels claimed that Hitler had phoned him after the meeting to express his delight that the announcement had gone down so well. Whatever the truth of this selfing statement, on February 23, speaking in a Reichstag building surrounded by riot police, Groner announced the election date as March 13. After that, speaking on behalf of the Nazis, Dr. Goebbels launched into an hour-long assault on Dr. Bruning seated stony-faced and with arms folded near him. In one year, he said, the police had banned Angriff twelve times, eight times the courts had ruled these bans illegal. The Illustrator der Biobotter, he said, the picture magazine of the National Socialist Movement, has today been banned until March 13 i.e., for the whole of the election period. In the last three months 24 SA men had been murdered, probably by other Nazis, yelled a social democrat, and now their police chief was talking of whipping Hitler out of Germany. No foreign power, he declared, was willing to sign treaties with Brüning because they know, Mr. Reich Chancellor, that you are the man of yesteryear, and that the man of tomorrow is coming. To a barrage of abuse from the left, Goebbels doggedly waded into Hindenburg's reputation. Lauded by the Berlin gutter press, faded by the party of deserters he declaimed, flinging out a demagogic arm toward the Social Democrat benches. The rest of his words were lost in the howl of outrage that his taunt provoked. Furiously clanging his bell the speaker called for silence. Dr. Goebbels, he charged, you have named one of the parties present in this house the party of deserters the Social Democrats screeched at Goebbels, who deserted. Where were you? One of them shouted, you weren't at the front for even one day. Amid mounting hubbub the communist bloc leader Ernst Torgeler mocked, let war veteran Goebbels speak. But the social democrats were now hysterical. We were at the front. He was the dodger. Withdraw. Behold Goebbels, the political cripple. Barely pausing to draw breath Goebbels continued, the Jews of the Berlin gutter press have held the field marshal on high. These are the same Jews and social democrats shouts of sit down and time's up, who dumped buckets of mockery and scorn on the field marshal in 1925. Sit down. Sit down, roared the Social Democrats. 17. The man of tomorrow we're not going to be insulted by Dodgers. The speaker capitulated, and ordered Goebbels out of the chamber. Gregor Strasser leaped to his defense, pointing out that the Gauleiter had not accused any particular party by name. When he said party of deserters only the Social Democrats felt the hat fitted, 
39 returning to the attack the next day Goebbels complained that the illegal and unjust bans on Angriff had cost the newspaper 180,000 marks already. As for the opposition's specious allegations that he had just slandered Hindenburg as a deserter, he retaliated by reading out devastating passages from press clippings in his confidential archives, reporting what the Social Democrat Organ Vorwarts, the Berliner Morgenzeitung, the Berliner Morgen Post, and Karl Severing himself had written about the field marshal during the previous presidential election campaign. In a brutal closing tirade he offered a string of definitions for the Nazi word system, ending with this one, where criticizing the republic lands you in jail, but slandering and belittling the entire German people is rewarded by the highest distinctions. He cried, that is why in the three weeks now beginning, one battle cry will sound throughout Germany, time's up away with the system the system that Bruning and his cabinet represent. As screams of abuse erupted from the left, Goebbels taunted them, well may you laugh and scoff. Events will prove us right. We shall meet again, on March 13, at Philippi 40 waging an election campaign of dubious probity Bruning's officials confiscated the full Kisker Biobotter and banned Angriff yet again, for inciting contempt of the Republic. But the Nazis had poster power. Kampmann, now Goebbels' Gau propaganda chief, plastered the circular Litfus advertisement pillars on street corners with huge placards, SA men stood guard on each site, and Nazi speakers harangued the crowds that gathered around them. Outsized pictorial posters like Schweitzer's A Man Breaks His Chains adorned the facades of prominent buildings such as the Café Josti on Potsdamer Platz. Goebbels recorded on discs a short speech cleverly structured so that its real propaganda message was not at first evident, and manufactured 50,000 cardboard copies of this little recording costing only three pfennigs each for Nazis to mail to their Marxist opponents. In 1930 he had seen an inspiring film of Mussolini speaking, the Herald Film Company now produced a ten-minute movie of Goebbels speaking, to be shown each night in town squares throughout Germany. Somebody in the Reichstag the taunt was always Tissen must have topped up Goebbels' funds because he would spend 200,000 marks on propaganda for this presidential campaign. With Angriff already banned, the government now banned the rest of his posters and leaflets. Goebbels' demands that Hitler be allowed broadcasting time like Hindenburg were refused. On March 9, with four days to go, he addressed 80,000 people in Berlin's Lustgarten Park. The press published doctored photographs to suggest only a sparse attendance. Two days later Grotesinski sent police to raid his headquarters again. The next day Goebbels addressed an election eve rally at the Sport Palace. After that he gathered his officials at his apartment to await the first results. By 10 p.m. it was clear that, while 11 million votes had been cast for Hitler, Hindenburg was far ahead indeed, only 100,000 votes short of an absolute majority. Goebbels, overcoming his dejection, issued these guidelines to all Gao lighters that same Sunday, the NSDAP has won an unparalleled victory in the first election round. In one and a half years the party has succeeded in almost doubling its vote. Their task now would be to win 25 million more voters for the runoff. Goebbels ordered the Nazi Gao lighters to concentrate their scarce resources on the most promising sections of those who had not voted for them. Thus they must tell the bourgeois voters what to expect if Hindenburg was re-elected, the stopping of pensions, huge tax burdens, and renewed inflation, as well as further territorial encroachments by Poland and Lithuania, and civil war with the communists. Refusing even to look at the gloating headlines of the Juden press that Monday morning, Goebbels flew down to Munich with Kampmann for a campaign conference with Hitler. The second round would be held on April 10. Tossing more dirty trick spanners into the Nazi works, Brüning ordered virtually simultaneous provincial elections for Prussia, Anhalt, Württemberg, and Bavaria. He also decreed an electioneering moratorium until after Easter. We're fighting a war, snarled Goebbels, but there's to be no shooting for three weeks. Karl Severing joined in the spanner tossing arresting scores of Goebbels' Berlin officials on mostly trumped-up charges, while Grotesinski and Weiss had their police search for evidence that would justify an outright ban on the SA Goebbels responded with innovative electioneering techniques as soon as the brief but unequal battle was rejoined. 
he had originally planned to issue four pictorial and 16 text posters to be released day by day from March 22 onward. The moratorium knocked that plan on the head. Hitler again appealed to the radio stations to allow him airtime, but again Bruning permitted only Hindenburg to get near the microphone. The campaign got dirty on both sides. Hitler's opponents distributed leaflets in old people's homes warning that he would take away their pensions and insist on compulsory euthanasia at 60, other election lies against which Goebbels warned the other Gau leiters in a circular were that the Nazis would bring war, inflation, expropriation, destruction of the unions, dissolution of the civil service, dismancipation of women, forced labor, civil war and the renunciation of all claims to the South Tyrol, East Prussia, and Alsace. Lorraine. With the passage of time, about three quarters of these lies would come true. In the same circular Goebbels suggested that Hindenburg was benefiting from the emotional female vote, fear of war, and from civil servants' anxieties about their future. The Gauleiters had to concentrate on this Hindenburg front they must ask the butchers, bakers and innkeepers why they had voted 17, the man of tomorrow for the field marshal, and then tailor their own propaganda accordingly. This field operational analysis would become a hallmark of Goebbels' propaganda strategy. He suggested they send groups of girl members into the old folks' homes to read to them, and the bands of the SA and SS to serenade them. He hatched a secret plan to triple the print run of all Nazi newspapers for election week, the additional copies being sent free to all Hindenburg voters. The full Kisker Biobotter alone should send out 800,000 free copies each day. As for Hitler, Goebbels brought in air power, flying from city to city in his own plane D-1720 Hitler would address three or four huge meetings a day in 21 cities beginning on April 3, tackling a new enemy lie each day. Goebbels printed four pictorial posters, targeting the farming community, city dwellers, women, and vested interests. A glossy photogravure magazine illustrated with pictures of the Führer would round off his campaign package. True, its title? flamethrower, was unlikely to attract the female fear of war vote but he still had a lot to learn about them. Then the election got dirtier. The government banned Goebbels' free newspaper stunt. Infuriatingly, their opponents obtained details of Hitler's lavish Kaiserhof expenses. Goebbels called the bill a forgery. He retaliated by claiming to have annihilating material on severing swomanizing, but declared that, after consulting with the Führer, they would not release it. In fact neither he nor Hitler was in a strong position to scold their opponents on this score. The moratorium ended on Sunday April 3. While Hitler set out by plane, Goebbels spoke three times that day at Wiesbaden, then at Frankfurt. On the fourth he and Hitler addressed 150,000 people in the Berlin Lustgarten, then 50,000 more in Potsdam. In Goebbels' absence police chief Kretasinski suddenly ordered the GAU headquarters in Hedmanstrasse padlocked, and banned the election posters that Goebbels had designed for the upcoming Prussian campaign. Voting was on April 10, 1932. Though again failing to defeat Hindenburg, Hitler now clearly emerged as a statesman of equivalent stature. His vote increased to 13,418,547. Hindenburg won with 19,359,983 votes. The Nazi vote in Berlin had grown by 200,000, attracting 31% of the vote in the capital as compared with 36.8% nationwide. The Communists won only 3,706,759. Seen in this light, Goebbels should have been delighted, but in the privacy of his apartment he made no secret of his disappointment. According to her mother, Magda chose this moment to reveal that she was four months pregnant. Any elation at this was tempered by the announcement that the defense minister Groner had banned the SA and SS nationwide and ordered their immediate dissolution. Polling in Prussia, the next round of elections, would be on April 24. Goebbels now directed his propaganda venom at Otto Braun and Karl Severing, and their police minions Kretasinski and Isidore Weiss. He devised more new techniques, including loudspeaker trucks illegally broadcasting the Horst Wessel anthem. One stunt tickled the fancy of the international press, 
his posters cheekily announced a public debate with Chancellor Bruning in the Sport Palace. In fact he had obtained recordings of a recent Bruning speech in Königsberg, from which he played extracts to his audience, together with his own devastating replies. Bruning's humorless response was to sue Goebbels for infringing the copyright in his intellectual property. After dropping dark hints in Angriff that he had some dirt on severing, he detected a softening in Vorwart's line. Struggling with flu and a 40 degrees Celsius fever he addressed a hundred thousand people in the Lust Garden. On election eve one of his SA men was shot dead with a bullet between the eyes. The next day saw every swastika flag in Prussia draped in mourning. These were the Goebbels' methods, and thanks to them the Nazi party increased its numbers in the Prussian parliament from six seats to 162, with 38 3% of the votes they were the strongest party. In Bavaria meanwhile the Nazis had swollen from nine seats to 43, in Württemberg from 1 to 51, and in Anhalt from 1 to 15. In Anhalt Germany's first Nazi prime minister was appointed. Elsewhere, Brüning's allies were still strong enough to form a coalition against the Nazis and stay in power. We've got to get into power sooner or later, wrote Goebbels in understandable frustration at this outcome. Otherwise all these election victories will be the death of us 62-18, follow that man 18 follow that man for the next few months Hitler would spend more time in Berlin than in Munich, wheeling and dealing in tandem with Goring in a persistent effort to cover the last hundred yards to power. Goebbels did what he could to undermine Hitler's trust in Goring. When the aviator started an affair with blonde actress Emmy Sonman, a married woman, he lost no time in telling Hitler. Point one in consequence, Hitler spent more time with the Goebbelses. In any case, he was almost pathological about being recognized in the capital. He would hide his face when the lights came on in movie theaters. One evening, the Goebbelses were out when Hitler returned to Reichskanzler Platz and he had to wait outside. He asked Dar to stand between him and the street. Hitler remained standing, said Dar, in the corner of the doorway with his face turned toward the house until Dr. Goebbels got back to the center party wooed Hitler the most persistently stating as their only condition that he must accept a junior role. There were those, Gregor Strasser among them, who felt strongly that half a loaf was better than no bread. But Goebbels insisted that they hold out for absolute power. Either or, he wrote, power, or opposition 3 His published diary contains only hints at the part in fact played by Franz von Papen and General Kurt von Schleicher in bringing about the demise of the system. Missing from Kaiserhof too is the juicy scandal caused when a Munich newspaper published Rome's homosexual love letters. Point four Goebbels was not alone in his perplexity at Hitler's indulgence of such perversions. Point five by 1932 Goebbels' fame was spreading beyond Germany's frontiers. The distinguished American journalist H. R. Knickerbocker, writing from Berlin for the New York Evening Post, singled him out as the greatest master of public management that Europe had ever known. To Goebbels, he wrote, went all the credit for Hitler's election successes. He is the best journalist in the party, and the best orator. His billboards were masterpieces of election psychology. Point six Goebbels had lost his appeal against the two month sentence for libeling Dr. Weiss, and a pro forma warrant had been issued on February 11. On the 20th, Dr. Bernhard Weiss was informed that the sentence could be enforced as soon as Goebbels lost his immunity. Point seven Meanwhile, on April 25 Supreme Court officials from Leipzig served another 40-page indictment on Goebbels, this time for high treason. This document too he shrugged off.8 The maneuvering between the Nazis and a Camarilla of army officers, jointly and severally eager for power, had begun. Goebbels' diaries show that Hitler had entrusted the backstage negotiations to Rome, Göring, and Frick, while General von Schleicher operated through his colleague Werner Count von Alvensleben whom Goebbels identified only in the unpublished version of his diary. Point nine, as the regime's position weakened in May 1932 Hitler and Goebbels, who had been conferring in Munich, hurried back to Berlin. A minister resigned and Hitler, living in the Kaiserhof or with the Goebbelses, again launched into negotiations with Schleicher's and Hindenburg's emissaries. Power seemed so near to the Nazi leaders, and yet so unattainable. When the Reichstag belatedly resumed, Goring and Strasser spearheaded the attack on Brüning's ruinous financial policies. 
Bruning survived the Nazi motion of no confidence, this time by 286 votes to 259. The gap was narrowing all the time. The next day, May 12, saw scandalous scenes in the Reichstag. After Nazi deputies roughed up an opponent, Dr. Bernhard Weiss and his police officers stormed in and arrested several of them. Goebbels was thrilled at Isidore's blunder in violating the sovereignty of their parliament. The entire press echoed him. Groner resigned as defense minister. The police arrested Strasser that night on his train heading back to Munich, and Weiss issued yet another libel writ against Goebbels for insulting him as a Jew. Clinging grimly to the tattered remnants of his office, Bruning still refused to resign, instead adjourning the Reichstag until June. Hitler was determined to force a new election, so that his party could bring its now massive voting strength to bear. For all his public triumphs, Goebbels' finances at this time were on a knife edge. Angriff was having to pay off his costs in one libel action by monthly installments of 20 marks. His lawyer managed to get the balance of 598 marks annulled. His accountant declared a tax demand of 564 marks for 1931 to be totally beyond his means, and asked if he could pay 100 marks a month, Goebbels indignantly penciled in the margin, pay from what? 12 Magda's handsome alimony payments from Quant had ended of course with her new marriage. Goebbels evidently refused however to touch the colossal funds that he raised for the election campaigns. After his private diary recorded on May 22 a visit from some gentleman from Mercedes, the Gao headquarters was suddenly awash with funds. Magda, now in her fifth month of pregnancy, rented a little cottage in the middle of an orchard at Capeth, near Gato, on Lake Schwilo. In this idyllic setting they spent their summer nights while frogs bleeped and swallows flitted through their open bedroom windows. After Dr. Bruning resigned on May 30, 1932, the clever, foxy career politician Franz von Papen was appointed interim chancellor. The election was set down 18, follow that man for the last day of July. Goebbels called his staff out to a council of war. Once again it was Goebbels who masterminded the nationwide campaign from Hitler's 50-city aerial tour of Germany right down to the tiniest personal details like obtaining the names of eight Berlin Nazis in prison and in hospital and dividing between them the latest meager royalty check from his book The Unknown S.A. Man as a small token, he wrote them, of recognition 15 he did not intend to allow Isidore to disrupt this campaign and started a drive to get him and Gretzinski sacked. Poppen had appointed a bumbling weakling, Baron von Gael, as Minister of the Interior. Hitler easily persuaded him to lift the eight-week-old ban on the SA and SS and Goebbels publicly called on Gail to get rid of Messrs. Gretzinski and Weiss as well. Under Nazi pressure Poppen repealed virtually all the bans. A Nazi was appointed Speaker of the Prussian Parliament, at his diktat, this body set up a formal commission of inquiry into Weiss's activities. Revenge is a repast best served up cold, wrote Goebbels yet again. Weiss responded by banning Angriff for five days. A month remained before the election day. This time the Nazis enjoyed limited access to the airwaves. Goebbels scripted a broadcast on national character as a basis for national culture. It was stripped of its venom however by the radio censors before he could broadcast it. The final list of Nazi candidates for Berlin and Potsdam again poorly justified the claim to be a workers' party, of the 41 local names. Six were office workers, five businessmen, two former police officers, and among the rest a civil servant, teacher, bookseller, pharmacist, tailor, librarian, and bank clerk, only five were truly working class. All of these candidates, including Goebbels himself, had to sign a five-point declaration for Hitler's personal files, of which the first two points read as follows. 1. I swear that I have no links or relations with the Jews, 2. I swear that I hold no directorships in banks or other corporations. With the irksome ban on the SA lifted by the obliging Franz von Papen, the Brown Shirt Armies marched again. For two hours 20,000 marched past Goebbels and Strasser in Dessau on July 3. As he arrived in Hagen on the 12th the Communists ambushed his car. Clutching a pistol, he signalled his chauffeur to put his foot down and plough through the mob. After that the left signalled his car's number ahead to every town. 
Inman can Gladbach the communists passed out leaflets stating that he was not to escape alive, no idle threat, because the tide of violence was in full flood. Only a few days earlier he had buried S.A. Scharfuhrer helmet coster of no Sturm, 10,000 people had packed the graveyard. In wedding the communists gunned down S.A. Mannheim Steinberg. In the 50 days up to July 20 Prussia saw 461 political clashes, resulting in 82 deaths on all sides, in the last two weeks of the campaign alone, 32 Nazis were killed. On July 17 communist gunmen opened fire on a marching SA column in Altena, near Hamburg, leaving 19 dead and 60 injured. Suddenly everything tilted in the Nazis' favor. General von Schleicher agreed to back a putsch against Prussia. Meeting with Göring, Rome, and Goebbels in Cottbus two days after the Altena bloodbath Hitler announced to them that they were going to appoint a commissar for the interior in Prussia, Karl Severing. The incumbent Minister of the Interior, huffed that he would yield only to force majeure. A touch on the wrist sufficed, mocked Goebbels in Kaiserhof. Severing's humiliation was followed by President von Hindenburg signing a decree appointing Papen himself as Reich Commissar in Prussia, displacing the leftist Prime Minister Otto Braun. When Braun squealed, Hindenburg on Schleicher's advice called in the army. At 11.20 am on July 20 General Gerd von Rundstedt, the garrison commander, phoned police chief Grotesinski with word that he was imposing a state of emergency, his orders were to replace Grotesinski with the police chief of Essen. Dr. Bernhard Weiss was to be summarily dismissed as well. The army sent in its officers at 5.30 p.m. to arrest Grotesinski and Weiss. As they were driven away from their police headquarters at Alexander Platz in an army Mercedes, Weiss had no time even to gather up his bowler hat and pants nest. The sheer suddenness of it all took Goebbels' breath away. It was the end of an era. The Nazis had Papen eating out of their hand. He appointed reliable police chiefs and civil governors, Regierungs Presidenten, throughout Prussia. He banned the newspapers that had been the bane of Goebbels' life such as the Aktur Abendblatt. All the fetters thus came off in the last eleven days of Nazi campaigning. In the city's Grunewald Stadium Karl Hanke organized the biggest open-air rally yet for Hitler. It was a boiling hot day until evening when the heavens opened and the rains drenched the 120,000 people gathered to hear him. But nobody left a sign, in Kampmann's view, of how the once-red Berlin had come around, thanks to Dr. Goebbels' propaganda. A mighty cheer went up as Goebbels remarked that even these rains had deterred nobody. He was in Munich when the election results were announced. The Nazis had attracted nearly 14 million votes, entitling them to 230 seats in the Reichstag. They were now far the largest single party, but once again the center party, with 76 seats, held the balance. Again Goebbels advised Hitler to hold out for absolute power, and shun any compromise. Tolerance will be the death of us, he argued. Vacationing briefly with him at Tajernsi, Hitler agonized over his next step balking, jotted Goebbels in his diary, at the really big decisions. In Kaiserhof he softened this criticism by applying it to the party as a whole, rather than its Führer. Leaving Goebbels in Bavaria, Hitler set off for Berlin on August 4, 1932 to state his demands to Hindenburg, he wanted to be Chancellor, with Frick as Minister of the Interior. Strasser as Minister of Labor, Goebbels as Minister 18, follow that man of public education, meaning propaganda, and Goring as aviation minister. He returned south on the 6th. Up at his Obersalzburg mountain home he predicted to Goebbels that they would be taking office in a week's time, with Hitler as both Chancellor and Prime Minister of Prussia, Strasser as Minister of the Interior, and Goebbels acting as Minister of Culture in Prussia and Minister of Education in the Reich. A cabinet of real men, approved Goebbels. We shall never give up power. They'll have to carry us out feet first. This is going to be a total solution. He stayed for the next five days at Hitler's side, nervous in case somebody talked the Fuhrer into making other dispositions. In Berlin the SA under their bullying commander Heldorf had already begun jostling for power. While Göring conducted the political negotiations, Ernst Röhm drew his SA army up around the capital to exert a visible and unsubtle pressure on the Chancellor Papen. 
Goebbels was bullish about the outcome of the talks, and stayed up until 4 a.m. one night discussing with Hitler the structure of his new ministry. Hitler promised him he would be running education, films, radio, theater, and propaganda, as if these were not portfolios enough, Goebbels decided to retain his position as the party's Gauleiter of Berlin and as Reichsleiter in charge of its national propaganda. All of these ambitions remained pipe dreams, and nothing about them appeared in Kaiserhof. 29 Daimler Benz's general manager 30 came to talk automobiles, and for a day visions of newer and even bigger cars danced in the Nazi leaders' heads. But then Schleicher's man Alvin Slaben phoned with news that the regime was still holding out for a horse trade. Hitler told him that he was not interested in compromises a total solution, as Goebbels put it, or no dice 31 not all the Nazis agreed with Hitler's unrelenting stance. The regime spread rumors that a split was beginning to show in their ranks, and even that Goebbels and Strasser were in favor of half-measures. Hitler published a communique denying it. He left for Berlin with Goebbels. Here unsatisfactory news waited for them, Papen was still flatly against Hitler becoming Chancellor, Rome and Schleicher were trying to talk him round, without much success. Pacing the veranda of the Goebbels's summer house at Capeth, Hitler discussed this turn of events. They agreed that if the Führer accepted the vice-chancellorship that was on offer, this would saddle the Nazi party for all time with a share of the blame for Papen's failure. In the government quarter at midday on August 13 both Schleicher and Papen urged him to accept. Hitler refused, and Goebbels had to back him. Later Hitler took Frick and Rome over to see the president, he again left empty-handed. Frustrated and angry, the Nazi leaders gathered at Goebbels' apartment. Typewriters rattled out communiques. The SA commanders were straining at the bit, they wanted action. Together with Rome, Hitler briefed them to toe the line. He departed for Bavaria, leaving Goebbels in Berlin. It was a totally unexpected impasse. The Nazis were the largest party, they had followed the path of legality until now, yet the system was thwarting them once more. Goebbels consoled his embittered lieutenants and went on vacation to Heiligendam. The millionaire banker Emil George von Stoss of the Deutsche Bank invited him over to his motor yacht. But Goebbels' mind was in a turmoil. He feared that the Nazis' share of the vote had peaked, and might now rapidly decline. The Reichstag resumed on August 30. Its members elected Hermann Göring as speaker, a powerful position indeed. Göring invited Hitler, Rome, and Goebbels up to his luxurious new apartment on Kaiserdam to discuss tactics. They agreed that at the very next Reichstag session on September 12 they must force an immediate dissolution. The new election would be held on November 6. The party was now in a precarious position, sliding in the polls and with its campaign coffers dangerously low. Goebbels ordered Angriff to appear twice daily instead of once. He organized a consumer boycott of opposition newspapers. He had no mercy on them. When a newspaper impugned Magda's honor he sent an SS officer to treat the journalist concerned with a riding whip, in best Prussian style, the SS man left his visiting card on the bleeding offender. Magda had given birth to their first child on September 1, 1932. She had hoped for a boy to call Helmet to fill the hole left in her heart by her stepson's tragic death in Paris years before. But it was a girl, so Helmut became Helga. The infant's nocturnal wails kept the household awake. Goebbels, a novice in the art of parenthood, complained unfeelingly and left Magda in tears. Count von Heldorf took the breakdown of negotiations particularly hard. He's only tough, observed Goebbels shrewdly. When the going's good 37 he moved his Gau headquarters for one last time, to a building in Vossstrasse barely 300 yards from the Reich Chancellery. He had come a long way since the opium den six years before. He began planning ahead, listing whom he would need to take over the radio system. Hitler again flew a whistle-stop tour of 50 cities. Goebbels followed in an open plane, his face anesthetized with cold. When his graphic artist Schweitzer, Mjolnir, showed him his latest poster designs, he felt that his old friend was running out of steam but then so was everybody. 
The Goebbels' diary for the last weeks before the November 1932 election lacked the sense of urgency and intrigue that had characterized it in July and August. Only rarely did anything of the old fun element surface in this campaign. He ordered the Marxist districts plastered with stickers reading simply vote list one again, without stating which party that is the less sophisticated would assume that list one was the Reds. He lured the German National Party, DNVP, into accepting a public debate with him, in the hall the opponents provided him with only 200 tickets, an inconvenience which Goebbels circumvented with the aid of Angriff's printers, who turned out 2,000 more. When his opponents arrived, they found his men had taken over most of the hall. 18. Follow that man on October 20 he ordered the Jewish problem placed more firmly to the forefront citing Poppins' Jewish advisor Jacob Goldschmidt as a case in point. He also ordered GAU officials to start systematic rumors that Hindenburg had already written off Poppin. After quoting with perverse relish from the D.N.V.P.S. organ, Goebbels is a male Rosa Luxemburg neither a pretty sight, both are of Jewish countenance. He is impelled by the same burning ambition to incite and to lie. 41 He ordered his troops to refrain from similar personal insults. However, disguised as harmless civilians, his officials were to cluster around Nazi poster hoardings singing the party's praises. Towards the campaign's end there was an odd episode, Goebbels decided that his Nazis were to back a communist-organized Berlin transport strike. It was as though he had lost sight of the Nazi party's larger election horizon. His men had heavily infiltrated the BVG, the capital's public transport authority. The transport workers probably had legitimate grievances, and Goebbels had remained at heart a socialist agitator. Kampmann, his propaganda chief, would claim that the strike was actually quite popular. But the public's backing of the Nazi party melted away as all the usual brutish signs of union intimidation appeared, with the pickets this time wearing Nazi armbands. Together the Nazi and communist strikers terrorized strike breakers, ripped up streetcar lines, and wrecked buses. The liberal and right-wing Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung expressed concern about the spread of class warfare to the extreme right. The bourgeois press, Goebbels would write in Kaiserhof, invented the lie that I instigated this strike without the Führer's knowledge or consent although I am in hourly phone contact with the Führer. This self-defense is to be regarded with as much skepticism as his claim that the Berlin public displayed an admirable solidarity with the strikers. Less hollow rings his excuse that to have withheld support from the strikers would have confounded all their recruiting efforts among the workers. Perhaps Goebbels had seen a chance for the Nazis to seize control of the strike and shortcut the tedious democratic process by expanding it into a full-blooded coup. But the strike backfired badly on their election campaign. Nationwide, two million voters deserted the party, costing them 34 of their 230 Reichstag seats. The communists gained strongly. In Berlin, the Nazi vote slumped from 757,000, or 28,6%, in July to 720,000, or 26%, now. The bourgeois press gloated over this setback. At his Vosstrasse headquarters the next day he found his party and SA officers in ugly mood all ready to strike out again, he wrote, a clear indication that a coup was still on their mind. 46 Hitler however ordained, there will be no negotiating until this regime and the parties backing it have been totally defeated. 47 Although the German electorate had confirmed the Nazis as the largest single party, their opponents still clung on to the chancellorship. Count von Alvin's Laban reported that Poppen hoped Hitler would come to terms, Gregor Strasser, it seemed, suddenly agreed with Poppen, and for the first time on November 9 Goebbels recorded real venom about him. Let's hope that fatso Gregor doesn't put his foot in it. He's so disloyal. I warn Hitler against Strasser 48 Hitler however wrote to Poppen, still refusing to do a deal. Poppen resigned on the 16th. Now Hindenburg again summoned Hitler to Berlin. On the 19th, parting the cheering crowds outside the Kaiserhof, Hitler drove over to the presidential palace in a limousine. After a 90-minute talk, in which he explained his party's program once more to Hindenburg, Hitler assured his henchmen that he still would not accept any compromise. Hindenburg however wanted to revert to parliamentary rule. 
Hitler wrote him on the 21st, then took Goebbels to the opera Wagner's Meistersinger for the nth time. Hindenburg turned Hitler's proposals down. Some of Goebbels' faction urged that the time had come to seize power, at least in Prussia. For a few days Hitler remained at the Kaiserhof as a passive observer while Papen and Schleicher vied with each other for the coveted Chancellorship Prize. In Weimar on November 30 for the Thuringian election campaign, Goebbels heard from Hitler that Schleicher had made fresh overtures to him. Goebbels attended a three-hour council of war with Hitler, Frick, Goring, and Strasser. Again Strasser was the only one in favor of a compromise joining a cabinet under Schleicher, failing which the party seemed to be doomed to the political wilderness in perpetuity. Adamantly seconded by Goebbels, Hitler again refused to consider accepting the vice-chancellorship. General von Schleicher sent a new intermediary, Lt. Col. Eugen O.D.T. The press ached and heaved with curiosity. Hitler stood firm. Follow that man, marveled Goebbels. Then we shall triumph. Unable to sway Hitler. On December 2 Hindenburg appointed Schleicher as Chancellor. Needing to neutralize the Hitler threat, Schleicher began to cultivate Gregor Strasser instead of Hitler. Goebbels learned that they had met on Sunday the 4th, and that Schleicher had offered Strasser the vice-chancellorship which Hitler had spurned, and had hinted at ministerial positions for any other renegade Nazis as well. The new Reichstag would shortly meet. As Hitler warned the Nazi bloc in harsh terms about any tendency toward compromise, Goebbels saw Strasser's features harden. Two days later, hearing more specific rumors about Strasser's treachery, Hitler took him to task. Strasser picked up his hat and left, left the room, left politics and ultimately, 19 months later, this life. Julius Stryker called out, Exit the traitor. Goebbels limped from group to group of the Nazi deputies, dispensing further details of Strasser's treachery. At midday on the 8th Hitler received at the Kaiserhof a letter from Strasser resigning all his high party offices on account of the refusal to cut a deal with the new Chancellor. Simultaneously Strasser invited all the senior Gau leiters whom Hitler had just appointed as Landesinspektorin to meet him, except Goebbels. Since August, he told them, Hitler had displayed no clear line except for his monotonous demand to be Chancellor. He has got to realize that in the long run he has no prospect of attaining this target. He refused to 18, follow that man see the party ruined. Nor would he put up any longer with the intriguing by Hitler's entourage. I have no desire to fall in behind Goring, Goebbels, Rome, and the rest. According to Hans Frank he described Göring as a brutal egoist who cared nothing for Germany, Goebbels as a hobbling devil, and Rome as a swine, 56 One Gau Leiter later reported, after the individual participants had overcome their dismay, they went off bewildered like children who have lost their father. Gau Leiter Rust took word of Strasser's mutinous remarks to Hitler at the Kaiserhof. At 2 a.m. Goebbels found Hitler there studying the first edition of the Talitscher Rundschau. It headlined Strasser's bid for power. If the party falls apart now, he told Goebbels, I'll finish myself off in three minutes, 58 The morning's Juden press fond on Strasser, which probably sobered some of his supporters. Only Gottfried Fetter had foolishly echoed his complaints. After that day's Reichstag session it adjourned until mid-January 1933 Hitler spoke to all the Gau leiters in his suite at the Kaiserhof. His speech was a masterpiece of tragic oratory, and probably saved the party from oblivion. If they deserted him now, said Hitler, his life's work no longer had any purpose. Apart from this movement and my appointed mission, he declared, glancing at the portable bust of Julie on the mantelpiece, I have nothing now that could detain me on this earth. He tore apart Strasser's arguments of the day before. Strasser had hinted at the path of illegality. But General Walter von Reichenau, Army Chief of Staff, had warned that the army and police would open fire. Reichenau himself had urged patience the party, he said, was bound to achieve power legally sooner or later. The whole speech was fabulously sure-footed, in Goebbels' words annihilating for Strasser. Spontaneous ovation at the end, everybody gave Hitler his hand. Strasser is isolated. A dead man. 
I have fought for six years for this 62 Hitler was unquestionably the master, and Strasser only the sorcerer's apprentice. Two months later, events would prove Hitler's strategy correct, this would temper the loyalty of every high party official who had tortured his conscience this day. Still reluctant to make a final break, Hitler's press office announced that Strasser had only gone on three weeks leave. Goebbels' newspaper published a more malicious valedictory, he had to disown it the same day. He would continue his feud with Strasser to the bitter end. As for Strasser, he had left for the sunnier climes of Italy, he told friends afterward that Germany was now at the mercy of a congenital liar from Austria and a club-foot dwarf, of which the latter was the worse. He is Satan in a human's image 6519, it's all fixed. We have just completed, reported journalist Louis P. Lochner in December 1932 to his daughter, one of the hardest months of reporting in my career. I tell you, Lochner added, we had no end of excitement when Goebbels had inevitably neglected the provincial election in Thuringia and the party's vote there slumped by 40%. Awakening to the realization that the Nazi party was in danger of electoral extinction, he took immediate action to revitalize the propaganda campaign, blaming Dr. Lippert for the tactless remarks about Strasser, he replaced him as editor of Angriff by Kampmann.2 Hanke told him that the deputy chief of national propaganda, Heinz Franke, had allowed his Munich organization to go to seed. Goebbels replaced him with Wilhelm Hegert a sound and popular attorney on his own legal staff. Point three. After consultation with Goebbels, on December 15 Hitler drafted a memorandum explaining how the party was to pack more punch into the election battle. Point four. In the first two weeks of Schleicher's chancellorship a quarter million more Germans had been thrown out of work. On December 15 the general delivered an insipid broadcast on his economic program. Goebbels wrote a caustic commentary in Angriff entitled, The Program Without a Program. The people were now too weak, he wrote there a few days later, even to clench their fists. Point five as he toured the Gauss Christmas parties at the historic Ferris Rooms and the Veterans Building, he saw worse scenes of poverty than ever before. Point six returning home immediately after the Strasser brouhaha he has found Magda feeling ill. She is pregnant again. He is still madly in love with her Magda tells Ello that their honeymoon is going to last ten more years yet.